Good morning. Uh, we'd like to get started now. So uh, again, if you if you can, please take your seats. I know there's still people coming through security. Uh, my name is Tim May. I'm the 911 NG911. Uh, projects manager uh, in the public in the <laughs> policy and licensing division of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Federal Communications Commission workshop on technology transitions and public safety. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. First, for those of you joining us here at Commission Headquarters, today there are programs by the door uh, in the back for anyone who did not get those materials as well as a sign-in sheet. Um, we welcome your questions for the moderators or panelists. We ask that you raise your hand, and uh, FCC, FCC staff here in the room will come over and hand you a microphone so that you can ask your question. Um, we ask that you introduce your name and tell us your organization as well. Also, please do not feel that you need to wait until the conclusion of a panel to ask your question. Um, if you have a question at any time, uh, you can submit it using one of the question cards. And the moderator will try to get um, as many questions as we can during the workshop. Uh, second, we're broadcasting this workshop live on the web. So for anyone joining us remotely, you can submit questions to our workshop moderators by sending an email to livequestions at FCC.gov. That's livequestions at FCC.gov. And Twitter using the tech transitions hashtag. Again, that's tech transitions. Depending on the volume of questions and time constraints, uh, session moderators will work to respond to as many questions as possible during the workshop. During and after the workshop, we want to keep the conversation going. So to facilitate an ongoing dialogue, um, we will host an online discussion forum that you can access through FCC events page at http uh, colon backslash backslash www.fcc.gov backslash events backslash technology hyphen transitions hyphen and hyphen public hyphen safety. <laughs> You know what our website's like. Um, anyway, uh, anyone is welcome to join the dialogue, and all comments will become part of the official record for uh, docket number 13-5. Um, the forum will be open for comments until close of business on May 1st, and we look forward to your contributions. Now I would like to introduce uh, Rear Admiral David Simpson, Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Good morning and, and welcome, uh, and welcome to those online uh, as well as our panel members, which we've ensconced in the green room uh, and uh, uh, we'll bring out just before the effort here, but they're uh, listening as well. Welcome to the FCC, uh, and I want to give uh, a big thanks to all of you who've uh, come out today to talk about this important subject. Uh, we are expecting Commissioner Clyburn uh, in uh, five or so minutes, uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and pause when she gets here so we can begin with those remarks. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, we're also honored to have uh, Commissioner O'Reilly here as well, who's uh, uh, joined us now. Thanks, sir. Um, it's an honor to have so many representatives of the public safety community in one room, as well as representatives from consumer, industry, and other stakeholder groups to offer their perspectives. Some folks are also joining us by phone and online, and we welcome your participation. We've got the hashtag set up, we'll take emails, and we really want this to be a robust virtual dialogue. You can refer to your programs for directions on how to access. The forum will be open for comments until the close of business, May 1st, and will become a part of the official record of the IP transitions proceeding. Uh, and let me go ahead and pause there and uh, introduce our uh, uh, first commissioner this morning, a commissioner that really needs no introduction to uh, many, if not most of you, uh, but I'll do so anyway. Uh, uh, commissioner who was the interim chairman uh, and from day one in her uh, um, role uh, with the FCC has been a champion for public safety, but also a champion for the enduring values uh, for all Americans for which the commission was created. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. 
<laughs> I uh, want to thank Admiral Simpson for that kind introduction. And um, if anybody says to you that they uh, do not appreciate praise first thing in the morning, they're not telling you the truth. I really do appreciate it. Uh, welcome again to today's workshop on technology transitions and public safety. Our nation's legacy communication systems are undergoing radical transformations. And while new technologies hold promise for innovation, it is imperative that those core values and fundamental expectations of our communities continue to be met no matter the device, no matter the transmission medium, be it copper, fiber, TDM, IP, GSM, or LTE. I say this quite often and will never grow tired of repeating that one of the most fundamental obligations of this commission is promoting public safety. The duty is clearly spelled out in the first sentence of that section of the Communications Act, defining the purpose of this agency. And while the concept of 911 services was not discussed until the late 1960s, today the American public right expects that when they dial 911 in an emergency, responders will be accurately directed and dispatched to help them. As regulators, we are directly responsible for ensuring that technology transitions bring more advanced services and that the established public safety priorities are not an afterthought. As we said in the technology transition order and further notice adopted in January, Preserving network values should advance technological progress in any new communications technology that fails to provide reliable 911 service will likely not be widely adopted as a replacement for legacy networks. With that in mind, we must ensure that persons with disabilities and those from communities where English is not the primary language also have, they have access to emergency services. We must continue to promote the reliability and resiliency of wireline and wireless networks. We should continue to promote the transition of PSAPs to next generation 911 networks because it holds the potential for more redundancy and reliability. And we must remain focused on the close examination of cyber vulnerabilities and other preventative measures. In an increasingly all IP environment, the importance of ensuring the security of our networks cannot be overstated. So I am pleased that Admiral Simpson and his fine staff in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau have convened this workshop to carefully analyze the relevant value issues and identify the necessary elements so all networks are able to support core public safety values. In the aggregate, what are the risks and potential benefits to enduring public safety values? What policies are necessary to ensure the reliability of public safety? These are tough questions and vigorous dialogues are needed to resolve them. So it is great to see representatives from local public safety agencies, service providers, and technology event vendors, along with other federal agencies, participating and in informing us of the impact of technology transitions on public safety, national security, and federal government systems. The com commission, the FCC, functions best when all relevant stakeholders have the opportunity to exchange their views so that those all important goals of reaching 911, locating those in need, network reliability, and cyber security are realized. Thank you so very much for lending us your time and expertise here today. And I look forward to the reviewing the record of today's workshop. Thank you, Admiral. Commissioner Clyburn, thanks so much for those remarks and the fire in the belly that you left us with today. Uh, I'd like to next uh, introduce uh, one of our other commissioners. And, you know, technology itself uh, has no political affiliation. Uh, and public safety 
uh, has no uh, political bias towards uh, uh, support for it. Uh, uh, the widest range of our society understands technology uh, and that aspect of it and also is committed to public safety. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, a speaker who has a rich history of getting out ahead of problems, of looking at the landscape and politically making sure that we have the right uh, legislative and uh, policy objectives to make sure that uh, enduring values are supported. Uh, he uh, is a strong champion of industry-led solutions, and we believe that uh, we will be more agile and more ready in this space uh, if we uh, can successfully uh, pull together uh, industry, uh, uh, the public stakeholders here together to uh, uh, prepare us for the new architectures in place in a way that uh, uh, meets the public safety uh, uh, needs of the future. So without any further ado, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Simpson, for that kind and warm introduction. I, I don't often get to speak to an empty table, but I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to join you here today on this important discussion. I must admit that I'm not going to be able to stay with you all today, but I will watch from my office as my schedule allows and catch the rest on videotape. I should start by thanking the number of good uh, work, for, the, the good work from the number of public safety officials that are here with us today, and those that are in the field every day providing critical services to the American people. These are hard, tough jobs with long hours and high stress levels, and many public sa safety personnel do not uh, do so for the money. It rarely compensates for the risks that they make and for the contributions that they make to our society. So I say thank you. I think we should all start from one basic premise, and that is the conversion to IP, uh, an all IP world, can be a great good for consumers and public safety with proper planning and with adjustments. In reality, IP, we are transitioning every day to IP in every market throughout America. Thankfully, the FCC trials are not intended to inhibit or delay this conversion. We should use IP technologies to our advantage rather than trying to fight, delay, or dismiss transitions. Consumers are embracing IP technologies, so we'd be foolish to try to work against consumer demand and interest. The great news is that IP technologies can enhance public safety capabilities and functionalities. If used properly, IP can improve call routing, which can reduce response times, and it can deliver a broader range of information, which means better data at critical moments. When every minute matters, IP can allow public safety officials to make more efficient and precise responses in emergencies. One important component that I hope will be discussed today is the desperate need to update our nation's PSAPs. Without next generation PSAPs, we are stuck under the limitations of the old system. Chairman Wheeler and I have made this point before and I will continue to do so in the future. This is especially important because a number of FCC items, such as text to 911 requirements on carriers, are pointless without an updated PSAP and advanced capabilities. One challenge we face is the authority over and funding for PSAPs is done in a patchwork system that can make it harder to coordinate timely upgrades. At the heart of this, though, we need to update and modernize PSAP configurations not simply plug an IP switch into every old PSAP office. We need to ask how many PSAPs are necessary to maximize efficiency and public safety. It also means examining the sharing of common call centers, computer systems, and the like. As the IP transitions move forward, and as we examine public safety implications, I will suggest we also need to be careful not to establish unattainable deadlines for technology providers to deliver solutions. Seeking unreasonable timelines won't change the pace of technological developments. Moreover, we need to be careful not to impose any technology mandates. Instead of picking technology winners and losers, we should let technologies compete to see which can best meet our desired outcomes. 
Lastly, I know tomorrow's panel is going to look at the issue of cybersecurity, and that's an important and timely matter. One thing I do worry about is how much a role we can play in that, given our current authority. One thing we can do is use our expertise as uh, overseers of the communications network and provide such information to our agencies, that our partners, that also have primary jurisdiction. So with that, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank Commissioner Clyburn for her good work in the past. Thank you, Admiral Simpson, and wish you a successful workshop. Thanks so much. Thank you, Commissioner Riley, and thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Today's workshop will explore the response to and the impact of disasters on the readiness and resiliency of our nation's communications networks during and after a transition to an all IP-based infrastructure. The nation's networks must be ready and able to meet the challenges that arise in an all IP environment in the face of large-scale disasters and emergencies from an earthquake along the New Madrid fault line to a tsunami that might hit the coast of Alaska to a hurricane in Florida uh, to uh, uh, derecho-like winds or a uh, snow and ice storm on the eastern seaboard. We need to understand how things will be different in, in an all-IP world. We've got some tough questions ahead of us in that regard. Uh, when disaster strikes in our nation's networks are under the greatest stress, uh, what will be different when we're uh, in an all-IP all world. In a switched world, uh, we very much had a uh, natural segmentation uh, of the network around the, the wire centers themselves and the downstream entities. Uh, in the IP world, uh, we have the same reliance on uh, physical transport, uh, but we've got a management of that that uh, p potentially uh, opens up uh, protocols to attacks that could be halfway around the world uh, and or to uh, a new set of failure modalities around the new technology. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, we're not falling into the trap of um, certainly not being Luddites but not being afraid of the new technology. Uh, it really does have the promise to uh, not only bring in new functionality, but bring in greater levels of robustness if we approach it right. Ten years ago, when I was responsible for the uh, Navy's communications in Puerto Rico and, and uh, around the South American region, the provider, one of the providers uh, in Puerto Rico, was beginning to shift the copper uh, over to, to fiber uh, in the ground. And we had the same kind of trepidation uh, then. We had a very predictable re relationship uh, with copper. But we also managed copper very much in a lag way. Uh, you, you, the phone company didn't really um, uh, worry about the plant until uh, there was a customer complaint about the degradation in the plant. When we switched over to fiber, uh, we recognized early on that, hey, they were, it failed in different ways, that you had uh, power in the building. That was an important component of is it still going to work uh, when uh, uh, the hurricane comes. Uh, uh, but we also recognized that now that same fiber was providing television and that before where you didn't figure out that your phone didn't work, uh, because water had seeped into the line until you went to make a phone call. Uh, now you knew the minute the, the television wasn't working that, uh, hey, you needed a call. So the, the, there were aspects from a consumer end because you were using it more regularly, more often for more kinds of things that uh, there's a natural tendency to uh, uh, report earlier uh, issues, recognize and report. Similarly, uh, though, the... Um, uh, telcos in Puerto Rico recognized that they needed to shift from passive management of the plant, waiting for that customer complaint, to an active management of the plant. And we, uh, I learned what an OTDR is, optical time domain reflectometer. That active management of the plant allowed the telephone companies to recognize discontinuities before they actually resulted in a disconnect. So uh, uh, there was an opportunity to be more proactive in the um, 
uh, addressing issues that could impact consumers. So this isn't to fear the change. This is to make sure that we understand the change and we are optimizing collectively our ability to be anticipatory in the things that might uh, uh, prevent us from communicating on a bad day. We've uh, structured this event uh, in a way that in the first session we'll look at issues that are bad things that would happen on a good day. So the routine day-to-day, uh, 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 -day, every three minutes in Fairfax County, there's a 911 call, uh, peace apps around the country, same kind of thing. Uh, what will be the impact in those situations? And we'll run scenarios for that. Uh, we'll then shift gears and talk about um, what would happen when bad things happen on a really bad day that has really bad uh, national scale. Uh, uh, like a, uh, uh, an attack on the nation, uh, uh, like a um, Katrina-level uh, disaster, uh, a New Madrid kind of thing. Uh, and then uh, we'll f finish today with uh, looking at uh, the additional risk uh, from cyber threats uh, and uh, seeking to gain a better understanding of uh, how that might contribute to the failure modalities that we want to get ahead of. And then tomorrow uh, we'll have a, a, a federal government panel that really is focused on, hey, uh, uh, the federal government is a big consumer of communications. It, we rely on it, and we rely on it most uh, uh, when, in fact, there are disasters that uh, uh, we've created federal entities to respond to. So uh, it, because of the um, nature of, of, of contracts and relationships there, uh, that particular session uh, will be closed. Our goal is to gain a solid understanding of the key technical, operational, and networking issues that could arise in a world where the entire communication system is supported by IP infrastructure. Uh, I'd like to have us all think about this isn't internet. This is internet protocol. Uh, so the internet quite often is used as transport, and that's important for us to consider. But the internet protocol is the real issue, and uh, many organizations have uh, corporate networks that uh, utilize the underlying transport, M MPLS, uh, and then on top of that, the internet protocol to make sure that the bits get to the right place. It's that element that we need to get into and understand uh, because uh, uh, really that protocol was designed to be more robust. Uh, uh, ARPA uh, did it to <laughs> Uh, set up a, a robust communication structure that could uh, um, be ready in the face of an attack. Uh, uh, but uh, designing that and understanding our utilization of that is key. So uh, we expect to explore that today. The technology transitions order adopted in January calls for voluntary tests of real-world applications as well as targeted experiments in cooperative research to support an all-IP network. Your expertise will help inform the Commission's decision-making and analysis of these critical issues. The task ahead of us is not easy, so we all need to step up. We need aggressive, forward-thinking professionals to help us illuminate readiness gaps in a transitioning infrastructure and ensure that next-generation communications meet America's public safety expectations. Uh, Back a couple of years ago, uh, over 10 years ago, I think now, there was a, a movie that was uh, very entertaining to many of us, Apollo 13. And one of the great lines uh, in that movie was uh, uh, given to the actor who played Gene Kranz, the head of the uh, Houston Center, and he said, failure is not an option. The uh, r reality, when uh, those, uh, that team was asked afterwards, they said, did he really say that? Uh, and they said, well, not exactly. What he said uh, was that when bad things happened, we just stepped back, calmly evaluated our options, and failure was not one of those options. So I look at that as our task today, uh, to calmly evaluate the options that are out there uh, and uh, do so in a way that 
knows that we've got to be successful. We've got to keep working options until uh, uh, failure is no longer an option. As communication networks migrate to newer technologies and consumer habits change, we must make sure that all Americans' access to critical services are preserved and, where necessary, improved to meet growing demands. We must make sure that core functionalities in the emergency communication networks are able to adapt to a new array of advanced technologies and services that will bring both new opportunities and, of course, new challenges. Initiatives such as Next Generation 911, location accuracy, network outages and reliability, alerting and priority access are greatly impacted and will have both benefits and challenges. For instance, Next Gen 911 can support a wider range of access to critical emergency services. We're seeing that now with text to 911. This is a vital complement to 911 services where a voice call is not an option. But public safety stakeholders must also understand how the transition to all IP networks will affect consumer access to such emergency services. Session one and two suggest to the commission how IP networks will impact PSAP day-to-day -day EOC uh, and disaster response operations. Will this workshop suggest how we can leverage expanded IP networks and smartphone technologies to enhance location accuracy for 911 calls? How do we improve data collection, such as network outage reporting and feedback to ensure reliability and prompt restoration. Today, NORS is very much a circuit-oriented uh, uh, reporting mechanism. Uh, we need to uh, uh, bring NORS into the next century here and have it uh, help us understand and appreciate risk uh, in the IP environment. And its corollary, DERS, the D disaster reporting system, uh, needs to allow us then to be able to uh, best prioritize the use of those remaining resources uh, after disaster and prioritize our collective efforts to uh, restore capability. The Commission has long relied on public-private initiatives to tackle challenging issues. In today's workshop, we're building on these efforts. The FCC has a multi-pronged approach today members of our Federal Advisory Committees, the Communication Security, Reliability, and Interoperability Council, or CISRIC, and the Technical Advisory Committee, the TAC, continue, continue to contribute their time, expertise, and unique perspective on matters such as network level best practices to mitigate the effects of DDoS attacks, long-term remedies to domain name security, hardware, and software development. In addition, we continue to participate in the great work of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, and their cybersecurity framework. We're also leveraging the Department of Homeland Security's implementation efforts. A CISRC working group now is refining existing cybersecurity best practices and aligning telecom best practices with the framework. This will help us all uh, communication providers, uh, uh, government, consumers, to operationalize the framework by using the updated cybersecurity best practices to evaluate and improve cybersecurity posture and communicate needs and expectations internally and with external stakeholders. Our focus is on risk. In the area of tech transition, we collectively need to understand and appreciate accepted risks the framework will help us do that, but it's a high-level, top-down approach. And in the meantime, we need to gain a better understanding of the risk environment from the switch, from legacy switch to IP transport. Uh, and we hope to use today to illuminate uh, that level of detail. As stakeholders, you represent the many facets of this transitioning world. Private sector companies own and control the vast majority of our nation's networks, and that's a good thing. But we share with you the task of keeping these networks reliable and secure. It's not only in everyone's best interest to work together, but it's also simply the right thing to do. This workshop will not disappoint in challenges, but we're confident that you can help us meet them. Thank you for your time and expertise today, and I look forward to the education we're all about to receive from this discussion. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, before we get into our three sessions for uh, for today, um, we've asked Henning Schultz running to our uh, chief technology 
officer to provide us a presentation, an overview of the technology transitions order, as well as the challenges and opportunities uh, confronting us as we move forward through this transition. So I give you Henning Schultzring. Thank you and good morning for the, uh, thank you for the opportunity to try to summarize uh, a very large topic area which I hope to hear a lot more uh, during the day today uh, in that. Uh, as you know, the transition is not a single transition, but we're really talking about multiple things all happening at the same time. Some of those are technical, some of those are economical, some of those are even cultural. I'll try to address a little bit of all of those. Can get the slides. When we talk from a technology perspective, we really have three different transitions going on all at the same time, interconnected but somewhat independent. First, at the application layer, we no longer have TDM voice as the only or the dominant way of provi providing voice services or multimedia services. Clearly, we're in a transition where a large fun fraction of voice today already, probably at least 30% or so, are provided by both facilities-based and over-the-top voice of IP providers. And possibly within a year or two, a large fraction of voice over wireless networks will be provided using voice over LTE. Secondly, at the layer below, the infrastructure that we use to transport voice and other services, namely the TDM circuits that underlie the classical telecommunication networks, are now transitioning to IP packets. And thirdly, an infrastructure that was dominated by copper loops as kind of a canonical and assumed to be infrastructure, certainly in the last mile, is increasingly diverse, incorporating usually a combination of fiber to at some point in the network, wave coax, uh, wave wireless, both licensed and unlicensed, uh, copper loops, DSL type of models, and then obviously satellite as well, all serving as transport for IP packets. A much more diverse environment, which in its own both offers opportunities, because we can now bring IP connectivity to PSAPs, for example, in many more ways than we were able to do before, but also challenges in the sense that the technology is both more complicated and lacks some of the features such as loop powering that we had previously. We also have a generational challenge, and that generational challenge is twofold. Many of the switches that underlie our existing telecommunication voice infrastructure were designed in the 1970s and 1980s. The picture you see is uh, the design year for a very common uh, telephone switch, the Nortel DMS 100. As I suspect most of you know, Nortel is no longer with us, uh, and so the uh, provision of spare parts seems to be both uh, two models, namely eBay or cannibalism. Uh, namely, you just take the old switches and take the line cards out that you no longer need because of a decrease in line counts. But we also, and I'll allude to an economic and to some extent cultural problem, have a human resource problem. Many of the individuals who grew up learning how to design, configure, engineer, run these type of pieces of equipment are retiring and are no longer able to keep that infrastructure. We're seeing indications that we have a human resource problem. Now, and we had something similar where in the year 2000, we had to bring back COBOL programmers out of retirement, but that's a limited model, I think, to maintain a national communication infrastructure. We look at one example of the kind of aging infrastructure problems and aging technology problems. About three years ago after a snowstorm, there was a large-scale outage in this Washington, D.C. area, several PSAPs, based on a legacy technology called comma trunks, which were designed for uh, an era when you still had operators and manual billing type of operations, only used for PSAPs. 
And indeed, uh, we had to uh, ask an industry research and standardization organization, ADIS, to help deal with a problem related to a, this legacy technology. Clearly, that is not a long-term proposition. Let me talk about some of the challenges that I believe we face going forward. The challenges are related uh, in multiple ways that we have a set of uh, technology transitions that affect all aspects. While we have probably so far talked mostly uh, about the notion of uh, 911 calls, we also have uh, issues of emergency alerting. Uh, we have the uh, issues that relate to the transition that we have in uh, consumer behavior. All of those I will try to address as well uh, uh, along the way. We have, I think, still mentally a model where you have a set of consumer assumptions uh, that we assume uh, consumers in particular have. You have a central office, well fortified, uh, with a huge battery uh, compartment in the basement that can supply uh, power to the infrastructure until the diesel generators uh, kick in. We have homes that all have an FM radio uh, where people know how to tune to uh, the local radio station for emergency alerts and emergency information when the power goes out. We have people who watch TV and who then receive emergency alerts using the emergency alerting system. While this is certainly still true for a large fraction of the population, it is no longer assumable that that covers everybody. Indeed, if I were to take the typical millennial household, it probably has three large, uh, three major pieces of electronic equipment, a cable or DSL modem, a laptop of some sort, and a smartphone. No TV, no phone on the kitchen wall, no FM radio. Indeed, there was recently, I think, a YouTube video of a surprise at a younger one when you showed him a Sony Walkman. I have no idea what this thing even was. <laughs> Thus, under the current model, if we go back, the assumptions that we have, what happens in a consumer household when the power goes out and when bad things happen, just no longer holds. The emergency alert system does not work because there's no TV in the household. A power, I may be able to power the voice of IP supply on the modem, but many consumers don't even have a landline connection, so that doesn't necessarily help. And obviously, we rely on the relatively short uh, items that appear on the wireless emergency alert system. A very different environment that is as much a cultural as a technical transition. If we do not adopt to those transitions and simply assume that the legacy technologies that served us well and continue to serve us well in many ways are sufficient, we're going to miss out on a large fraction of the population that needs to be involved and needs to be able to reach emergency help. Let me talk about one particular technical problem that is indeed been induced by that technology transition, namely the increasing incidence of malicious robocalls. Those, as many of you know, have been starting to affect uh, entities that are part of our way of supplying emergency services, from PSAPs to hospitals and other institutions. Robocalls have become possible largely because of IP, uh, voice of IP technologies, since it is now possible to generate very large volumes of call, essentially anonymously, often outside the United States, and typically with forged uh, caller ID information. To take one example, I have been a recent spate of uh, telephony denial of service attacks where I, the uh, criminals call up a PSAP, a hospital, a school, 
and claim that one of the employees, for example, owes money on a, on a payday loan or to take the most recent scheme, I claim that uh, one of the employees uh, owes money to the Internal Revenue Service uh, and would be uh, immediately deported or uh, would be uh, criminally charged if they did not submit the money by PayPal to the IRS. And if the victim uh, does not pay up or if the institution does not pay up, then they launch in, uh, a denial of service attack on that institution by tying up all the non-911 trunks, the uh, business trunks uh, of the PSAP or the hospital or the school, whatever the case may be. They often then fake the number of a call ID to display. So, for example, in the recent IRS scam, they actually, the number that shows up on the consumer's phone is indeed the IRS uh, 800 number, a uh, help desk number or a helpline number, uh, so that, uh, or it is the local police station number, so that a unwitting consumer uh, has every reason to believe that indeed this is a legitimate, if threatening, phone call. We are also facing on a transition from a model which was largely human to human, namely where you could assume that 911 calls would be made by a human, immediately processed by a human call taker, to a model where we have on both ends the likelihood that we'll see an increasing number of services or machines uh, generating those. Those could be automated systems, uh, such as uh, Wi-Fi equipped smoke detectors, alarm panels, uh, alarm system, medical monitoring system, uh, telematic systems, uh, that all generate some version of a data-driven emergency indication. Often go through a filtering mechanism, such as a call center that uh, separates out non-emergency assistance, such as a uh, need for a tow uh, from an emergency. And, and forwards data, often in somewhat incomplete uh, and difficult ways, to a public safety answering point. We can no longer assume that the vast majority of calls will indeed be human generated, and we have to think about how we intelligently integrate non uh, human generated emergencies in ways that prevent that uh, there is a loss of information along the way that true emergency calls are, are not properly forwarded, and as importantly, that we can filter and prioritize calls according to uh, their urgency and response needs. Conversely, uh, we also have to start assuming that alerting that is designed to be reaching humans, kind of the uh, alarm tones and then the alert tones followed by a voice message, is no longer the only or maybe even the most helpful way of doing that, but is uh, already starting to ha is happening with the common alerting protocol that many of the consumers of alerting information will be other devices and services that in turn provide appropriate information maybe in different languages, maybe uh, geared towards people with disabilities, maybe uh, then translate it, say, into an internal uh, apartment building alerting system and so on. Let us talk about some of the opportunities. We have great opportunities simply because we can now build scalable systems where the technology is no longer the uh, limitation. We can buy simplified systems where we can separately scale the notion of human response and technology. That used to be at the PSAP level, you had to pretty much have a technology on site to make that work. That is no longer the case. We also have much better diagnostics capability and we have much better ways of monitoring system and getting data out of systems that no longer involve filling out paper forms. I'll talk about one opportunity in particular where the availability of wireless services, particularly uh, uh, small range wireless services and IP connectivity can greatly help solve a long-standing but increasingly urgent problem 
namely the need to identify the precise location of uh, the emergency caller within the building. We previously only had really two broad choices, namely triangulation-based choices uh, that relied on cell tower, time of arrival, and so on, or the GPS or similar GNSS type of systems that allowed, uh, relied on satellites. Both have both accuracy and reach uh, limitations. GPS systems, for example, typically do not reach inside uh, non-wood frame uh, construction. But we also now have a range of other technologies that could potentially serve as beacons to provide much more accurate location information. Envision, for example, that as we equip smoke detectors with Wi-Fi to alert somebody's a cell phone when the smoke detector is going on, that also provides a long-term stable beacon indicating a location. Envision having a Bluetooth beacon in exit signs, again, installed by building management and thus predictable and maintainable. Envision using building infrastructure such as built-in access points that are used to not just provide Wi-Fi access for employees and guests, but also provide location information. And finally, as you're starting to see, for example, during the Super Bowl festivities, where that was deployed uh, in the New York City area, we're starting to see cheap, deployable beacons that are typically nowadays used for advertising purposes uh, using a, a low-energy uh, Bluetooth variety and can be picked up by both Apple and Android-based uh, phones of more recent vintage. Currently, they're used to deliver coupons and other type of information. It would seem very sad if we can locate somebody to deliver a latte coupon to them, but we cannot find them when there is an emergency. We should be able to use the same technologies uh, in that environment. That also changes uh, our assumptions, I believe. The assumption was always that we had a, a kind of central office assumption. You had a single switch, but you took really, really good care of it. You had staff on site, you had generators, you had batteries. The Internet environment is a somewhat different one. You have the opportunity of having multiple sources of data transmission and multiple sources of information, such as location information. Each one of those is not perfectly reliable. Indeed, the iBeacon type of information may not be available. Uh, the exit sign may not be working. But hopefully, in combination of multiple of these sources, you always get some good information, and you try to increase the availability and reliability of each of the individual contributing sources. But it fundamentally also changes the model of how we think of uh, emergency location and in other emergency services. It is no longer a stovepipe which only concerns PSAPs and kind of immediately adjacent uh, institutions such as the fire and police department. It is really something which has to be built into the infrastructure to be most successful. That is not a new model. Fire marshals and fire codes have had the notion of supporting, for example, communication during fires for probably 50 or more years. We just haven't thought of alerting and emergency calling as being a vital and indispensable part of that infrastructure that we put into particularly large commercial buildings along with uh, an intercom system for firefighters, along with exit stairwell lighting, along with radio uh, repeaters, again, for first responders. Why shouldn't that be part of the same infrastructure? Because it is so vital to make sure that we don't have a standalone system that only encompasses the building, but also a system that is integrated into a larger infrastructure. If 
we look at the PSAP model itself, we have an opportunity to not look at PSAPs, however they are run, whether they're managed centrally or they're managed in a more traditional localized fashion as islands that are all by themselves. There is no excuse even if a PSAP is completely autonomous in terms of funding, in terms of technology, uh, to not have centralized monitoring of call volumes and system health. That allows to delegate some of the authority and skills that are scarce and difficult to maintain at a local level to a more scalable, cost-efficient, uh, and sustainable level at a higher aggregation level. That monitoring could be done commercially, could be done by a government agency, really doesn't much matter. But the notion that every piece up should have a monitoring system, every piece up and every other piece of infrastructure that's critical needs ongoing monitoring. We do that for e-commerce sites that are not nearly as important. Why can't we do that as a common goal for something where it's a life and death type of situation? We've had seen too many incidents where the detection of faults uh, in a 911 system, for example, is done by, mm, it's awfully quiet around here, let's try to figure out what's going on model, or where somebody needs to call uh, the commission, for example, or some other uh, emergency management organization because they can't get through to the 911 center. That is not a sustainable model. That is not a model that comports with the importance and the capabilities uh, that we have today in the system. So we also have opportunities to do a uh, mo models of delivery of data in ways that are much more uh, integrated into the day-to-day -day type of, uh, of model of activities that we do today, as opposed to treating uh, 911 and emergency alerting as something completely separate. I'll take, give one example, reflect back on the millennial household uh, issue that I mentioned earlier. Why shouldn't emergency alerts be part of ad networks that are displayed on every web page that you view? Doesn't matter where you are, but there's really only a very small number of ad networks that deliver uh, content to every single web page out there. If you integrated emergency alerting into that, you could reach all those people who don't have a TV, who don't have a radio, don't have a landline, relatively inexpensively using the same technology that we have today. In general, the notion should be using technology that we have, using infrastructure that we have, using building infrastructure that we have as a way to leverage uh, as, as opposed to keeping the emergency uh, inf infrastructure completely separate as in its own world, developing at a much slower technology pace than uh, the newer technologies that we do. Yep. One final point I wanted to make, I mentioned the fire marshals, is we should also start to think about uh, the, the notion that we have now stovepipes in terms of response for, uh, for citizens. We have a 2-1-1 system in many uh, counties, not nearly everywhere, a 3-1-1 system in some large uh, cities, and obviously 9-1-1 somewhat closer to universal. But as those of you who are much closer to 911 operation knows that in many cases the 911 system has essentially become the citizen interface to government. If you don't know what's going on, if you don't know who to report uh, a, an open manhole cover, if you don't know how to report an, another unsafe condition, well, what do you do? You try to, you can either try to look up your phone book, which you no longer have, or you dial 911 and hope that somebody will take care of it. That is not, I don't think, a long-term sustainable model if we treat 911 only as an emergency model. We have to think about how do we, from a consumer perspective, where we can no longer assume that they have a paper telephone book with the blue government pages up front, that they can then locate which department is responsible for which type of non-emergency or maybe emergency. 
take the, the manhole cover problem. No, it's not an emergency in the classical sense, but I really, really want that reported because it could become one if it's not reported. We can scare people saying you should never call 911 unless it is a life or death of emergency. Or we can design systems that are flexible, that uh, work with consumer needs and the limitations that they have in terms of their devices and filter calls so they don't tie up scarce resources but get routed to the right place. We should think of it as from a consumer-focused design perspective, not just what is most convenient for the legacy model of that. Can we integrate our response systems that don't diverge scarce emergency resources, but make sure that issues that are indeed could become an emergency, whether the minor kind, the manual cover one, or uh, the notion of an abandoned package somewhere, that we can report those without consumers being afraid that they're going to be uh, uh, persecuted for making a, a wrong emergency call. We can also, I believe, use existing uh, commercial technologies to, for example, test uh, location delivery on a much larger scale than we previously have. For example, uh, there have been proposals that U.S. Postal Service or UPS or FedEx trucks could be used to do uh, mapping between the location that's reported and the location that's measured, given that they have fairly accurate location measurement systems themselves in their vehicles. These are all partnering opportunities that where the technology really isn't uh, the limitation. It's our ability collectively to reach out beyond what we currently do uh, in our uh, kind of stovepipe model of classical public safety. I look forward to the workshop exploring many of these issues along with others uh, to see how we can leverage technology can use the technology opportunities, not just in those that are offered by uh, classical emergency response and alerting technologies, but also by consumer technologies to make everybody safer, to make public safety more efficient, and to make it more uh, responsive to the both cultural uh, and technology changes that our citizenry uh, is undergoing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henning. Um, we will take a short pause, not a break, to allow our uh, session one panelists to populate the table. So if, uh, if you could please uh, come to the table, and or if you're in the green room, come, come up, please. Thank you.
Okay. So uh, we now begin um, session one, incident response during and after the technology transition. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, David Firth, Deputy Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. David. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our first panel. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to make one housekeeping note with respect to questions from the audience. Uh, we welcome questions from the audience, but what we are going to ask you to do if you have a question is submitted in writing. If you, uh, we have cards that are available for that. Uh, if you have a question that you'd like to submit, uh, please raise your hand and someone will come to you. Uh, we'll give you a card. Uh, you can provide the write in your question, and uh, they'll take it. And uh, given the time constraints, I can't promise that we will get to all the audience questions, but I will try to integrate them in uh, as best as possible. Uh, and uh, those questions will also be uh, in the record of the of the proceeding. And uh, if we can, we'll try to address them after the panel. If we can't address them during the panel. Let me talk about the, the purpose of the first panel. As Admiral Simpson indicated, um, we are doing a series of panels to look at the impact of the IP transition on public safety and emergency communications. And the purpose of the first panel uh, is to identify and discuss how an all IP based infrastructure in contrast to a TDM or a transitional infrastructure will support public safety communications with specific focus on communications that are associated with emergencies that require a significant public safety response, um, but that do not uh, impact the integrity of the underlying communications networks, the, those more dire scenarios where the network itself uh, is uh, under attack or under uh, some form of stress uh, will be covered in later panels. Um, before the panel uh, was convened, I, I sent out a series of uh, hypothetical or perhaps not so hypothetical scenarios to all of the panelists. Uh, and there were really uh, three that I asked each panelist to consider uh, and as a way of framing uh, the, their perspective on the TDM to IP transition. Uh, the first of those scenarios um, would be an emergency response to a major accident. Imagine a, a major accident on the Beltway here in the Washington, D.C. area or somewhere where you have uh, an accident uh, that causes uh, injuries, perhaps fatalities, obviously has uh, an effect on, on traffic. Uh, and so it's going to require emergency response. It's going to uh, uh, require uh, some alerting of the public about delays uh, or alternative routes that uh, may need to be, uh, uh, that they may need to, need to take advantage of. Um, the second scenario would be a, a tornado or a major storm uh, that is bearing down on a community uh, where, again, uh, there is a need for warning of the public. There is also a need for uh, responding to the emergency to the storm after it happens. Um, the third scenario would be uh, an active shooter situation. If you imagine the Navy Yard scenario of Virginia Tech, where uh, there is an incident involving an active shooter. Again, there is an immediate need to evaluate the situation, uh, to respond to it. Uh, there may be a need to uh, both uh, determine who's been injured, uh, what kind of uh, assistance is needed for the people at the scene, uh, also uh, to alert and warn the public and possibly to um, apprehend the suspect if the suspect is not apprehended at the scene. So I, I put those scenarios out there and uh, then asked the panelists to think uh, about uh, how they would uh, look at those both from a TDM perspective and an, from an IP, an all IP perspective. So let me start. What I'd like to do, we have a, a terrific panel with a lot of diverse constituencies and stakeholders represented. And what I would like to do initially is simply have each panelist, I'm going to go around the table and have each panelist in two or three minutes, um, thinking in the context of the scenarios that we put out, 
uh, identify from your perspective and the role you play in emergency communications or in terms of the constituency that you represent, what are the key similarities and what are the key differences that you see between an all IP environment and a TDM or a transitional environment? And I'd like each panelist as we go, and I'll start with Richard, uh, before you begin to introduce yourself and uh, identify who you represent. Thank you. Richard? Richard Muskie at Bear Metro 911 District. Uh, in answering the question, as far as a 911 call delivery perspective, other than maybe machine to machine alerts or possibly, you know, on the highway scenario, alerting the consumer, you know, just who on the highway, they don't need to call 911. I think really the scenarios are the same in that, you know, why that incident is going on, all other 911 calls are going on. And we want to make sure that, that we get the same voice quality and the same location information from all types of calls. And I think that should come into all the different scenarios, whether that's a POTS line during the transition and then when we're in all IP. And the same thing in the CMRS environment. Right now, we have, and when it moves to LTE, s s the same thing. But today, we're kind of in this hybrid type situation. The, in my mind, the, the PSDN to IP transition is more of a revolution in that it's happening more quickly and it's probably going to have a termination date. Next Gen 911, which overlaps and is interrelated, it, we're at the very beginning and it's more of an evolution. We're going to have the, the, you know, have the IP network, piece apps, and then additional functions and availability of services. But if we don't get the right foundation on the transition from POTS to all IP by addressing call quality and routing for 911 and that location when someone calls at home, you know that they're at their home and you have a civic address and it shouldn't really have to depend on whether you know, they're using this uh, access network or it's a wireless call. You know, if, if, if right now it's very hard to tell what type, for the general public, what type of 911 location may occur in a given situation. Hopefully down the road as we get to all IP, it can be more simple. If you're indoors, you may get one type of location. If you're outdoors being mobile, a more mobile type location might apply. And that's really all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard, and I would ask uh, that you not necessarily answer because we need, do need to get around to all, but you'd think about it and then when we go to open, maybe you could answer. Uh, uh, what I learned recently in Seminole County when they had a false alarm active shooter come from a junior high school about an active shooter in the high school across the town, that increasingly authentication of devices in an all IP world becomes uh, uh, more and more important. That the uh, 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 ability for malicious calls to be anonymous in an IP world uh, uh, mushrooms um, and that, that uh, we, I think, in an all IP world, need to think about that. Is there a, a higher level of requirement for authentication of the Internet of Things, uh, not just location? Uh, the second is they lost uh, control of some of the situation when social media took over, uh, and there was the exact wrong group think on parents needing thinking they needed to descend to the school that was now in lockdown at the same time that the police was establishing a perimeter around the school uh, and uh, they had significant uh, higher potential blue on blue than they would have had uh, uh, before absent social media. So they felt that there's an importance as we go forward to be able to communicate to the public as richly as social media communicates to the public so that we can avoid uh, a, a uh, mass wrong behavior uh, uh, because we, we lost control of the communications constrained just by uh, old, uh, older single circuit kinds of mentality. So I've just asked the group to think about uh, some of those things. Okay. John? Good morning, everybody. My name is John Snap from Entrado. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today. As we move to an all IP world, um, one of our biggest challenges is actually going to be the transition there, that, that hybrid mode when we're doing both a TDM world and an IP world, this protocol conversion that we're going to be going to in supporting this, this 
that world is probably the most complicated part and it gives us some of our biggest challenges we're going to have on moving forward. The quicker we can get to the all IP world will help. One of the things that's real interesting and actually sort of what um, Admiral Simpson was sort of talking about earlier, as we're moving to the new IP world and we're moving to um, the new technologies, there's a things will be different. There's a lot of opportunities we have to detect errors quicker and detect circuits. Um, early on um, in my sort of world of 911 with camera, there was a lot of there was a lot of um, hesitation to move on camera trunks to the more to the ice up trunks. And there was a lot of feeling that this ice up is going to fail or there's going to be problems with ice up. The problems are different and the advantages are much different. Um, as we move to the new, to, as they move from CAMA to ISUP, as we're now moving from ISUP to IP, in CAMA, in ISUP, they thought there were a lot more failures. Well, the difference was we could detect the failures with ISUP. We couldn't detect the failures with CAMA. <coughs> There's a lot of times in the MF, in the MF signaling networks, we don't really know there are a lot of problems. And as we're moving to IP and others, we can detect the problems quicker. We can reroute the problems quicker. We can we can move to other ways. So it gives us a lot of advantages, but there'll be there'll, there things are a lot different there. And that's going to be a lot of advantages as we're, as we're kind of moving forward to the next generation. It gives us a lot of great capabilities that we may have in times of <laughs> of disasters on routing around um, or routing around circuits, routing around different areas to to solve the problems. As or Henning was talking about. An advantage we have on moving to IP also, or as he was talking about the different network transport technologies, a lot of times in the old world we had copper running or maybe fiber running to certain areas. And if we needed, if you had failures or needed to, um, to move that circuit to something else, it was very difficult. Now the, with IP, your routing is kind of independent of your transport. So your transport could be copper there. It could be DSL, cable modems, and so on. It could be fiber. It could be across satellite. It could be across um, wireless. We're seeing the first net going out there and the, and the ability to possibly use this, a combination of a, of a wired network and the wireless LTE network with first net can be a transport for public safety. And the nice part is, is all of these can go across those transports and be somewhat transparent to the application. So it makes that a lot easier to be able to move in sort of the new world. John, you know, it strikes me that there's a tension, though, between the additional robust one, robustness one could build into the system now because of the greater flexibility and the greater efficiency that companies and uh, governments can now uh, uh, set up their systems so that before what had a dependency that was only within the county itself uh, uh, now has an interdependency on a data center, in your case, in Colorado and Miami, yes. that if you can't get to Colorado or Miami, uh, th there's uh, a, a much uh, uh, lesser uh, uh, functionality potentially uh, I I to the system. So I, I think that if we could explore that tension between um, better robustness and uh, uh, greater efficiencies uh, uh, allowing smaller footprints. Yes. Question. Christian Vogler. I'm the manager of the Technology Access Program at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., working with deaf and hard of hearing consumers. Uh, so if we're comparing the TDM world to the IP world, we're seeing just that they're so completely different, and there's very little in common from my perspective. Um, one of my main goals is communication access to emergency services, is what I think about for my constituency. And that means direct access to communication without having to work around and walk around some other services through third parties. Uh, if we look back to TTY in the TDM era um, and comparing that with voice calls, now we're looking at uh, the 2000s, we switched over to a more IP-based technology rather than relying on the old TTY that operate on the POTS network. Um, there was a cost, however. The cost for switching to those IP technologies, which our populations did, was less access to emergency communications because the, the emergency communications uh, world had not caught up to the IP networks. However, now that we see those networks moving towards IP, we can see the improvement in access to emergency communications for deaf and hard of hearing people and people who have speech disabilities if we do things right at this point we will be improving access. 
Uh, we're looking at text access. We're looking at video, two-way video access, and data access to emergency communication. At this point, we can't take advantage of any of those methods because the emergency access points don't support that. And because they're all operate under local authority, um, they're not supporting our, our communication access needs. I want to stress the importance that everyone should support all of these different media um, media streams, if you will, whether it be voice, audio, video, and data, as well as text. We have not seen that happen yet. That means that now um, we are we are struggling to get the access that we need in the transition to the IP world. We will see some uh, accessibility, accessibility devices that will not have a fully equivalent replacement in the IP world. I'll give you one example where we're talking about the TTY. TTY is very easy to use. There isn't an equivalent device that is as easy to use in the IP environment. We, give you, we gave the example earlier of um, radio alerts, we don't have any kind of uh, replacement for that in our IP world. So we have to figure out how we're going to handle those challenges. Peter. Welcome. Would you put, pull the microphone up so we can make sure. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Peter Valkun. Um, I'm with Comnet Wireless, uh, a rural cellular carrier in, in western United States. And um, um, I work for a, a larger company, um, Atlantic Tel Network, and we have a bunch of sister companies that uh, run wireless networks in the Caribbean islands and, and in South America. So all of these markets are very rural. And um, when uh, when I was looking at the agenda and uh, looking at these different scenarios, I realized that uh, uh, a rural carrier in, in anywhere in the world, in, in the federal government, have a lot in common. Um, it, for us, and specifically when, when we look at the IP communications, uh, the ability, um, so the commonality is we don't, we don't have deep pockets and we have to make the best with what, um, what's, you know, what, what, we, what we have budget for. And what IP communications, a transition that we completed probably three years ago um, allowed us to do is, uh, I mean, now our network is a lot more robust. Uh, robust. We've um, and we've seen it several times, where in in the TDM world, where we would have had service outage, uh, we were able to, or our systems were able to reroute automatically, and our customers never perceived uh, per perceived the change. Um, and uh, so I, I think, from our perspective. The, the conversion has happened. I, I know that uh, those, and, and I think uh, we heard it from from the speakers earlier. Uh, on the PSAP side, I think there's there's challenge. I mean, we know in in some of the markets where we are in in um, rural Nevada, for example, there are PSAPs that still do not have phase two capabilities, and and I suspect uh, are not of um, for whatever reason that is. It could be it could be budget constraints. Um, it could be access to um, it, it could be the local uh, local governance and um, so f from our perspective what we um, what uh, what we focus on when or when we when I when I look at IP communications uh, they're here they've been here probably for the last three years um, and when I look at how people communicate and, and how I think about uh, for our company or about our customers about emergency communications, I think of uh, access to data services. So when you know I, there there are a number of scenarios here, one through three. But if if you really think about it, what what we need to do as a carrier, we need to make sure that at those moments our networks have and our customers have uh, uh, data services available to them that they can which allows them to quickly report um, uh, accidents. I mean, there, there are applications today. If you go to Google Maps, you'll see um, uh, people reporting with, com uh, with apps like Waze um, accidents. And uh, so I think 
it's for, from our perspective, it's less about IP versus versus TDM. That's been three years ago. Now it's sustaining and and improving reliability of the data network. And I think it's just as important as the universal and one access is universal uh, data connectivity. Peter, thanks very much. I was in the Clark County, Nevada PSAP last week, and one of their great concerns is the interface between a local carrier and a long-haul carrier. And now there are critical components of response that aren't served by the local carrier. They're served by that interconnect to the long-haul carrier. Yet there's no ability today between carriers to really um, preserve attributes of prioritization of packets uh, across that interface. Uh, so uh, uh, as we get more efficient and uh, do, as Henning suggested, uh, aggregate uh, uh, functions that can be aggregated uh, uh, a distance away, uh, I think that seam between local carriers and long haul uh, uh, and how do we preserve prioritization uh, is something we need to examine. Right. Good morning. Uh, thank you. I'm Brian Joseph with CTIA, the Wireless Association. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to uh, echo a little bit of what Peter said. Um, in terms of the, uh, the transition in wireless, um, this is already taking place uh, in an IP world. Uh, about 40 percent of the U.S. population already has, has made the transition from wireline to wireless only. Uh, you have even more who uh, will be wireless, classify themselves as wireless mostly. Um, the industry recognizes, uh, you know, the importance. Uh, I think when you're seeing ubiquitous coverage, low prices, fast broadband services, uh, we also have the resiliency and the reliability of the networks, uh, and we take that very seriously, particularly with the acknowledgement that the majority of 911 calls are coming over wireless. Um, you know, but as uh, has been acknowledged this morning, uh, we are in a much more diverse environment. So uh, to a certain extent, uh, much remains the same from the wireless uh, provisioning uh, from a TDM uh, to an IP environment. And so the uh, intelligent routing, the redundancies, the greater efficiencies uh, transfer in an IP environment and with the uh, rapid proliferation of LTE devices, it's here today. Um, on the other hand, uh, there remain some of the physical infrastructure constraints that have existed uh, throughout um, you know, the, uh, the history of wireless. Um, things like in a traffic surge situation that might inundate one cell site, you have only a finite amount of spectrum. You have a finite amount of network uh, capacity. But uh, there are also other stakeholders. There's really now a multiplicity of stakeholders who are going to be handling and touching elements of emergency communications, whether it's a 911 call, whether it's a text to 911, whether it's, uh, you know, a voice video in, in a future NG911 application, and certainly wireless emergency alerts. Um, and those need to be accounted for. Um, that uh, the management of consumer expectations is key. Uh, the management of the PSAP operations is important. We, we talked about uh, the intelligent integration of what could be a vast amount of varying data points uh, and how that is handled at, at a PSAP end, um, but then also a vast amount of information in, an, in a wireless emergency alert and informing the public in the case of, say, a, a chemical spill on the highway where you may want to, you know, pinpoint who uh, is informed of the alert, but also to the Admiral's point, ensure against spoofing, against misinformation, or, or frankly just inaccurate reports coming in from social media, and that authentication, that verification, and security, when you have now this multiplicity of stakeholders, is going to be essential. Dorothy. Good morning, everyone. 
My name is Dorothy Spears Dean, and I'm here representing the Commonwealth of Virginia. I manage the state 911 program as the public <coughs> safety communications coordinator, and I also have the dual pleasure of representing uh, an organization known as NASNA, the National Association of State 911 Administrators. So what I'd like to do in response to the scenarios that uh, the facilitator presented was to look at uh, or, or frame my comments as, um, as focusing on them from a state program perspective to address the various scenarios that were presented. Um, I'd like to comment on network and systems, a request for service, response, the technical support, and operational support. This is some of the behind-the-scenes information that is necessary in order to carry out the response to the various scenarios. Looking at uh, the scenarios, breaking it down to a network and system approach, right now our network, when we look at 911, is often uh, stovepiped. Um, it is a closed system. It is a standalone system. What we are evolving to with, with IP transitioning is an ecosystem. It's a system that um, is going to be focused on emergency communications, not just a single application such as, as 911. So we're moving from something being very isolated to more of an ecosystem with a great number of additional uh, stakeholders in that. The request for service, um, what we are, and I say request for service because the 911 call will evolve from just being a voice call to a call that could come through different mediums. Um, the call that we receive right now is only limited to 512 characters. That's the amount of data that can be displayed on the alley screen. The PSAPs of the futures, the 911 centers that will be receiving the requests for services, will be more self-determined. They will be looking at a future that could be potentially limitless with data, but we need to be able to bound that limitlessness um, by managing the amount of information that the PSAPs receive, and that will occur through planning and need assessment to narrow the focus. The response. Right now, there's a limited ability to assess calls when they're coming in. It's done through a very structured environment. The future can be seamless. It can be adaptable. It, the, the 911 centers of the future will operate more as information brokers to provide a holistic response to the various scenarios that were presented. Technical support. Uh, that underpins the response and the operations have been historically LEC focused, the local exchange carrier. The language that has been spoken has been a telco language. We are moving to a much more IT centric environment where the language is going to be about networks and systems. And finally, from an operational support perspective, we operate in a truncated environment. We look at things from an EMS, fire, police perspective, but we have to move to a much more holistic environment where we're looking at things in a in an ecosystem and I started off the the comments by talking about the ecosystem and I wanted to end with that because that's the beginning in the end Thank you, Jason. good morning my name is Jason Legria. I'm a senior staff attorney at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. We are a national organization based here in Washington, D.C., and we, our mission is to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and other underserved people uh, by building a fair and equitable society for all. Uh, just to uh, give some background on the Asian American community, 60% uh, of us are foreign-born, as, as if they were not born in the country. One out of three do not speak English uh, very well, or they're limited English proficient, or LEP. 21% uh, of Asian Americans uh, are linguistically isolated, meaning that all household members uh, over the year, over the over 14 years of age, uh, speak English uh, very well, less than very well. And so, with this tra transition to uh, you know IP-based public safety networks, uh, it's very promising for uh, the Asian American community and other immigrant communities. Uh, it allows for communications that are nonverbal. Or there, it's through movie, uh, you know, f movies, film, movies, images, text, whatnot. Uh, it also allows for communication of your location a lot easier, and also it allows to route calls from one PSAP to another. For example, if that that original PSAP does not have the language capability uh, to meet someone's needs who are calling in. But what I see is that this. A lot of the same issues will always remain whether you're talking about a TDM network or an IP network. You know, technology does not address the cultural competency of an agency. You know, agencies still need to understand their communities that they serve. 
They need to look at the trends in terms of the change of populations, where these people are coming from, what languages they speak, are they linguistically isolated, uh, what are their attitudes towards interacting with the government. For example, some Asian people come from countries where, uh, you know, they came from where they were oppressive government regimes, and they're scared of speaking with the government. Uh, what are their preferred modes of communication? Uh, you know, agencies need to understand that and plan around that so that when the transition comes, they could, uh, they could use the right resources to address those needs. Finally, regardless of the technology, there will always need to be education. Uh, you need to educate the community on what it means to dial 911 or 311 or, you know, when you're using different IP technologies now, they, they need to understand what are the new capabilities that will be available to them uh, with these new technologies. Morning, John. Good morning. John Tremonti with Mission Critical Partners. I wanted to talk uh, first, even though we're today focused on technology, that there is going to be this whole aspect of the transition that is about non-technological issues. As Mr. Snap from uh, Entrado said, it's about the transition. It'll be about operations, policy, governance, um, funding, the need for standards. I, I can't uh, uh, understate the, the need for us to address not just technical standards, but standards across the board. They might be performance standards, training standards, testing standards, operational standards. Uh, having the ability to, as we uh, connect everybody, to be able to talk the same language, to operate in the same way, that's going to be crucial to this transition. So I think that's going to be a key uh, understanding to th that this is a similarity that uh, doesn't go away with this technology transition. One of the things that I, I think we'll see as a, as a difference, though, is that with this technology transfer, uh, the transition, the, the PSAPs will be inherently interconnected. We're going to have a, a greater reliance on technology, a greater reliance on our neighbors, uh, the people that we work with. We may not have worked with them before. Uh, the need to establish relationships, uh, not only with our neighbors, but with uh, PSAPs across the, uh, the United States will be very important. As um, Henning mentioned earlier, that the technology will enable breaking down of these silos. No one will be any longer a, an island unto their own. But that increases the need for um, reliability and resiliency for our PSAPs, uh, making sure that there's no single points of failure. Uh, as we've seen in the news uh, recently, there have been uh, fundamental uh, challenges for PSAPs. Um, this has the potential, the, the transition has the potential to increase the field of damage, if you will. It's no longer just a single PSAP going down. It might be a region or a statewide network uh, failing. And that has more dramatic effects uh, to a much larger community. And thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. And I'm glad you, you mentioned standards. Uh, it strikes me that there's a, a tension, though, between standards and innovation. And standards take time, particularly uh, uh, technical standards. And what we're seeing now is the velocity of capabilities and new functionalities that arrive on the stage that don't start with standards uh, uh, that then have this migration of use by the public. Uh, so I, I think it's important as we go forward and look at, well, what's our, our, our life going to be like as we try to reduce risk uh, in public safety communications as we go forward? We, we, we need to, to find a sweet spot uh, between the agility of innovation and, and, and wanting to bring in new uh, functionality and, and standards. And maybe standards in the future are written uh, intentionally to be more flexible and account for innovation as well. Good morning, Mike. My name is Mike Ernst. I'm with AT&T. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. AT&T wears many hats uh, in this environment. We are a local exchange carrier. We are a wireless provider. We are a VoIP provider. And um, my particular um, view of this is from a public safety 911 uh, product management perspective, providing services to the, uh, to the industry. Um, and looking at the scenarios, what are some of the um, similarities? People need assistance. People need reliable assistance. People need 911 to be there. Um, uh, that's, that's the same today. It will be the same tomorrow. But people's needs are changing. Devices are changing. Methodologies are changing. Um, we're moving uh, much more into an environment where we're much more mobile, 
and those, um, those needs be, need to be reflected as we move the technology uh, forward. When we take a look at the uh, world of TDM versus IP, as a service provider, uh, TDM is very stable. It's an old technology. It's well known, but it's single purpose. It has a single purpose. Uh, to echo your comments, IP is there, but it's evolving. Uh, technology standards are evolving, and it's very challenging to, um, uh, to um, deal with the innovation we need to while the standards are, are evolving. It's easy to put in something that's neat and gee whiz in a, in a particular location, but scaling that across uh, a country reliably is very difficult. We must have standards. Uh, and we must find a way for those standards to occur in a fashion that we can deploy them, de deploy the uh, services uh, reliably. We're in a multi-vendor environment. That means we need supplier cooperation. That means we need clear and um, uh, uh, good interoperability testing in order to make this network work. We have networks of networks that are being deployed uh, in the in the um, traditional 911 environment. We were very geographically uh, con uh, constrained. In the new 911 environment, we have the opportunity to extend that uh, beyond a region to a state, and even perhaps um, beyond that as we think about dealing with disasters. Um, all of those things are uh, promises of the IP technology. The challenge for us as a service provider is to deal with that and make that happen in a fashion that we can meet our customer needs, that we can uh, uh, introduce more flexible policy-based routing capabilities and um, provide um, the new capabilities as they come out in, into, the, uh, into the market. It's quite an exciting time to be there, but it's certainly um, one where uh, dealing in a multi-vendor, off-the-shelf equipment environment, there are certainly challenges that we continue to face. Thank you. Terry. Uh, first off, thank you for the invite today. Uh, my name is Terry Hall. I represent the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials International, or APCO. I'm also a practitioner. I run a regional um, uh, 911 center for York County, Pocosin, and Williamsburg, Virginia. And uh, normally when you follow a panel like this, you say they said it all, but there's so much to go on this topic, I can use the next three hours on this. <laughs> I wanted to tell you that in my own piece app, you know, I have some firsthand experience about being first. We've done some first office applications for, for many different technologies, and it would be remiss of it and say this is National Telecommunicators Week, so remember when you get back to thank your 911 professionals. But the impact that it has on the staff is astronomical. When I went back and told my senior staff we were going to start taking text to 911, I thought it was going to be simple. They gave me four white pages full of issues that were going to happen that were real. So include your staff in these presentations. Secondly, as we look at the evolution, Richard made a comment that I've written and I've been preaching for two years. We talk about transition. Transition is a nice buzzword of today. Richard used the word evolution. That's what we're going to. We're evolving to next generation 911. There's an enormous amount of miscommunications out there with the transition word. Everybody is saying, oh, FirstNet is next generation 911. It's not. It's a, a broadband spectrum that public safety is going to use as a tool. It's not going to replace what the general public is using right now. So that's a, uh, that's a, a bad way. We also have an opportunity. It was very interesting that I saw the three scenarios that David had put forward because in the last two weeks I listened to a live active shooter call where there were uh, five dispatchers on duty. And I'll point out that 80% of the 911 centers in the country, 80% have less, five dispatchers are less on duty at a time. So you hear about the big ones, remember 80% is five or less. But in listening to this active shooter call, Two people had been killed. There was a 20-minute uh, response before they were able to do an entry on the building, and it was because these five dispatchers were on duty, did not have the ability to dispatch police, although they were the primary call takers. So they were transferring the calls to another agency that had one dispatcher on. So you had multiple calls coming in this 911 center. The only action they could do, no interoperability, is to turn around and transfer the call to another agency. So I look at this next generation transition as an opportunity to fix something that's broken. I think over the next several years you're going to see more consolidations. It's how you do more with less. 
And if we can get the governance piece and the standards developed and things that are enforceable, last week we had an entire state 911 system go down and had over 4,500 911 calls go unanswered. That's unacceptable. We need to fix those things through governance, through laws and regulations and standards. Thank you. Wade. Good morning. Thanks for uh, having me here in the panel. I'm uh, with FEMA, with the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS. Um, I hope you've heard of it. Uh, but if not, um, kind of uh, from a transition point, from an IP uh, versus a TDM transition, I want to speak specifically only about emergency alert and warning. Um, alert and warning, uh, from that perspective, has been in a transition for probably years. Uh, one of the key things that we run into in a difference on, in most cases between IP and, and TDM from a messaging perspective is knowledge that your message got there. On the emergency alert and warning side, from the very beginning, uh, the, the systems have always, and the people who, the public safety officials are responsible for sending emergencies uh, messages to the public ha, are used to or have been dealing with not knowing if their message you got there. Um, the way that that's been worked around is to do it in a broadcast fashion. Uh, and some of the mitigation to that is to always use as many communications means as you can get that message out over. So by not knowing if your message is going to be received, you inefficiently just put it out there on every single piece of uh, media that you can get it out there. Um, Kind of some keys from an alert and warning perspective uh, to the messaging. Uh, the, the, the things that are important to getting that alert and warning message out to the public are uh, it needs to be timely. Uh, so this is information that needs to get to the public in a very timely fashion so that they can perhaps save themselves or save others around them. Um, it needs to be relevant to them. And then it all needs to be authoritative. Um, I pause as is a... Uh, as a result of years of work um, and trying to build a transition between these multiple network paths, the realization was that radio and TV needed to be supplemented by the multiple communications paths that people are using. Um, so uh, the trick was to develop some sort of messaging that could bind a, a bridge across multiple communications piece. Standards was the, was the answer that was pushed for years. Um, so IPAWS has built an architecture that uh, is based around an information messaging standard um, that's not tied to or uh, necessarily hampered by any one, either IP or TDM communications uh, methods. Basically, it's a format that's saying, here's a message, here's how timely it is, uh, here's who it's relevant to, uh, and and here's the authoritative source that it came from. And then we're completely, 99% relying upon private sector uh, infrastructure for getting that message to the public. Um, what's happened as we've begun the transition is that those networks today, the newer networks, along with uh, uh, the the older technology networks, are making the the ability to put that message uh, to uh, to the relevant area to smaller groups of people better. Uh, IP location aware devices are something that we're, uh, is going to make that even more so in the future. Um, the wireless emergency alert system gives it's still broadcast. We're still doing broadcast that way, but we're broadcasting to a much smaller area that public safety message. So. Um, I'd say, uh, you know, uh, going forward in the future, we see that we're, again, even more reliant upon the private sector for delivering those messages to the public when we're communicating to the public uh, and looking for uh, to continue to maybe perhaps work with, in a standards way, uh, the ability to say that this is a critical message that needs to move maybe first through a network. Uh, the timeliness of, of it is very critical. And uh, the people it needs to get to is, uh, on a timely way, is very important. Thank you. Wade, brought, or, uh, alerting has uh, always in the past provided us a very useful, diverse way of communicating to the public uh, about emergencies. Uh, uh, one of the things we'll certainly want to look at uh, at the commission is as we go forward and we get this better alerting because we're now uh, uh, commingling uh, IP. Uh, with protocols that were intentionally designed to be diverse, Broad, right. is that we not unintentionally um, 
allow single points of failure uh, because we had touch points where the two protocols <laughs> became dependent on each other. Uh, right. uh, so, so we'll definitely want to look at that, and we'll want to explore that later in the cyber uh, uh, panel as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning. Uh, Bill Ferretti uh, from Montgomery County, Maryland. I'm the PSAP Deputy Director. I want to echo Terry's comments. I'd be remiss if I didn't to recognize the professionals that are sitting in the 911 centers today, especially this week of National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week. Every day, uh, today is no exception. 911 calls are getting answered. They're getting answered in a timely fashion. They're getting routed to the correct PSAPs. They're coming with location information. They're being triaged, and first responders are going out. That's not going to change. That can't change. The expectation is, is that it will continue. Uh, as has been said, it's no longer going to be in call. I would say it's going to request for a service or it's going to be a contact. But it's going to be coming from a variety of places. Unfortunately, when you look at those three scenarios that, that, that are, were described to us, all three of those have played out in our county. Um, and all three of those don't affect just our county. We look at 911 and the transition regionally, and I would encourage everyone to look at it regionally. I know the commission has to look at it much as a national effort, but for us, that, that's a little broad-based, but it, we also recognize we can't just look at it as a city or a town, especially in the area that we live in here uh, in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Our population is very mobile. Their expectations are the same regardless of what jurisdiction they have to be dri that they happen to be driving through or traversing through at any given time. We, the transition to IP began, and I would echo the comments that it is an evolution, it began years ago. Even in our PSAPs, we started moving to IP within the way our, our uh, PSAP telephone systems work. Today, I have a mixed mode environment. I have some TDM phones and I have some voice over IP phones that connect, connect to our phone switch. Uh, and we've done that in, in a, uh, a controlled fashion and to, as, a, as learning, as we have seen uh, over the past year, as texting has done with the various pilots throughout the, the country to try to learn and so that when the eventual rollout does happen, uh, it, it happens seamlessly and it can happen at, at, a, at a gross regional level. With uh, the, the movement of the networks to uh, IP, we will see improvements in routing and we will see improvements in the types of information that we get, whether that's d direct data coming in from alarm companies through telematics, the data that we're going to get from video uh, and from pictures, those are, and w improved accuracy in terms of that location, improved routing in terms of you, being able to know where the device is exactly without being reliant. And when I'm talking about phase two wireless, we're no longer as reliant on uh, older technologies. We're going to get down to smaller areas and we're going to get the in-building coverage. Um, it does come with a certain level of intrepidation um, because as we open up this network, as has been said across the panel, the vulnerabilities uh, are going to be far greater. Um, vulnerabilities not only for the networks but to the operators that are sitting in the chairs, they're going to be exposed to a lot more information and are going to be, exposed, are going to be expected to be those information brokers. Um, and also, it does provide opportunities, because uh, as I was listening to the panel, it, st it struck me that our messaging going back out has, does have carry with it the capability to maybe limit some of the additional 911 calls that normally would come in if the public is already aware that first responders uh, are taking action and are already en route to an event. Thank you. Trey. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you for hosting the panel. I, too, would like to call out National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, it's something that's very important to my organization. I'm Trey Forgety with the National Emergency Number Association, or as most people know us, the 911 Association. Um, I, I think it's been said a few times here, but to, to boil it down very simply, um, the networks will change the mission will stay the same. One way or another, regardless of whether we're using TDM networks or IP networks, um, we, we must serve the public. We must have reliable service. Uh, we must have location uh, capabilities so that we can find people in emergencies. And uh, we have to be able to defend our networks, our systems, and our facilities so that we can go on providing the public safety services uh, that the public needs. Um, there will, however, be some differences, and Admiral Simpson, I think you are a pretty good foil 
in this regard with one of your earlier questions because you mentioned the need for extensibility uh, in standards. One of the unique roles that my organization plays is we are the, the technical standard developer for uh, next generation 911. That's a bit unique. In the past, uh, all of the technical standards development for this sort of thing was done uh, exclusively within the carrier community. Uh, public safety had a very limited role in this. In next generation 911, uh, the carrier community still has a very large role, particularly because uh, they are the operators of the access networks uh, and the originating services networks that will get consumer traffic uh, into next generation 911 systems. Uh, but at the same time, the public safety community has had this unique ability to sort of define our own requirements, define our own uh, technical services uh, through the I3 standard, and then through the help of uh, industry uh, members uh, like John's company and Trotto and TCS and AT&T and many of the others around the table here, to go out and cooperatively test those uh, in an industry collaboration environment uh, to, to look at how those are going to fit together. Um, one of the key differences, and, and this is what you mentioned, was that uh, in, in an IP network, the, uh, the service is no longer exclusively tied to the network. It can be very different. You can in introduce new services, new things, new media transport methodologies that you've never had before. That's very important, and that's one of the reasons um, that uh, within the technical standards we develop for Next Generation 911, we've made sure that the service sets are extensible. So as new services come along, uh, provided they can use the signaling and transport methodologies that are very common to Internet technologies, uh, those can get into uh, next generation 911 systems and can be handled uh, at public safety answering points. Um, and that sort of highlights the difference between the sort of static architecture of existing TDM-based 911 systems, where it's very difficult to move calls around. It's a technical problem. Um, to uh, a next generation 911 environment where doing things like rerouting calls instead of a technical problem becomes simply a governance problem. It, we just need the agreements uh, in the right place. Um, there are lots of problems like that, uh, that that shift from being complex technical problems to being more governance problems uh, in the next generation 911 standpoint. I think a few others have mentioned that uh, before as well. So key challenges going forward. Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Sorley. Um, I'm the chair of the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council's Technology Committee. Uh, in my day job, I work for the city of Houston, and uh, I manage a large radio system, which we haven't really talked about around the table, but it's also um, moving to an IP-based uh, technology model. Uh, but obviously that's for another day. I have several things I, I'd like to talk about. One, I, I'd like to point out that IP does not necessarily mean compatible. Um, we, we talk a lot about IP and the transport layer, uh, and there's a certain implied compatibility there. But when you get in the application layer, just because your uh, IP-based application doesn't mean you work with anyone else. Um, when you talk about networks, when you talk about the ability to monitor networks, a lot of those are proprietary uh, applications that ride on top of IP. So uh, when you talk about IP, uh, don't fall into the, uh, into the, the concept that just because it's IP, it'll work. Uh, that's not true. Um, I think we introduce, uh, in our old environments, most of our threats were physical threats to the network. You know, a device failure, a line flooding, whatever, the line got cut. Uh, now we're kind of shifting the risk to more of a virtual risk where, um, you, you know, we have hackers and all that sort of thing. So I think that's uh, important to note. Um, one of the – when we talk about um, people, people, which is what, what's in our 911 centers, fielding all of these various communications channels – um, I, I worry that they're going to be able to do that effectively. Um, I think we need to uh, be looking at middleware or something that is between this potential glut of multimedia information and the people that have to take it. Um, you know, we, we focus a lot on multi-channel communicating out, but when you realize that the multiple channels are coming in, how does one human deal with all of that? Um, how do you process it? How do you ensure it's not missed? 
Uh, most people that run 911 centers will tell you we record everything, we capture everything, we save all the records. How do you do that when you're receiving videos uh, of the same accident 50 times? Which one's important? Which one's not? Um, uh, the humans that's taking this, I mean, it's one of the highest stress jobs in the world. And now you're going to introduce visual um, stimuli on top of that, potentially. Um, wow, that's going to be fun. And then um, I, I would say for, everybody talked about standards. I wholeheartedly agree. It's one of the, the challenges we have is how do you keep your standards activity up uh, to a, an extent to make use of the technology. Uh, I would say uh, one of the things we're, we should focus on is interfacing tech, uh, technology standards versus end-to-end um, -end standards. So, uh, you know, I3 is an example of that. Uh, but we need a, a multimedia uh, interface to the PSAP that's standardized, that's back, that always ensures backwards compatibility, and then you can innovate to your heart's desire. Um, and I, I have other comments, but I'll wait till my next turn. So. Tim. Yes. Uh, my name is Tim Lorello. I'm with uh, Telecommunication Systems, or TCS. Uh, since the foundation of our com founding of our company back in 1987, our singular focus has been on the uh, enabling the convergence of voice-based systems and the trans transition of them to IP-based solutions. Uh, perhaps one of the best examples of that has been the efforts around text to 911. Uh, I can actually date all the way back to 2004, almost a decade ago now, when we were speaking with Dr. Judith Harkins of Gallaudet University about using SMS as a potential method of delivering text uh, information to public safety on the behalf of, uh, of the hard of hearing community who had started using pagers and cell phones more and more in that time frame instead of TTY devices. Um, I think I echo the point that, that it's a transition and it takes time to do the transition. But a lot of times it's not about the technology. Many times it's really about figuring out the processes, the methodologies. I think uh, uh, Her Terry Hall mentioned uh, the, the many things that were raised as we started trying to deploy some of these technologies and th the impact on the uh, environment. I think that's really important and we need to uh, continue to stay focused on that. Um, but one interesting thing that also came out of, of what we were doing with text to 911, uh, we tried to employ some of the things that Dr. Schultzman has suggested about using commercial technologies to, to help with these transitions. And so we used web-based uh, technology to actually provide the uh, text messages to the centers. One of the things we noticed, and it was somewhat of a surprise, is that text messaging allows us to multi-process. We could actually triage an environment, whereas before with voice, you had to handle a call. You know, the first person in was the first person dealt with in a call. With text messaging, multiple text messages could come in, and you could actually pick your way through the real text message was, that was maybe, maybe there were a number of good Samaritan messages, but within those was the real message that, of somebody in trouble. Um, so I think one of the things that we're learning about is data allows us to do triage. The other thing, though, and I think this is going to be really important, is as we move to IP, we have, now that it's in the data form, we can analyze it. We have a huge amount of data. Um, we have had a number of years of experience of collecting information about 911 calls for the purpose of trying to understand how well the location technology is working and being able to cal uh, collect all that information and then analyze it and allow us to, to either in real time, which I think is going to be really possible as we get to IP systems, of being able to do uh, determinations of whether we need to maybe uh, send a cruiser to a particular part of town that seems to be getting more IP-based, uh, more, more uh, 911 calls than usual, or whether it's post-mortem, where, uh, where we worked with Calnina most recently to try to understand what is it that happened with regards to location information not being delivered with the call in the first instances and realizing that it was really the rebidding that was not happening. So I think data and data analytics is going to be an important element going forward with this IP transition. I think that's a, a great point. And uh, call volume, uh, which it, Henning alluded to, is it, to me a, a great example of that where, uh, and, and California is already doing s some work with this, where you, you know your typical daily call volume patterns. Uh, uh, when you get a spike, and then you can then geo-reference that uh, uh, 
uh, what co contributed to that spike. And you see that, uh, oh, there's an annulus in the middle where I got no calls, but then I got a big pattern of calls out from it. And, oh, by the way, I also know that the center of that annulus is a chemical plant. Uh, y you know, y you can begin as uh, that uh, call center to uh, make some assumptions that you've got a chemical event, you've got some deaths in the plant, you, you, you know, and, and you can uh, be that much quicker in that uh, response uh, and then be anticipatory in the kinds of warnings you would need to make about uh, uh, chemical vapors now, uh, uh, and, and, and that's a great segue to the weather service. That's <laughs> Bob. <laughs> I'm Robert Bungie from the National Weather Service, from NOAA's National Weather Service. Um, uh, I can talk talk a little bit about what Wade mentioned in that uh, weather service. It's a transition for us, but we're actually pretty much in the IP. The transition's pretty much over, but we're still doing the older legacy dissemination through radio, for example. Um, but we we push our alerts out through warnings out as through as many channels as we can find. If if you come to somebody comes to us. With an idea for a new channel, we tend to see if we can figure out how to use it. Um, as an agency, and as 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 we w a change that we've been undergoing, um, maybe more at the cultural level, or just a better understanding of of what we call social through social sciences, uh, we're moving into an environment where we're where we're trying to understand and alert people through impacts. So as opposed to, okay, the scenario is a tornado warning, but a really, a really good example for us is uh, might be a little bit of snow on a cold day when we know the roads are cold and at just the right time for rush hour and we know it's in a major metropolitan area and we know we're going to end up, the, the, the DOT probably hasn't been notified in time or something. This has come up fairly quickly. And there could be a big impact to the traffic patterns. Uh, those of you in the D.C. area might remember the, uh, the, the a light snow that occurred in a, in a Springfield mixing bowl a few years ago. That's our classic example because the thresholds, the science thresholds, did not raise to the point of issuing a warning. Uh, an IP an IP environment allows us to better to try to better communicate when that impact, when that type of impact might occur to a smaller area. Um, and in that in, in that in that in that way, we're trying through a program we call Weather Ready Weather Ready Nation. We're we're focusing more on what we call decision support services, especially to the to the first responders, to the to the emergency managers, to the different communities that we interact with. Um, and we're using, as I mentioned, we're using more and more social sciences. Uh, there was a comment I I, I I liked the comments earlier by by the FCC CTO. Um, social media, we're, we're more, using more and more social media to understand what's happening and maintain, so, uh, re maintain situational awareness around us and, under, and, and getting the information from places and locations that we wouldn't have thought possible um, in the past. But at, this, at the same time, this, the social, these social sciences also tell us that in this era, in, the, in our era of using TCP IP, and common alerting pro, uh, and common alerting protocol and IPALS um, for a number of years we've been put we've we've been disseminating warnings with with latitude longitudes with polygons in very precise areas especially for tornado warnings and flash flood warnings but a lot of the warning systems are still county based mm -hmm. uh, we 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 would like to challenge everyone in the community to figure out how to push and use t use an IP environment to push the vertices, to push these lat long points to the device so that the device can determine if it's if, if it should be alerting the person who's carrying it. Because that <coughs> reduces the that reduces the amount of o what we call overwarning, which re which increases the trust that the end user, that the public has in the system. Um, uh, so and not only that, but if the device knows that it's in an area that's going to be impacted, it allows it potentially allows for an for for a display of a map. Now, what what we've learned through social sciences is 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 what we call a high information map. In other words, it's just not a map showing the impacted area, but it's a map showing the location of where they're at within that impacted area. We've also learned through uh, through a long period of time that that people before they respond to an event, they tend to like they tend to want confirmation of it. 
So you might hear of a tornado warning, but invariably, unless uh, uh, you might get a text or you might get uh, a, a, a wireless emergency alert, or you might get you might see you might get a text from a third service or from a, a, a local county service. But you're usually at some point you're either calling a spouse or you're calling somebody or you're look, turning on the TV or you're turning on the radio. You're looking for a secondary verification that you, that you should actually take action. Um, one other comment I'd like to make, uh, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we use as many channels as we get. We've, we've been using our common alerting protocol has allowed us to, to interact with one internet ad vendor to display, the turn, to display tornado warnings, the other short fused uh, warnings in place of advertisements on web pages based on the device location. And and it, it it's it's a, it was an interesting project to work on. It's an interesting thing to watch. It's actually, uh, I, I I think it's out there, but it's not as visible as you might expect because it works to the extent that okay, this relatively small area that's under a tornado warning, only those people in that area or who are surfing a web page that is served by an ad from that company is 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 seeing a web page. On the other hand, the that company can provide us reports back that have details about who received the alerts that as a public as, as a public official is almost too much information that I'm more information than I'm comfortable with from a privacy perspective because they know an awful lot about you um, so that is my comment these are great comments it's an exciting time to very watch how uh, weather alerting has really become very personalized uh, I, I am uh, struck by the uh, use of uh, cap for the ads uh, and uh, in the afternoon as we look at cyber I think we're going to want to look at man in the middle attacks and how one might with malicious intent create a widespread panic uh, because they were able to get in the middle of that stream uh, so it really becomes important to understand our accepted risk environment and to be able to communicate uh, between the, the multimodal world we're, we're headed towards, uh, accepted risk. Thank you. A, a lot of uh, very interesting ideas have been put on the table, and we have limited time to, to delve back into some of them. But I wanted to, to start by going back to 911, because uh, a number of people have indicated 911 will continue to remain essential and certain core functions need to be maintained as we move into this transition, or maybe we should now be talking about an evolution instead of a transition, as some have said. And uh, I also recall, I think it was Dorothy that said that, that in the legacy world, in the TDM world, 911 is a stovepipe. So, so one of the questions that I'd like to put up uh, for initial consideration is, as we look at the evolution of 911 in the IP world, should we be looking at 911 in isolation or perhaps in the context of a larger set of communications mechanisms that could be used by the public to uh, both call for help but also alert emergency responders to situations? And I'll just put two on the table in addition to 911. The first is, let's just say, N11, the other 211, 311, and so forth, which several people have mentioned. Uh, and then the other is the proliferation of social media that the public increasingly has access to and is going to use. And so then the question is, is are there constructive ways in which we should be thinking about the use of N11 and about social media in the same context as 911 so that when we think about this as an ecosystem, we avoid overburdening the 911 system in the IP world and uh, we are able then to target it more effectively to those types of situations where it really uh, is is most needed. And the question, I think, is, 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 is that a legitimate goal and how do we get there? And Trey, I'm going to put you on the spot by starting off with you. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> so so there's, a, there's a couple of points uh, here. Um, uh, we, we will definitely have, uh, in an all-IP world, access to many new forms of uh, new media for the public safety answering points. Uh, we'll have access to uh, images, video, data, 
uh, potentially uh, machine-to-machine communications uh, from things like, uh, I know Henning had an image of uh, Google's uh, sort of smart smoke detector up earlier, uh, things like that. Homes today are being built with 600 sensors. We have police cruisers with uh, automated license plate readers and all sorts of other data sources. Um, to Tom points, Tom's point earlier, though, there, there are, uh, of course, legitimate concerns in the public safety community about how do you integrate all of that. And um, the good news is that with this wealth of new data sources, you also have access to a wealth of new technologies to uh, handle those. Uh, so you have things uh, like uh, automated handling of certain types of data inputs so that it doesn't, not everything has to be something that a human looks at and reviews. Uh, you have the ability to have specialized uh, call-taking positions. Uh, so, so someone who just handles, uh, uh, you know, sort of high-speed events, uh, alarms, they just say, okay, verified alarm, dispatch sort of thing, or someone who takes the low-speed events like text and is trained to handle those using canned responses and uh, ultimately even canned protocol-based responses, things like that. Um, you also mentioned, David, uh, so those those tools uh, make it a lot easier uh, to handle that, that wealth of media that's coming in. Um, you also mentioned sort of the, the risks uh, involved in the transition. Um, there are a couple of things. As PSAPs continue to rely on TDM, um, I see two big problems uh, that I think w we sort of have to deal with uh, as an industry. Um, first is transition risk. Uh, there becomes some asymmetry in the ability of a potential attacker, for example, to originate traffic uh, toward a PSAP and the ability of a PSAP to, uh, to carry that traffic. Uh, when we get to uh, an IP-based uh, NG911 situation, uh, that becomes easier to handle through uh, manipulation of, of calls uh, in the border control function, the emergency services routing proxy, things like that. Um, but today, before we get to that point, and even while we still rely on legacy uh, PSAP gateways and legacy network gateways, that's going to be a key challenge. Um, the other one is uh, the continued reliance on TDM uh, puts us at a disadvantage in terms of the ability to uh, sort of see what's going on within networks uh, and monitor call flows and, and, to Tim's point, to really extract meaning from the data about our call flows. Uh, the Calnina filing was a perfect example. Um, it, it took a lot of teasing out to figure out that uh, rebidding was, was part of the problem, that uh, location service coding was part of the problem, uh, that uh, technology transitions were impacting how calls were delivered uh, or how location information was delivered and when. Um, a very complex situation that was hard to get visibility into given the limited uh, capability uh, within TDM for, for the, the sort of end user PSAP uh, to get a look at that. And that's something where IP gives us tremendous ability to start extracting meaningful data that's valuable even beyond just the 911 community. And, and by the way, I'd, I'd uh, encourage anyone uh, in the panel that has uh, a comment or a, uh, at, at this point in the conversation so we can kind of open it up a bit, uh, just raise your card or raise your hand. Terry, you're usually so shy and retiring, but uh, I'll, I'll recognize you. <laughs> I, I'll let him finish before I said something. No, I, I agree with uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of what's what's been said, but I, I'll tell you that it, it's really hard when we start talking about prioritizing. Uh, you brought up a good point about the web base where you can look at the difference between text, uh, but I think a basic one-on-one -on -one rule with a dispatcher: never assume that the second call is the same as the first. You'll get a fender bender on one side of the road, and a rubbernecker on the other side of the road, and it's a fatality or a near fatality that you know, requires a, a larger uh, response. I think that there's a lot of technologies and standards that need to be developed. About eight to ten years ago, APCO started a process that's now turned out to be a, a, a standard that's called ASAP, the Automated Secure Alarm Protocol. That's one such technology uh, that has now become a standard that links the central station alarm associations uh, directly to the 911 center in a non-voice uh, 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 type of operation. So an alarm goes off at a house or a business. It goes to the third-party alarm system, which simultaneously goes to the PSAP. So what used to take, you know, two, three, ten minutes now takes seconds, and we're able to do this in a non-voice communication. I think technologies of that we need to develop. When you start talking about applications, ABCO has been working very extensively on the application process. We have a couple of hundred on our website that are being vetted. There's probably a couple of thousand people out there 
that have uh, ideas on things that they want to pump through to public safety. So when the IP world opens up, they're going to go to directly to 911. There's an opportunity to categorize some of those in a non-emergency situation. As an example, through EAS and through IPAWS and through other mechanisms, you may be able to send out a message, report, you know, trees down in that matter to such and such. That's a way that you can categorize those as a non-emergency response and be able to partition those off into the 911 center. Uh, IP opens up an enormous pipe for us, and uh, pretty much the technology that we're looking at is endless. I think that there needs to be an emphasis put on consolidations. Consolidations is a word of the future. It's how you do more with less. And I think if, if some of the scenarios that are put together and some of the best practices can focus on some of these successes, I think it's going to really put us in a better shape. This is our opportunity to do similar to P25 uh, uh, standard 20 plus years ago. It allows us the opportunity to fix something that's broke and we're in the infancy stage now and if we get this right, we're going to be able to fix a lot of the problems that we have in our 20 plus year legacy with the existing 911 system we have. I, uh, I, I have John and uh, Tom who both want to uh, comment, but before they do, I, I wanted to actually direct a question to Christian and, and to Jason, which is what Terry's talking about is that, that this evolution to IP creates a lot of opportunities to effectively use the pipe, create new applications, some of which might be automated, some of which uh, might not, uh, that could help to put information into the ecosystem. And it seems to me that as we think about that potential, we also want to think about making sure that it's accessible to everyone in the public, including those with disabilities, including those, as Jason pointed out, who have language barriers. So I guess I'm trying to figure out how can we make sure that the opportunities that Terry is talking about, the kind of creativity that we're seeing even in the development of public safety applications extends to uh, those communities, so they have the same kind of access uh, that uh, everyone else does. And Christian, if I could start with you. Okay. Um, so first of all, I do think the important principle is access to communication um, for the perspective of people with disabilities. How to make sure that people with disabilities can communicate with 911 and other public safety entities. And um, related to that, we want to make sure that it's critical we have direct access, direct communication with 911 dispatchers or with other public safety personnel, meaning that we are not doing a workaround through a relay service or a third party wherever possible, that we are having direct communication in all of those different mediums and with the different types of media that we were talking about before. So we were saying with NG911 and the connection to IP technology, we have a greater facility to allow that, but we have to take action to make sure that that happens. When we're having communication that's occurring through these multimedia channels, it requires the 911 system to be a part of a network that supports that. And it requires terminals, so for example, our mobile devices, um, to be able to support all those different modes of communication. And if not, if we don't get there, we're going to be stuck in, so to speak, the dark ages. So I think it's very important for us to remember direct communication access with public safety officials. Um, I, I completely agree about extending the concept of NG911 um, to apply to you know any service, any of those N11 services we mentioned earlier, because at this point, we do not have that access. Um, you know, and so trying to figure out how to circumnavigate these things is very difficult. We don't have access through our third parties that we currently use to these N11 services, and so we're left with only this access through an intermediary to uh, 911. We want to be sure that we're integrated into this multimedia access and NG911 ecosystem. And I think now we have an opportunity to actually do the work to make that happen. Okay, uh, John, you had a comment. Yes, um, what, 
what we're seeing a lot of times is we're seeing a lot of not sort of non-traditional PSAP areas looking at getting into calls on receiving calls from non-emergency numbers. We're seeing a lot of universities and such that are typically outside of the direct routing of 911 calls. They may have a, they have their police department such and may have calls transferred to them, but they haven't been receiving calls directly from 911 as initially. We see a lot of those taking in services for the um, sort of the, um, the other types of emergency numbers they may use as a 10-digit number or a five-digit number for text or for voice. And what we're starting to see with the ability of IP with IP now, that they become more integrated on being able to communicate with the the primary PSAPs that were receiving the call. So these centers that were a little bit of dispatch centers before are becoming more tightly integrated with the other 911 centers because IP communications allows that. Before, all they were able to do is transfer a call back and forth. Now they're able to transfer data back and forth and transfer and do more types of calls. And as Christian said, it's very much they're getting direct communication. So they're, one of the areas they're starting with is texting directly to these centers where they may not be able to call directly, but they're able to use some other numbers that way. I think that's a great point, but I think we also want to be mindful of what Christian said in that there should be an expectation of direct communication with the 911 center. And if uh, uh, businesses... Uh, begin to say, well, look, I really want any call from my business or my properties to go to to my third-party center, and we'll determine if it's something that needs to be connected to 911. I, 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 I think we want to be clear in our expectations that when yeah. individuals have emergencies, individuals get to a 911 operator. Yeah, what, what a lot of these areas are doing is they're using it for non-emergency type use, but they're using the same capabilities that 911 centers have. So these centers that were just maybe little types of call centers are now taking in all the – so all those direct capabilities that can support sort of the deaf and hard of hearing community are coming into these. They're leveraging some of the capabilities at 911. And so the 911, this can be other avenues in time of sort of disaster that calls can come in. If they can't come to other areas, it starts distributing the network out there. I want to go to Tom, then I want to go to Jason, and then to Dorothy. So, um, I, I like to sometimes boil things down to uh, what can we do. Um, so uh, I think in some instances 911 services, although they shouldn't be, ha have been a case of the have and have nots. Uh, if you're in an urban area or you're in a large regional communication center, you can afford advanced things. Uh, even as simple as phase two, 911, there's many rural places that, that can't afford it, so they don't have it. Um, I think as we look at one of the things IP provides us is the opportunity to share advanced technologies over the network. So we can deploy uh, an, an alarm interface or a, a video interface or something such as that maybe once and share it or twice or regionally, uh, and, and I think uh, there's a lot more work that could be done from a policy perspective and from a govern governance perspective on how can we uh, help the have-nots out there from a 911 perspective make use of uh, these advanced technologies by uh, standardizing and limiting, limiting is probably a bad word, standardizing and uh, making available these various products uh, so that you don't have to come up with money to field them locally. Jason, I wanted to come back to you on, on the, the question of, of how as we move into this, this kind of multi-media uh, environment that Christian described, how do we make sure that, that the language issues are also dealt with uh, and, and other accessibility issues for the communities you represent? Sure. Uh, you definitely, you know, in the old days, emergency alerts were over the air, uh, over TV and radio. Uh, but you see, like, during Katrina, you know, a station can go down. Or maybe a station, there are no stations that speak a certain person's language. So I think that the IP transition allows for, you know, agencies to meet people on their own terms in the way that they can communicate. For example, you know that communities of color, uh, low-income communities, they over-index on wireless technology. They also over-index on social media. So, you know, those are ways that, again, you could have bilateral communications with these communities you're trying to uh, serve 
uh, just some examples are, for example, Alhambra, California. It's a place in Los Angeles. It's 52% Asian American. Uh, you know, what they did, they opened a Weibo account, which is the Chinese version of Twitter. And it allows them to, you know, communicate with their community in a way that they already know are communicating and highly adopting. So I think it's just a great opportunity, again, to, you know, meet the communities in the way that, you know, they are communicating it. Thanks. Dorothy? I think the discussion has been excellent up until this point in time, but what I'd like to ask the group is what problem are we trying to solve? We're talking about 911, and I see the mission of 911 having an opportunity to evolve, if you will. The, the conversation up until this point in time in the panel and outside of it has looked at 911 from a reactive posture. That is how 911 functioned in the past. IP is a great enabler. It will enable IP to do other things. The question is, what other things does 911 want to do? We're, we're hinting at some of the future directions in terms of equal access and the non traditional applications. A vendor would look at um, a, a situation and would look at the consumers and figure out what the gap is. What, what product do we need to develop to serve that audience or to serve that consumer group? So in some ways, 911 can do the same thing in terms of building a case for change and and looking at what services we, we want to offer. Looking at it from a state perspective, it's what's the needs of my constituents and how can I better serve my constituency through 911 services, if, if you will. The interesting thing about 911 is it it has a dual function, and that may be part of the evolutionary process we're working through. It is a service, but it can also be an application. Um, so we, we have to look at the, that dual functionality as we attempt to define, in my opinion, the mission of, of 911 moving forward, because that will enable us to determine what is in scope and what is not in scope. And, and if, if we, we focus on the area that's in scope, how do we go about solving it? And we are having discussions right now in terms of what some of those strategies are to overcome um, some of the issues that we're discussing. Okay. Uh, Tim, then I think I saw Brian, and uh, then I want to circle back and ask a question of uh, Peter and Mike. So, But let's go with Tim first. With this particular topic on, on non-emergency and the, 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 the convergence of 911 to support some of these other things, I'm going to ch suggest a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is, is that we need to have some sort of these other N11 systems have to be location enabled in some way, including if we're starting to talk about social media. Um, as, as Jason just pointed out, the, what will happen if we don't do something that's more location enabling of these kinds of so solutions is there will be a community, there will be some special handle that will have to be created. We saw this in the early days of text to 911 where we didn't have 911 routing and we had to create a special text number that would work for that particular community. And then it becomes an education nightmare. So ultimately, to, because response is local, we want to make sure that these technologies as we're thinking about ingesting them into this system become, they have to be location enabled as well or else we won't be able to figure out which community they go to. How are we going to monitor Twitter or, or social media and figure out which PSAP that, that question or, or our conversation should go to. Um, the second is opportunity though. Um, when we convert all this information into data, it allows us to bridge other resources into the picture that we otherwise might not have had. So, for example, on text messaging, we learned, wow, we can uh, we could possibly put it through a, a translator of some sort, the text through a translation. We might be able to now access somebody all the way across the country who speaks that language, and, and because we're able to sort of detect it by, by, again, analyzing it, we now can figure out which resource to bridge in. Could we use speech recognition to recognize information as, as, as voice becomes IP-enabled, and then figure out what other resources we can bridge in. IP opens up the opportunity for us to bridge in new resources that can help us solve and not only triage, but solve, uh, you know, bring extra resources to help us solve the problem that's at hand. Okay. Brian. <coughs> so, uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with anything said, and, and certainly we have seen, you know, uh, some, some really great advances and an evolution uh, with text 
uh, to 911 on, on the road to NG 911. I'm going to pick up on the uh, the N 911 uh, services and uh, take uh, take up the alerting to the public angle. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, in terms of multiple languages, uh, social media can play a, a key role. Uh, certainly, uh, industry and the uh, CISRIC is looking at multiple languages and the potential for that in terms of baking that into wireless emergency alerts. Uh, but Robert uh, made a great point, which is we have seen and there are studies showing that you know, people, upon receipt of the wireless emergency alert, upon that information, they want that confirmation. And they may consult. They may that may be both an opportunity to get additional information from the bell ringer WIA service, uh, but it's also an opportunity to uh, to get information in uh, multiple languages, um, and it's an opportunity to also make sure, you know, so the EOC can put out additional information, including confirmation via social media. Uh, but that has to be done in a responsible way, so a decidedly non-technical issue, but, you know, very important. There was a, a news story a year ago where uh, one of the uh, counties in Pennsylvania was saying they're issuing tweets without verifying that information. And so it goes to uh, establishing the public trust. Uh, you need to make sure that that information is verified, that it's authenticated, and that happens through WIA, but it should also happen uh, via social media, and that can be an opportunity uh, to uh, supplant and, and complement you know, the alerts, but also uh, the N11 uh, information that would ordinarily come in. So, Brian, I think that's a very important point, that people seek validation, uh, mm -hmm. and if we do this right, the diverse ways of getting the, the word out will allow us to thwart anti-spoofing uh, or, or uh, spoofing attempts, uh, as well as provide that validation, if we can align those two things. Mm -hmm. Yes, Terry. I'll make a, just a very quick comment. I wanted to, to say that, uh, because I want to make sure this message is clear as well, the Nina I-3 document that was written, when it was published last year, APCO came out and supported it. The good news that we have moving forward is that I-3 is now pretty much adopted by public safety as a way to move forward. So the good news is we have the start already there, and Nina's foresight in bringing the vendor community together certainly took a shortcut to where we are today. So uh, I wanted to mention that we do not need to have new technology to, uh, or competition for the I3 document. We need to utilize the I3 document for whatever technologies we put forward. And there's a lot of scuttlebutt about, uh, you know, hey, we can do it this way and this way. We need to have the one standard way of delivering this, and it needs to be I-3. Yes, Christian. Uh, Terry, I just want to say that I am also in support of that. I think it's particularly crucial for people with disabilities that we have standards in place for all of the ways that we are connecting um, because – we don't have a standard way to access all of these different services, then communication with 911 is going to be nigh impossible. I want to um, wait. I'll get to you in a minute, but I, but but before we do, I wanted to to bring in a question, um, and I think I wanted to start with Mike uh, and and with Peter to talk a little bit about how you see the role of the service providers on uh, you know the, the the on the commercial side in this evolution that we're talking about because I heard Peter say that you know your carrier Nevada had, had done its transition and in, in essence was kind of waiting for the peace apps to do theirs uh, and I think that Mike talked about a lot of opportunities in the evolution to IP to move from both the, the challenge of uh, it being more uh, in, in more of a state of flux than the TDM world, but also having a lot of opportunities. And I'd like to ask each of you, uh, and I think I'll start with Mike and then go to Peter, what, what do you see as the role of the carriers in not just waiting for this evolution to happen, but in actually proactively helping it to occur? First start, from a service provider point of view, I think one of the things we've got to do uh, is to continue to press for the standards and make sure that, that our supplier community um, embraces those standards in a fashion that um, we can have a significant interoperability testing in a, in a fashion that we can have a, a multi-supplier uh, environment. 
uh, in a fashion that innovation can take place, uh, but in, in a fashion that we all are speaking the same language. I think that that's critical. Uh, from a carrier perspective, obviously the um, you know the originating carrier is where it, where it starts, and so um, that also requires uh, consistent standards and a consistent approach. Uh, we don't want PSAPs to have to deal with uh, um, um, carrier A one way, carrier B another way, carrier C another a third way, carrier D a fourth way, and we're sort of in a mode that where that could be the case we're heading toward with um, some of the newer technologies. So I, I, you know, I just would, as a service provider, as a systems integrator, as a supporter of a multi-vendor, multi-supplier, off-the-shelf, NINA I3 vision environment, we just need, um, we need the constituencies that are represented around this table to rally around, to rally around that, uh, those sets of capabilities and those sets of standards. Peter? I mean, the, the last two systems that enable emergency communication, so CMAS and Text 2911, um, there was something different about both of those. Neither one was mandated by the FCC. Uh, the CMAS was an uh, opt out system, and Text 2911 is being implemented today. And it's, it's a voluntary implementation. And what I see is that certainly in our case, um, we complied, we welcome that. It's something that helps us as a service provider um, increase the level of trust that, that our customers have with us. I mean, there's been over the last couple of years, customers uh, – more identify with the services they're consuming, with the, the Facebooks and Googles, and, and l don't necessarily always realize the value that the service providers are, are providing. So it's the device, and then it's the app that I use. Uh, and, and I think um, service providers, we, we see that uh, providing these additional uh, services that, that increase safety and provide additional information to carriers are, are good for us and, and customers appreciate it. So I think as, as somebody mentioned, if, uh, if there is a new way to provide information um, in emergencies or, uh, or new ways of delivering customized uh, alerts, I think we'll be the first ones implementing it. Um, but it needs to be something that's, that's standardized. And, and I think the as service providers, we're now accustomed to shorter life cycles in terms of implementing things. Um, again, uh, just like there was a shorter gap between 3G and 4G and, and the service provider stepped up and implemented that standard, um, I, again, I, I think if, if there is a new standard that comes out that um, um, provides uh, and that, that we as service providers have role in, that provides uh, notification or means of communicating with uh, customers using social media. Um, I, I have no doubt that service providers will be there and, and will embrace it and implement it. Okay. Um, Wait, I didn't lose sight of you. Do you want to go now or, I, or should I go to Trey uh, for a response and come back to you? Um, I was just going to add, and, and I'll let this up to you, but uh, uh, we've been talking a lot about a lot of opportunity uh, but there's also some challenges, and that the challenges that we're talking about, the burden, uh, in other words, the, the IP opportunity of being able to speak to a whole lot more people uh, and a lot of different type of people at the same time, as well as to provide a whole bunch of diverse content in that message at the same time uh, is a great opportunity. The challenge of that and the burden of that falls upon the person who's creating that message. So that person who's sitting in the 911 call center who is responding or the whoever the authority is at that local level who has the challenge of filling in that message has the challenge of knowing what needs to go in there for his population that he's trying to speak to. Um, and I think perhaps, you know, the, the standards are supporting that today, supporting that diverse communication, but uh, it's falling upon the authority to fill in uh, what needs to be in there to speak to the diverse communities that he's speaking with. 
So there's a workforce standard component to this as well that we shouldn't forget. It's a, it's a, it's a training and education and assistance uh, problem, right? Trey, and uh, then Richard. I just very quickly wanted to uh, add on to something that Peter and, and Mike both identified, which is um, the, the access network providers have a very large role to play in uh, 911, next generation 911, particularly as it relates to location. But it, in a disaggregated world where the access network provider is not necessarily the same entity as the originating service provider, um, we can't lose sight of the fact that the OSPs matter uh, just as much. So when I'm getting my text messaging service from Apple through iMessage rather than necessarily through uh, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, or T-Mobile, uh, then uh, it, it, there's another entity that, that needs to be involved in order for this to work in a seamless and transparent way for the end user. Um, so we, we just have to make sure that we keep a uh, light of the fact that the world is becoming increasingly disaggregated across all services. Uh, you're seeing folks now using uh, voice over IP services over cellular, and they're not using the underlying carrier's voice network at all in some cases. Um, we have to be uh, conscious of that, and we have to make sure that we make it as easy and as low cost as possible for those access network providers, or excuse me, for those originating service providers to get to NG911 and that we don't break anything in the process in terms of location and some of these other functions. Okay. Richard? When a provider says, well, we've deployed IP, but that doesn't mean that they've done all the other parts of the NINA standard, whether they can deliver location with the call, whether they've set up an LIS. And so, you know, that, that part is, is very important, and just the IP is just the first part of that, but it needs to follow through consistent with the standard. John, did you have a comment? I kind of wanted to take this in a little bit different direction, and I apologize. I don't mean to go off too much on a, a tangent here, but one thing we really haven't talked about is how much is this going to cost, and who's going to pay for it? Um, it's it's a fundamental issue. Um, there's going to be a cost associated not only with the technology, but operations and maintenance, the training, uh, the the resources, um, and we we don't really know a lot uh, about how much it's going to cost. We know a little bit. We can look at some of the early adopters. Um, there have been some analysis and some reports about high level costs of uh, of what it will take to make the transition to next generation 91 but we're unable to answer fundamental questions about how many call takers there are in, in the United States or how many calls for service are we handling on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, I think some of that, um, or and, and probably probably the most fundamental, is how much does a, a single individual 911 call, call cost to uh, provide service. So we recognize that taxes and fees may not be able to sustain the 911 system uh, in the future. We need to look at new novel approaches to funding 911 and the transition. Uh, we recognize that grant programs exist today, and they, they might be good for uh, near-term um, equipment purchases or capital uh, expenditures, but they're probably not going to maintain 911 services in an operational or in an ongoing basis. There are a, a number of different opportunities for us to take a look at, whether they're public-private partnerships, whether they're uh, perhaps implementing some kind of reimbursement model. But we need to identify first how much it's going to cost and how we're going to pay for it. John, uh, I think it's a very important point, uh, and I'd add that the patchwork of funding streams that we have today in the 911 ecosystem that, that now it gets even more complicated in the IP world as you have the, the OSPs as, as well um, and uh, uh, interdependent systems that, that often cross states as well as um, uh, the, uh, the, the rest of the players there, um, that we potentially will arrive at a point where we have significant have and have not communities. And what should the public expect with in, a, in, in the variation that one would have in the kind of response they're going to get as they drive across the country? Uh, and uh, we ought to look at this uh, not through the lens of the most forward-looking, most well-resourced PSAPs, but we also need to look at it through the lens of the least resourced uh, uh, PSAPs and 
uh, determine w w what degree of variation is acceptable for our society. Well, and, and I want to follow up on that and sort of put a gloss on, on John's point and, and then go to Terry uh, and, and others that want to weigh in. The, the point, I think, has been made. Terry made the point that that 80 percent of the PSAPs out in the country are five seats or less. I think it was Bill that talked about the need to look at this from a regional uh, at least a regional perspective as opposed to treating each piece up in isolation. So I think the gloss I would put on John's point about cost is how do we, uh, how do we move forward in terms of organizing our efforts uh, and a kind of management model for pushing this evolution in the right direction and doing it in a way so that we don't have a small group of PSAPs that are haves and a large group of PSAPs that are have-nots. Um, it sounds, from what I've heard, like there's at least an opportunity here to share the wealth a little bit from a technological point of view. IP provides that potential. So what I'd like to ask, uh, I'll, I'll let Terry start and then others who'd like to weigh in, is, is, is what's the potential to help to, to answer some of John's questions through an approach that uh, tries to leverage a regional approach and including the have-not peace apps as well as the have peace apps in the process? Well, two and a half years ago, uh, in my own practitioner point of view, we started a, a process to go and deploy next generation 911. And the only parameter that, had, that we had was it was going to be an IP-based I3 technology. And when I, as soon as I3 became, you know, a document that was, you know, accessible, we wanted it to make sure it was going to be IP because, uh, and uh, I3 because it was going to be the future. I received quotes from $500,000 to $3.4 million. And those ranged, am I going to do a hosted solution? Am I going to do a non-hosted solution? And I could go to vendor A and walk out with their shirt and their tattoo, and then I would see what their version of I3 is, and I would go to vendor B and walk out with their shirt and their tattoo and see what theirs is, and they didn't match. So, again, using I3 as that backhaul, and, and now you've got the other question to do, we chose a hosted solution for one simple reason. We could not, if you visit any of the call centers, we could not ever provide that level of service in our jurisdiction, no matter how big you are or how small you are, and you're not going to continuously pay with the budget constraints you have right now for the technologies upgrade that you're going to have to have every couple of weeks. Um, we, go ahead. Yes, sir. One of the, the protections that in a switched world the FCC uh, insured was that carriers had to be able to unbundle services that they couldn't tie things so closely to, to, together that you had to just use them for uh, uh, certain sets of services. It sounds like what you're, you're saying is that, that there is a need to ensure that uh, as we implement standards, we don't do so in a way that uh, uh, ties a community too heavily to a single proprietary solution that over the long haul becomes unaffordable. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, there still needs to, and there will always be some local choice in what they do. And with the deregulation, that certainly puts us in a position to be able to do it. But you've got to have the same technology that you're looking at deploying. Uh, the term virtual PSAP, you know, comes to mind. My PSAP is virtual PSAP with another PSAP 40 miles down the road. You unplug your handsets and everything 100% transfers to the other PSAP. We're using our own microwave system to do it because there was no commercial service available that would give us the grade of service that we felt we needed to pump 911 across it. I3 and IP will do that in the future. So, in, so we'll use that as our primary and the microwave as a backup. Quality of service is, is, a, is a main point for us. But what I'm going to suggest is we do not have enough folks that have moved forward yet to put together the best practices document and we don't have the vendor community that has drawn together to agree on the technology. And with some of the things that are going on in court systems right now, trying to determine who owns what, it further clouds the situation from the PSAP uh, community. I've partnered with Vita in the state of Virginia, and we're doing a beta site. And I think the larger deployments you can do, and I've been preaching consolidations, will allow you to have to be able to do more with less. You can increase your services and you can save money, but that doesn't take care of the politics that prohibit consolidations. Okay, uh, Trey, uh, then Richard, 
then Tom, then Dorothy. I think you've all raised your hands. So clearly, clearly we've touched the nerve. <laughs> Hit on a, a, an absolutely key point, which is uh, the, the, in the standards work for uh, NG911 and I3, um, we took great pains to make sure that uh, we would not find the public safety community would not find itself in another situation where there was essentially one uh, party from whom you could buy service. In a lot of places, 911 is a service that you simply only can get from your incumbent LEC. Um, that's, we've actually seen situations where folks have, have gone out and, and have said, uh, we're going to deploy NG911 or we're going to go with an E911 uh, system service provider that, that's not you, LEC, um, and uh, so here's where we'd like you to send our traffic. And the answer they get back is, oh, you, that's great. Uh, we're, we're very happy for you. We'll, be, we'll redirect the traffic. But, uh, by the way, our tariff says you have to keep paying us. So now they find themselves in, in, a, in a situation where they're paying two different parties to get that sort of hosted service that they want because they want those added features or that added reliability, uh, but they're stuck because of the, the legacy rules. Yeah. Um, and so we were at great pains to make sure that we uh, enabled a, a multi-vendor environment so that uh, you know we could buy, you know, if Entrato has one component that we want and TCS has another, we can get those and, and they know how to talk to each other. Um, so that, that's something that uh, on the interoperability side I think has been very beneficial. Okay, well, let me go to Richard, uh, then I'll go to Dorothy, and then to Tom. When you're talking about piece of consolidation, I think you need to also define whether you're talking about just the call taking or whether you're also talking about the dispatch side. In some of the small piece apps, you go, well, we're going to consolidate the call taking. Well, the dispatcher who, who's local, if they're still going to stay there, your savings as far as personnel and you know other functions may not be as big as some people think. Also, you know, historically, like for example, in Texas, we work together on, on a lot of issues. For example, we work with Entrado and TCS to purchase uh, the VPC data each month for emergency notification. And we portion that out among all the state members based on population. And it does help out some of the more rural areas. Also, in, in Texas, we've always had what we call an equalization surcharge the original purpose of which was solely for those harder to serve areas. It was like a, a 911 USF type charge. And also the most of the tariffs, although there have been issues with tariffs in the past, not so much currently, some of those tariffs had bundled rates or a, a 30, $39 flat rate trunk, which greatly benefited some of the rural areas who were very far away. And some of the metro areas, you know, it probably might have been the worst situ the other situation. So there are some subsidies and there are some ways of working those issues and they've been done in the past and we're looking at it more in the future, how to share our resources. You know, we're looking at different possible partnerships among all your old areas, metro areas, and so that is going on in this occurring. Dorothy? The standardization of technology is easier to achieve than a standardization in terms of a funding model or policy. Um, we have 50 states. I dare say that we have 50 different funding models. How do you draw all those together? That would be a very difficult task, and I don't think that there is a, a one best solution or a single solution that would work for all 50 states and, and considering the territories as well. But there is one thing that all states have in common. There's a certain amount of money that is committed right now to 911. So there is money in the financial pipeline, if you will, to support 911 operations. The question is, how much does each state have committed? And we do have various means of, of collecting that information right now. What we can look at as a way to get to a standardized funding or maybe best practices in terms of, of looking at funding recommendations is to try to figure out cost efficiencies and cost savings. Is there is there a way looking at what we have invested on, on the state level right now, are there ways that we can do our job a bit more efficiently? Are there ways that we could leverage cost savings to invest in future technologies? And that brings us to consolidation. So consolidation doesn't always have to be a physical consolidation. It can be a consolidation of technology. And, and what 
my experience has been in talking to um, my um, peers in other states is that the consolidation of technology is where the real driver is in terms of savings, being able to do shared services projects, being able to host projects. Um, this is a phenomenon that we're seeing in, in, the, in the world of technology. And obviously IT is, 911 is becoming more IT centric, so it makes sense that we can, we can utilize maybe some of the best practices from the IT world in, in public safety. Tom? So, um, <clears throat> I'm normally the one who brings up stuff nobody wants to talk about, so here I go. <laughs> um, so I, I think uh, in public safety, historically, in many different technology fronts, we, um, we suffer from our own control freak issues. Uh, each individual agency, municipality, county, state wants to control their own destiny, their own technology, their own everything. Uh, one of the things that FirstNet, which we're not talking about, it, one of the advantages of that is that it provides a national contract vehicle, a, a vehicle that allows uh, things to happen on a national level and then the locals take advantage of that because there's economies of scale, etc. You know, perhaps we ought to be investigating what would be acceptable minimal standards for NG911 moving forward. And some of these places that currently can't provide phase two or a 911 or, or, or et cetera, maybe, maybe they shouldn't have a PSAP. And I, I know that's probably an unpopular position. And, you know, if you're going to burn me at the stake, I'll email you my address. But, uh, but, Quite, quite frankly, we, we have a lot of issues that we keep talking about the haves and have-nots, but part of that is we created ourselves because we want to control everything because we're accountable to our constituents. And, and um, so uh, years ago, and, and in some places we still have issues with, um, minimum standards of training for telecommunicators. It's the same kinds of thing, issues. People want to control their own destiny. Um, you know, in my backyard in Florida, when I lived there, you had to have a certification to spray pesticides and cut hair, but you could be a 911 operator off the street. So, I mean, it's, it's those kinds of things that we as a collective community also need to get together and look at governance issues and, and, and what is acceptable. I mean, it, it, shouldn't a citizen have the expectation to get a, a basic level of service when they call 911? And, and if, if not, maybe that community shouldn't be providing 911 service. And, and so maybe that should roll up to the state or to the county or to something else. And, and, and I don't have the answers, but uh, I really think um, the, the complete local control of this national system is probably um, an, an idea that's archaic and needs to be reconsidered. Tom, I, I'd suggest that there's, there's, certain, there's a public safety imperative to what you just said, that as we're getting better and better at things like weather warning tailored for where I am and who I am, I just watch my kids, right? They know if it's not going to snow until 3 o'clock, they know it's going to go from 70 degrees down to 40 degrees and it's going to happen over the next. They dress with much less margin <laughs> than, than we did years ago, right? So uh, my point is that if our margins of safety go down because we are relying on when uh, good systems happen on a good day and we know we're going to get just-in-time information, uh, uh, do we uh, then potentially set folks up as they transition across a national public safety landscape that has areas where that kind of margin won't cut it? <laughs> Uh, and we don't have sufficient warning that you're, you're, you're going from an area where, you, you know, thin margins were good and okay to an area where uh, there's a different margin of safety. We ought to think about that. We just have a, a few minutes left, and I actually wanted to bring the, the conversation also back to the relationship between 911, which we've talked about, and alerting, which we've talked about. Um, I, I think, Bill, you had, you had said at, at one point um, – that there might be a kind of a, an inverse relationship between being able to get information out to the public uh, and the volume of 911 calls that might come into the PSAP. 
And and my question, and I'll, I'll start with you since you brought it up, but I think I'd also like to ask Bob and, and, and Wade to comment on this and others, is is as we look at this evolution that we're which which has raised a whole lot of challenges that that I think have been very well laid out in this in this panel. Is there enough of a connection? in terms of people who are in the alerting community talking to people in the 911 community because it strikes me that there is there's a relationship between these two technologies they used to be entirely separate now they are starting to converge in an IP world and there may be a kind of a feedback uh, hopefully a virtuous feedback loop if you can really have alerting improved in parallel with improvements in 911 technology and and my question is more a governance question, I think, than a technology technology question is how do we ensure that as we move forward that we uh, have the right people in the room, like I think we have today, um, to make sure that the discussion that we're having about 911 also extends to alerting and the relationship between the two. Bill, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly that the technologies have merged, but I will, but I will conversely say the function has not. And in fact, 911 centers are not staffed to author that message and get that message out. Because if you are doing that, then you are taking a call taker away from that incoming message. So you have that incoming outgoing pipe that is fighting each other for resources. Um, so yes, well, I believe that, there, and I mentioned it because I think there is an opportunity to, you know, the 911 networks are, all, are choked, and they always have been um, by design. And if you could choke them, um, actually through better information going out so that you stop some of those calls coming in, there is an opportunity. But it is a natural fight between that, that staffing function, whereas 911 centers are trying to deal with what's coming in, and your EOC function is really uh, traditionally more about getting information out to the public, your EOC, your PIO function, and our community is prepared to tie those closer together. That, that, that's a great point, and what I've seen in, in several counties so far is I, I, if I ask the PSAP, do they know how they would inject an alert? No, our EOC does that. <laughs> but the EOC would take an hour to stand up or a couple hours. Uh, so, so we need to, to, to close that gap. I, you know, I agree entirely. Yeah, it's, both a, it's both a function of the staffing, but also a function, and, and it was brought up earlier, of message content. Who is controlling that message and is the do you have that person available 24 7 who's putting out the message in the correct format to get the desired result is is there a way to prevent this from being that kind of zero-sum game that you describe I <laughs> Terry it's an interesting point of view going back to the 80 percent of the PSAPs are less than five position I don't think those 80% of the PSAPs are going to go into any of them and find out that the dispatcher would be authorized to send out of a notification other than an AMBER alert, which works extremely well, but there's still due process that you have to go through. So I think it's scalable. I'm sure in your center that you've got a level of supervisory you know, staff that's in there to do it, but these 80%, you're not going to see them. They're going to go through emergency management. Now, just recently launching a reverse notification system, uh, we have looked at even sending languages. But these people can also check when they want to be notified. They don't want to be told at 2.30 in the morning that school's going to be open. They want to check a box that they can wait until 5 a.m. to do it. So I think you're, you're spot on with the proper message and who to send it out. But Amber Alert is a great example of the community, the vendor community, and the PSAPs working together. Uh, and anybody who's ever been in the area of Amber Alert, you hear it go off in your cell phone, and it works fabulous. Bob, is, is, is from a, the federal side, I mean, is there is there something that can be done proactively on the federal side to kind of help to, 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 to bridge this gap? It sounds like there's an opportunity here, but, but uh, there are some sort of knotty problems that need to be worked out if we're going to make the kind of end-to-end -end communication work a bit better. I know from the weather service perspective, um, we have 122 forecast offices around the country, and each office has what we call, has a warning coordination meteorologist. That 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 position's job is to primarily inter interact with the EOC, with with the emergency management community, and the and the media, and the outreach community within their area of responsibility. I don't know of any activity within the weather service to to communicate or to talk to the 911 centers. 
Yeah, and I just think yes. of the mixing bowl in Springfield, uh, mm -hmm. what, uh, yes. 15 years or 10 years ago. 10 years, yeah. Wouldn't that have been great if uh, uh, weather could have quickly communicated with yes. these apps? Uh, so, so, so there's a bar that we can raise here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Wade and then Richard. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd just e echo that you did. You hit a uh, – we're finding ourselves in the middle of that in the FEMA IPAWS office. Um, and perhaps uh, we created, or we didn't create it, but, but we didn't help it by initially when we rolled out iPods, our main focus on looking for who were, we termed, uh, we created the term alerting authorities. So somebody who's allowed to send an alert to a given area. Um, and at the local level and at the state level, those are divided into usually emergency management for certain types of alerts, and it's law enforcement or PSAPs, uh, or the PSAPs much more closely related to the law enforcement side for other types of alerts. Um, uh, and so w those uh, folks traditionally don't talk to each other very much, uh, or at least not, uh, <laughs> and, it, and it's not a technology problem is what we found. And so the technology facilitates that sharing to be happening much faster right now. Again, the burden falls upon taking a look at the processes and how we're doing business uh, on the authority side uh, when we're communicating to the public and, and communicating that better. I frequently find myself uh, between a local authority or even a state authority who's telling me to, to turn off the weather service alerts, uh, take them out. They shouldn't be doing that. They're making my people move, and they haven't coordinated that with me first. Um, so that, again, falls back to usually our answer is, you know, weather service has been sending alerts for 50 years. Um, why is that a problem now? And um, please call your local weather forecast officer. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Richard? People don't talk to each other, but sometimes they're actually working for the same entity, and so it's really not, for example, because of the 9-1 database aspect, we have several 9-1 entities who are involved in providing emergency notification, even the platform on the data, City of San Antonio certified for IPAW. So I think if you really spend a little time, it wouldn't be that hard to get to, to hook the right people up because they're really, some cases, really under the same organizations or working very close to them. But the people down at the dispatch level, like Terry said, that's not the person to be talking to, maybe a mayor or a councilman, but there are ways to, I think, to accomplish that. We, we are, are running a little over our allotted time, so I'm going to uh, wind it up at this point. Um, it, I was going to go around and ask everyone if they had any takeaways, and I think what I will do at this point is is not require anybody, everybody to, to speak on that point, but the, if there's anybody who has any closing uh, comments that they'd like to make, uh, we would welcome it, and uh, otherwise I would like to thank everyone for a terrific panel, a really good discussion, some very good issues put on the table. I hope some interesting and creative possibilities for follow-up. There will be an opportunity for follow-up to this panel uh, on the record uh, in, uh, uh, in written form. We'll be keeping this, this proceeding open even after this workshop is, is done. And uh, I'm looking forward to the additional panels in the afternoon that are going to follow up. Uh, I think we've given them a, a run for their money in terms of a great discussion. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone. And uh, I believe, Tim, we're now breaking for lunch. Is that right? Uh, a few cautions. Um, for those of you <laughs> unfamiliar with the area, uh, there's a cafeteria one floor above. It's on the courtyard level if you hit your elevator. Now, you can go there, but it is outside the FCC security perimeter. So you'll need an escort to go there. And once you're finished there, you'll need to come back in through the 12th Street entrance. Um, also nearby, um, there's a deli at the corner of 12th and Maryland. So if you head out the, the front entrance, take a left. There's a deli right there. There's a pot belly sandwich shop around the corner and around the corner um, on Maryland Avenue uh, near, next to the Mandarin. There's a Starbucks across from that. Um, there's also Longfond Plaza, two blocks east um, on D. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. And um, so we'd like to meet back here at 1 o'clock, and we will start promptly at 1.15. David has one more point. I, I think, Jason, did you have uh, one last comment you wanted oh, to get we in before we, before we close? <laughs> I brought copies of our National Demographic Report. Uh, for anyone who's interested, uh, it is a great uh, resource for any uh, jurisdiction that ha wants information about Asian-American 
in their community. Uh, we also have regional reports for California, uh, the South, Northeast, and Midwest. Okay, and we'll, right. we'll make sure to enter that into the okay. record as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. If I could ask everybody to take their seats, we're going to go ahead and get started. We still have a pretty full day in front of us. Um, so if you could conclude your conversations and take a seat, that would be much appreciated. I think we have all our panelists at the table. Um, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a, an enjoyable lunch and that you got a chance to step outside. Spring has slightly sprung here in Washington, so um, we're ready to go. Um, before we begin, though, I do have some housekeeping uh, things to uh, address for those who are here for the first time today um, and how they may interact with the sessions. Um, for those of you joining us here at the Commission headquarters, there are programs over by the door uh, in the back for anyone who did not get one, um, as well as a sign-in sheet. Um, we welcome your questions for the moderators and panelists. Uh, moderators will announce the opportunity for questions, and FCC staff here in the room will come over and hand you a microphone uh, so that you can ask your question. Uh, we ask that you introduce yourself and tell us if you represent a particular organization. You may also fill out one of the question cards that we have here in the room and submit that to an FCC staff member who will provide it to the moderator. Second, we are broadcasting this workshop live on the web. So for anyone joining us for the first time remotely, you can submit questions to our workshop moderators by sending an email to livequestions at FCC.gov and via Twitter by using the tech transitions hashtag. That's transitions plural. Depending on the volume of questions and time constraints, session moderators uh, will work to respond to as many questions as possible during the workshop. During and after the workshop, we want to keep the conversation going, so we will host an online discussion forum that you can access through the FCC events page at www.fcc.gov backslash events backslash technology hyphen transitions hyphen and hyphen public hyphen safety. So that's technology transitions and public safety. Um, anyone is welcome to join the dialogue and all comments uh, will become part of the official record uh, for docket number 13-5. Uh, the forum will be open for comments until the close of business on May 1st, 2014, and we look forward to your contributions. Now we are going to move to session two, which will focus on disaster preparedness and response during and after the technology transition. This session will examine the challenges that disasters, uh, that, uh, disasters and emergencies bring to an all IP-based infrastructure and to the operational procedures uh, for each stakeholder. Session participants will discuss IP-based capabilities that can assist with disaster response and life-saving activities, as well as how the transition to IP infrastructure affects restoration of communication services. Our moderator today is Eric Panketh. Chief of PSHSB's Operations and Management Division. Eric. Thanks, Tim, for leading off with the mundane so that it's easier for me to look like I'm doing a good job. Um, <laughs> again, my name is Eric Panketh. I'm the Chief of the Operations and Emergency Management Division. This thing sounds pretty loud. Um, the panel today is going to be on disaster preparedness and response. I think we had a good panel this morning led by the redoubtable David Firth. Um, it's always tough to uh, follow David Firth and then lunch. I think that um, I, I got the fuzzy end of that lollipop. But, um, you know, here we are. I thank you all for indulging me here. And uh, I think that there's a lot that we can accomplish here in this, in this two hours. Um, we may get some questions from the audience uh, and from Twitter and from email. I'll add those into uh, the questions that I sent around to the panelists uh, in advance. So you may have a few surprise questions, but uh, hopefully nothing that's going to be um, um, uh, too difficult or out of bounds. Um, just want to discuss a little bit about um, how this is going to work and why we're having a panel specifically on disaster preparedness and, and response in the context of an IP transition. I think that you know all of us would agree that communications is critical in a disaster. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Um, they're vital to response coordination um, within and across organizations. Uh, the public relies on resilient communications to reach emergency services in a time of need. Local officials also need to be able to share information with the public uh, that is vital to their safety after an incident, and sometimes overlooked. Um, we depend on communications to connect after a tragedy with loved ones, not just to let them know um, 
that we're okay or that something's wrong, but to grieve and provide comfort. And those are important things, too. We all look for communications for all of those purposes. So um, what we want to do here is brainstorm a little bit of all the innovative things that the IP transition can provide in the context of disaster response. Uh, we won't be able to get all of them, but we have, uh, uh, I think, uh, a lot of things that we uh, uh, can cover here about restoration of communications, uh, impact on mission critical communications, alerting, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of different topics. So kind of the underlying questions that will belie all, all of the uh, uh, panel discussion are, you know, what can first responders expect uh, from this transition? Uh, what can the public expect in terms of the resilience of the communications that they're used to using? How will this transition change the way we recover from disasters and emergencies? And how can IP be used to better equip us for those bad days? So I'm going to use two scenarios to sort of drive this discussion, uh, a hurricane and, and a long-term power outage. Um, the mainly reason that I chose those two scenarios was that I you could look at the effects on uh, physical effects by looking at a hurricane scenario and from a long-term power outage and whether that's caused by an ice storm or a derecho or uh, a hurricane, a solar event, cyber, whatever. A long-term power outage scenario gives us an opportunity to look at the power dependence of IP infrastructure. Um, certainly there are dozens of scenarios we could have chosen here and um, if we had the time we, and, and the coffee, we could, we could discuss all of those. But uh, I think that these two will sort of hit sort of the main things uh, uh, that uh, we want to learn about today. Um, so on the scenarios, uh, I, I want to say a few things. You know, hurricane season starts in the Atlantic on June 1st, and uh, it actually starts in the Pacific in, in May on the 15th. So um, hurricane season runs all the way through November 30th. So we've got basically half a year every year that we're looking at potential storms that could hit the coasts. Um, so this is something that we just have to make sure as we look at the IP transition, um, how does it impact our preparedness for something that we know we are likely to face every year and are on guard against for six months of the year. Um, we haven't had a, a major long-term power outage in, that goes you know, beyond a number of weeks, uh, but we have seen ice storms in, in the Midwest and we've had those power outages in the Northeast that have caused uh, uh, significant outages in communications and has created congestion uh, for people that were uh, trying to use uh, the phones. So uh, I think both of those scenarios are, are, are a good way to sort of couch this discussion. Okay, so um, sort of wanting to turn, turn over to the panel and, uh, and start asking some of the questions. Uh, given that uh, uh, we're probably not going to take the time to uh, go around the room and introduce uh, ourselves, one at a time, when, when you answer a question, just please mention your name and what organization you're from uh, so that the people that are watching this online and so everyone around the table knows um, uh, who you are and where you're from. If they can't see in the audience your name cards, uh, that, that's how we'll make sure that information gets across. We have about two hours for this panel. Um, that's plenty of time, I think. I mean, if we, we started the movie The Godfather right now, mm -hmm. um, it would be, we'd be ending this panel when Michael Corleone sitting down with Victor Salazzo for dinner. I mean, <laughs> think of all the great things that happened in that movie between then and now. So there's a lot of story we can tell today. Um, so I have, a few, I have some questions. I'll throw them open to the entire panel. I think they're, they're mostly going to be tailored towards um, certain organizations around the table. Uh, but I welcome anyone's thoughts here, and I'll keep track of who wants to weigh in. So just sort of give me the hand signal when uh, you say you want to you want to opine on that question, and, and we'll move forward from there. So, Chief, do you have anything you want to open up with? Yeah, just a um, uh, couple things. Uh, one, uh, while we've given the two scenarios there, we also in this panel want to to think about um, the the significance of all our eggs in one basket, an IP basket. It better be a pretty good basket. Uh, and that uh, much of the additional efficiency we're going to get from networks as we go forward uh, uh, and the additional functionality will come from the interconnected nature of uh, networks. So uh, you may want to go into excursions regarding things like, okay, a new Madrid fault line earthquake that separates 
every state on uh, west of the Mississippi from every state east, east of the Mississippi. There's a couple key bridges in the United States that, uh, you know, if they uh, went down, uh, the carriers know this, it would be a bad day. Um, so we do want to explore uh, uh, that uh, and, and then look at uh, uh, does that suggest a diversity we wouldn't otherwise ha have thought of. Um, and the, the last piece, just to, to introduce uh, uh, Politico uh, today, had a, um, a uh, thought-provoking article uh, that, that quoted uh, Jason Healy from the Atlantic uh, Council, uh, and the, the title was, The Internet is Poised for a Big Crash, Warn Experts. Uh, the Internet may be set up for a catastrophe on the scale of the 2008 financial collapse or worse for the same reasons. And Jason Healy says that we all went to bed April 6th thinking that we'd all done cybersecurity pretty well, but the next morning we all wake up and it turns out we're insecure because of this obscure part of the Internet, SSH, that most of us have probably never heard of. Uh, and frankly, a function that's 10 years old and has had lots of eyeballs looking at it. So uh, uh, think in terms of, uh, okay, this is one protocol, uh, but that one protocol ain't perfect. Uh, how do we organize ourselves in the future uh, so that we're uh, resilient uh, in the face of disasters that would stress the network? Um, the last piece is uh, capacity. Um, in the earlier session, we uh, uh, talked about the bad things happen on a good day. Uh, in, in this session, we definitely want to talk about, hey, these systems are going to be overwhelmed. A small earthquake, I'm from Los Angeles, so a small earthquake on the East Coast was the one that we had uh, uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, I couldn't get a cell phone call through for, for two or three hours, and, and it was my job up at DISA to, <laughs> to be able to make calls like that and organize the, the, the response. Um, and our old um, WPS and GETS mechanisms in a switch world uh, uh, aren't designed for an everything over IP world. So uh, please also uh, uh, think about, let's explore in this session, uh, what we do when the resources we need to communicate aren't there. Have we thought about load shedding? Uh, and do we need more organization around how that would done, uh, that would be done? Um, in the, in the follow-on session of this, uh, we'll look more closely at cyber impacts uh, and uh, in that interconnected world of things, we'll want to talk about organizing to dampen attacks so attacks don't have nationwide consequence. You know, are we organizing ourselves so that while we've got this connected world, interconnected world across the country, uh, we have the ability to um, uh, segment uh, uh, risk where possible in the future. So, thanks. So um, I want to lead off a little bit uh, with some details about what a hurricane scenario would look like. Obviously, we're all pretty familiar with that in, in the last few years. But uh, just to sort of set the context here, um, in a major hurricane where you might have significant coastal flooding, there would be impacts to infrastructure in that way. Could have wind speeds that could wreak havoc on suspended cables, fire, fiber, and power lines. Um, debris could make some roads impassable, so you'd end up with uh, issues of restoration. Uh, you could have power outages for a significant amount of time, uh, depending on um, whether you had uh, hanging power lines. Uh, cell side outages, when you talk about the average time for battery backup or generators, uh, that uh, you would have cell sites go out if they lose uh, power or transport. And uh, in this situation, you might have first responders who need to get information to the public about finding water, food, medical supplies, uh, things of that nature. So we're all sort of familiar with that. I, I, I just wanted to provide that sort of as the overview because one of the first the first series of questions I wanted to ask sort of involved restoration um, uh, from a kinetic sort of attack or um, disaster. So, um, so the first thing I was going to ask is, so as a telephone system is transitioned to IP infrastructure, there will be different types of equipment in the network than we've had in the past. Um, are these types of equipment more susceptible to um, you know, kinetic events or flooding or damage caused by a hurricane? Are they less? Is it the same? I just want to sort of get a gauge from a restoration perspective as we shift from, you know, legacy infrastructure to IP, 
what are the potential impacts? AT&T, Mike. Uh, this is Mike Ernst with AT&T. Um, uh, I, um, AT&T does lots of things uh, in the uh, business of, tele of communications. Uh, we're a local service provider, a wireless provider, a VoIP provider. Uh, I come from AT&T, the side that deals with public safety, 911, and provides solutions to uh, customers. Um, uh, question, are, are, are the the equipment we use, is it more susceptible? Well, um, routers and servers and um, switches don't like to get wet, you know, uh, and uh, that's just a fact of physics mm -hmm. because of, uh, water and electricity don't mix very well. So what do we do about that? Uh, in the context of next generation 911, in the context of where we're heading as an industry, we understand that there are points of failure and so how do you mitigate points of failure? You mitigate points of failure in an IP environment through geography, uh, geo-redundancy. And that's the fundamental, fundamental uh, way to mitigate these types of issues. Um, in the legacy environment, we have elements that are redundant, but they're locally redundant. In the IP world, our plans and implementations are geo-redundancy. So you not only have the local redundancy, but you have another layer of redundancy that provides for a, a geographic type uh, redundancy. And, and we expect that will go a very long way. Now, if, if the geography impacted is the entire United States, then we've got additional challenges. But uh, in implementations we've done with customers, you know, we, we look at uh, hurricane zones, for example, and s say, well, if we're going to put something in uh, – uh, near the coast, then we probably ought to put another something near the mountains. And, and so th that's how we fundamentally mitigate uh, in, in the IP world. Not only do you tend to have multiple paths through the network, but you also have multiple nodes in the network that are um, uh, geo-redundant in nature. So, so I'd like to follow up on that because huh? I think that's an important element of diversity as we look forward, not just to look at diversity as a geographic thing, but to look at it through the eyes of failure modalities and uh, have a, a disaster of diversity. When I worked with providers uh, in the DOD and they put some of their backup uh, equipment in Miami, like, what? Miami? Come on, you're kidding me. It's, it's in the hurricane zone. They said, yeah, but we don't have hurricanes the same times we have earthquakes in, in California. And uh, so uh, that kind of a deployment uh, works well or is, is achievable by the really large carriers. Um, it, it, it would be interesting to hear from some of the smaller carriers how uh, you and if uh, your diversity plans uh, need, need to be different to account for the same kinds of things. Tony. <clears throat> Hello, my name's Tony Bardo. Uh, I'm with Hughes Network Systems. And uh, you might have figured that a question on diversity would uh, be answered in part by somebody like me from somebody like Hughes. Um, we've built just some terrific uh, capabilities in, in uh, um, network communications, terrestrial network communications over the years. And, uh, and I serve the uh, federal and state and local governments. And, uh, I run that group for Hughes. What we're seeing a lot of is where, particularly in the federal government, I run into agencies that – um, and Kevin and I were having this conversation uh, earlier, that where the agencies will, will select, and, and particularly to the point you made earlier, David, um, two carriers um, for, um, for the purposes of achieving re redundancy and diversity and, and resiliency. And uh, I've, I've had conversations with a lot of these agencies. One, uh, one woman is the head of telecom for a fairly major uh, cabinet agency and said she can't consider satellite because of the uh, of the latency. And I, I asked her what her latency was during Katrina and she changed the subject. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the answer really there and, and I think tantamount to, to this discussion of diversity is path diversity. Right? Not to say that satellite industry or satellite communications can take over everything but I think work complementary to the terrestrial networks that people build, agencies build, commercial entities build. And I dare say the commercial entities are far ahead of, of government in building and taking that approach because cash register still has to ring, they still want to stay open, and they have that 
intent to to have an alternate path in the case that their treasure infrastructure goes down our satellites are twenty two thousand miles away they have never been flooded so when you talk about the question of 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 equipment certainly the equipment's important and where that equipment is we maintain a knock in north las vegas very dry nice and dry one here in 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 germantown maryland but we have the kind of capabilities in our satellites one of the satellites in particular is a router in the sky okay and that hasn't ever been affected by these land events and particularly that satellite could operate and continue to route um, IP transmission even if Germantown were wiped out. It'd be hard to make some changes but that, that capability is still there because it's an intelligent router in the sky. Tony, so, so path diversity uh, had value pre-IP, right? I, even in a TDM and PS10 world, uh, uh, path diversity uh, uh, was important. Um, is uh, logical diversity uh, a more important factor as we go forward. And I would just remind the group that in 1992, we had a major um, convergence around a single protocol called SS7. Uh, and that protocol um, became vulnerable, uh, uh, actually because of a regular maintenance to the code uh, issue and widespread days long outages uh, uh, associated with that single protocol uh, being impacted all at once. Uh, so uh, as IP comes to space, uh, whether it be through the switch on orbit that is now an IP switch, or whether it be the interconnect of the ground stations that uh, relies on IP, um, do we need to think about uh, a, a better degree of diversity uh, on the logical protocol side as well? And, and I, 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 I just I threw that to the entire group. Ken? So I was going to mention, uh, Mike was mentioning about the uh, geodiversity and uh, route diversity, getting, getting diff different fibers. Uh, there's also a need to be able to have uh, the ability to, to compensate and, and, and deal with multiple failures in a network in a, in a very uh, reliable and secure way. Um, there's a need to support legacy TDM technologies um, in, during this evolution and transmission uh, transition period. Um, also essential is prioritization, uh, being able to distinguish between traffics from, from different uh, agencies and, and different needs. And when you do enter a world where you have compromised bandwidth, making sure that the mission critical services absolutely uh, get through. Um, the use of multiple technologies, whether it be wireless, uh, microwave, uh, satellite, uh, optics, uh, twisted pair, uh, anything and everything uh, at your disposal, you need to be able to use uh, in a controllable and, and, and secure manner. Uh, the use of virtual networks to be able to uh, provide uh, uh, closed user groups and, and communities to communicate that's uh, essential to first response, also essential to making use of an of, of a, a internet, a internet world. Um, uh, Admiral Simpson mentioned uh, uh, MPLS technology. Uh, MPLS is a technology on top of IP that basically enables all of that uh, functionality. Um, it's used by all the carriers uh, to make that happen. Also, public safety agencies use that to provide that type of resilience uh, in their networks. They find statewide networks that are built uh, for land mobile radio backhaul that are also carrying uh, ESI net traffic, uh, traffic for hospitals and, and such. Uh, and MPLS is a, the, the key building block to, to make, make, uh, make that happen. Uh, and it's supporting also legacy technologies, uh, so uh, down from uh, frame relay to uh, uh, other, other technologies, uh, technology agnostic uh, transport. Um, uh, so. Yeah, so there's great power in MPLS, uh, uh, but I'd suggest that we have not realized the resiliency we need from it uh, carrier to carrier, uh, that the quality of service schemas uh, typically today uh, are exercised uh, within a single carrier uh, and, and don't translate end-to-end -end, um, uh, for uh, functions that really need to have a prioritization of the traffic when the resources are stressed around a large region you know, and or the, the entire nation. That, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, um, and 
in, in a, for example, a statewide network scenario, if you're talking about a LAMA radio network that's also used for, for public safety, uh, there you have the ability to control uh, redundancy. Uh, you have uh, different alternatives to provide connectivity, as commercial carriers as, as well as uh, private private networks. You mentioned t- uh, TDM needs to be supported during the transition. Uh, some of the um, options I've seen from the carriers that are working through, uh, responsibly working through uh, their transition plans have TDM supported uh, over IP. Um, is that a, uh, a sufficient uh, a transitory step or does pure TDM need to be supported through, throughout the, uh, the, 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 the period of the transition? Uh, so uh, TDM is, is typically supported to the edge of the network, and once you hit the edge of the network from, from that point, it, it's all packet. Uh, it, it's not just IP. Uh, I, IP in and of itself doesn't necessarily provide the resilience and also the, the, uh, the guaranteed arrival that, that you need for, for TDM services. Okay, so, so I'm hearing TDM on top of IP has some challenges. So, so TDM over IP is a solved problem today as long as you're using... IPLS on top of that to guarantee the delivery of traffic. So if, if you look at what's happening in the carrier world today, basically they're using IPMPLS to provide that, that guaranteed reliable delivery of uh, IP packets in a, in a, when you're carrying TDM traffic. Same thing is being used for public safety agencies that are using uh, IP to carry backhaul to their land mobile radio. Uh, land mobile radio towers today are, are largely uh, circuit circuit switched, um, so we we'll provide circuit switch uh, to a router. But from that from that router, that that's also uh, re- redundant and has path redundancy. It's it's all IP over MPLS from that point over multiple paths. Should a path fail within 50 milliseconds, it's tripped up just like a, a sonnet like res- response and and, and 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 carried. So from, from a 911 standpoint, th- there's a couple of key enabling technologies here that, that are either already in place now or that are coming online over the relatively near future. Um, I, I think uh, Kent brought up the, the uh, uh, one of the core ones, which, which is the ability to use multiple links uh, either in a failover arrangement or what we're seeing increasingly is all at the same time. It's now possible to create uh, a, a virtual... Uh, network link that actually spans multiple carriers. So uh, at our offices in Alexandria, for example, we have one TDM circuit, one cable modem, uh, one uh, DSL connection, and a cellular connection that all go into the same box. And uh, it can actually uh, send traffic over all those links simultaneously, and they'll arrive at our other endpoint uh, simultaneously uh, in order. Um, and, and if any one link fails, that's completely transparent to the uh, to the system. Um, As we see uh, companies uh, deploying uh, particularly hosted NG911 solutions, those types of connectivity options for PSAPs um, are increasingly uh, available and increasingly popular. They also have the benefit of uh, when you aggregate uh, lower cost, uh, theoretically lower uh, reliability links, you can actually generate a very high reliability link at a much lower uh, cost than you can in a traditional TDM environment. Uh, where you literally have to lay new cables to get to get new diversity. The other advantage is um, for for 911 in traditional TDM networks, it is a hardwired service. We have one or at best two uh, uh, route connections uh, directly to our uh, serving central offices, um, and and then uh, the ability to move things, reconfigure things uh, in the event of kinetic damage is is very difficult because of that. In an IP world, it gets a lot easier. Uh, because the protocol is inherently route unconscious in a sense. In other words, it, it just it, it's a, okay if I can't get to the hop that I want to get to. What what's what else is available? I'll go there and then see what's available from there until I can find a route around it. Um, the other thing that I think we see coming down the pipe um, that is also an enabling technology is network coding. Um, the ability to use uh, lossy links. Uh, um, in a disaster scenario where you can send traffic over a, um, a modified version of uh, TCP um, and uh, have that reliably get there without a lot of retransmissions. Uh, that's very powerful uh, satellite realm, mobile realm, uh, for enabling things like virtual and mobile PSAPs. Uh, so that, that's a, another key enabling technology. All of that you, you can't really do over, over TDM, at least not by itself. 
So, Trey, those are uh, great points. Um, I'm mindful from the last session that PSAPs have fixed budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, diversity uh, to the PSAP operator is robustness, it's resiliency, it's all the, 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 the great things that one would uh, expect from that uh, R word, uh, uh, or the D word. Uh, diversity from a uh, chief financial officer <laughs> is quite often uh, a re investment that doesn't have a powerful enough return uh, to warrant the investment. Um, so uh, one of my biggest fears is that as we go forward that uh, we'll, that communities will be driven by uh, using the wonderful advantage of the new technologies uh, to uh, shave costs mm -hmm. uh, from their uh, connectivity uh, at a point where they don't really regret it until the, the <laughs> Katrina example where, where how, how's your latency now? <laughs> um, so I, I, I think one of the things that we could do uh, in, in the next couple of months is to really pull together uh, 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 tools for peace apps and communities to use to better understand what degree of <laughs> diversity and what kinds of diversity are really appropriate in an all-IP world. Jeff and Dorothy. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I'm Jeff Wittick from Cassidian Communications. We provide uh, many of the call center solutions <laughs> that are in use, uh, the 911 systems as well as emergency notification in addition, land mobile radio. And one of the um, techniques that we see being used very often today as we roll out next generation 911 is elements that were in the PSAP, call processing elements or call center elements, are moving into the network. And they're doing so in such a way that those elements, which are relatively expensive, can be shared. They can be hosted in the network and then shared between multiple constituents. That helps lower the cost to individual constituents while at the same time allowing a greater degree of diversity and redundancy which can then be shared and um, it ultimately provides a higher level of service because the agencies that share that virtual piece, as Terry Hall said in the earlier uh, panel, it's a virtual consolidation environment. That virtual consolidation environment also promotes collaboration because there's interoperability between all of the agencies that are on that shared regional or even shared statewide solution. All of the customers that we're dealing with today, whether it's an RFP or not, or one of our AT&T customers, or any one of the other LEX, is that when we speak with these customers, we talk about what's the optimal architecture for them. What level of redundancy do they need? What level of diversity do they need? How much do they want to interoperate and collaborate with the other PSAPs in their region? And then we def we uh, design a total solution, not just the network, but the network and the call processing solution to give them all of that at a price that they can afford. And that, that's very helpful. It, it would have been hard, though, for me to imagine five years ago a failure in computer-aided dispatch uh, in Washington State that would have impacted more than one county. Yet last week, the entire state of Washington was down for 911 for an extended period of time. So how, how do we uh, ensure that as we're looking forward in, in getting those great advantages, the great functionality from the uh, uh, cloud-hosted um, uh, call processing, uh, that we uh, are, are able to uh, establish a threshold that says, uh, you know, it, it's, it's resilient enough for the, the range of uh, failures that um, might, might address, might, might hit that uh, particular uh, uh, node so that we're, and those range of failures being more than just physical failures, you know, so that, that maybe we've got a different uh, uh, version that is uh, uh, updated uh, on a schedule that's very different in that part of the cloud than that part of the cloud and uh, if one goes down, the, you know, the, the other uh, w w will 
still because of a malware issue, the other will continue to, you know, keep ticking. Right now, I'm not aware that we've really organized any kind of a logical diversity standard. Dorothy, then Brian, then Michael, then Barry. Thank you. Trey mentioned earlier multiple links for mission-critical services. That's absolutely critical. But from the PSAP perspective, redundancy is also very, very critical. Admiral Simpson, you mentioned tools for the PSAP. Geo-redundancy really needs to be considered when planning construction of PSAPs in the future. And the best example that I can give is Katrina. Thirty-eight PSAPs went down in that region. Now, from a planning perspective, looking at it from a TDM environment, you probably were trying to roll over to your neighbors. That makes sense in a TDM environment. However, IP gives you the capability of taking geo-redundancy to a completely different level. And it's something that we really do have to consider. From a service perspective, absolutely, but also from a cost savings perspective. We really haven't been able to chip away at the cost of physically associated with physical construction with um, with PSAPs um, as we can in an IP world because you can move that geo-redundant PSAP further and further away from the anticipated um, disaster. Um, you may be able to move it to another state if need be. So it certainly gives you a, uh, a different uh, tool in terms of planning as, as well as looking at it from uh, preserving mission critical services because it's, you have a concentration of mission critical services within the PSAP that you need to maintain. Um, so, so I just wanted to pick up um, actually a theme that I think was touched on earlier. Uh, I think Henning uh, and, and we, we certainly touched on this in the, in the this morning's panel. Uh, we are operating in a much more diverse environment, and when it comes to resiliency and reliability, that is a good thing. Um, when we're talking about multiple different technologies and, and multiple paths. I think we just need to be mindful of the the operational impact that that has on peace apps, for example. And you know, I know that we see in in today's environment, and I'm on the Maryland 911 board. Uh, and Bill, we heard from Bill earlier this morning. There are outages that occur where uh, for peace app uh, peace staff and the call takers to have to track down, you know, where where that failure lies. Uh, that's taking away from their their primary responsibility, and so that's not a um, an inhibitor, but it's a, a factor that we need to be mindful of. Um, and then, with regard to uh, carriers, I, I agree with with what Michael said in terms of uh, the redundancy and the geo diversity. Um, when it comes to uh, wireless carriers, you're seeing that not just from tier one carriers, but you are seeing it, you know, down to tier three carriers, tier two carriers. Um, the, the technology being deployed uh, is, is um, you know, the IP technology is, is focusing in on those, you know, smart architecture issues, uh, the uh, diversity, redundancy capabilities. So you do have that from, from smaller uh, carriers as well, and I know that's something that folks are mindful of. I think uh, this conversation is helpful, but let's also not lose sight of the fact that IP doesn't, you know, uh, magically inoculate us from some of the core physical infrastructure uh, issues. Uh, we have, you know, limited spectrum. Uh, we have, um, you, know, uh, you know, physical um, issues that uh, we account for in terms of in hurricane-prone and flooding-prone areas. Uh, we take steps to uh, raise cell sites so that they don't get flooded. Uh, there's hardening of towers, et cetera. And that happens day in, day out. Uh, there are certainly uh, have been steps uh, that have been taken that are continually taken uh, and lessons learned from, from various events, uh, but, you know, we, we certainly should be mindful of that in an IP environment as well. Brian, <laughs> after uh, wide-scale disasters, one of the first things we do uh, collectively is assess what communications resources have survived the, the disaster uh, and then organize not only a restoral plan, but uh, potentially a sharing plan for that r remaining uh, I infrastructure. After Katrina, uh, I'm told, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think Eric knows better, it, it took uh, weeks to organize 
roaming agreements between the surviving wireless carriers after the industry took it on and got much better. And after Sandy, within days, there were effective roaming agreements so that the surviving cellular towers could back each other up. Should we, could we, as we look forward, bring that down to hours to minutes where we have pre-organized those kinds of sharing agreements, not just between cellular but also the other surviving infrastructure so that we can not only make that available but also marry that up with load shedding so that we truly can get the most important messages through with whatever infrastructure is remaining? Well, and that's a great point. I think in Katrina, during Katrina, you actually saw the home and home roaming agreements implemented. So that was not necessarily an after the fact. But, you know, and a lot of times that is pre-arranged, pre-negotiated for, you know, just those very opportunity, those incidents. Can we, you know, do better and be mindful, you know, for various contingencies that perhaps weren't anticipated? Absolutely. And I think, you know, those discussions are taking place, you know, among at least the wireless carriers. But we are also seeing, you know, some of that load shedding in the Wi-Fi context as well. And, you know, those are, I think, important issues. I know that that's been touched on in the CISRIC, but a good goal to have in terms of ensuring greater connectivity in those incidents. I know one of the scenarios is long-term power outages, but certainly we've seen that in, you know, some of the hurricane scenarios. And, you know, credentialing to ensure that the fuel suppliers who are pre-contracted, pre-negotiated, and generators on the trailer and the fuel trucks that are in staging areas ready to go in and keep those cell sites up and running, they need to be able to get to those cell sites. And that also happens in the sharing arrangements as well, where those who have the sharing going on can utilize those generators and the backup power sources. Michael? This is Mike Ernst. One of the – I'm not exactly sure how to put this, but it touches Jeff's comment, and Dorothy, I think you would probably resonate with this. As we plan toward these next-generation networks, the key word is plan, because the challenge we face is that if you have an IP technology in place, it just doesn't do all this stuff by magic. It has the potential, but if we have PSAP communities that are not planning together or thinking about disaster recovery together, then it's – you could end up with islands of – you could end up with pockets of capabilities, but no way to bridge across those pockets. And I think, you know, Jeff's comments about the hosted – the hosted – what we call hosted call handling, we are definitely seeing a trend for where customers and PSAPs that five years ago were very independent of each other now understand that it's better to be a consortium, some – whatever you – whatever phrase you want to use, a buying partnership or whatever. And those are the – that's the kind of thinking that we like doing with, you know, our PSAP communities so we can think about putting in resiliency, not just at the physical location, but – and not necessarily your partner across the street, but what about your partner across the state? And how can we do that? And then, of course, IP technology says, what about state partnerships? So, I mean, there's a lot that can be done, but it requires an awful lot of planning. So, the Barry, Rosa, Joel, Kevin. Hike. Barry Luke with the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council. Recently retired from Orange County, Florida, Fire Rescue as a deputy chief there. Two quick operational 
uh, concerns for someone who used to run a, a large PSEP in Central Florida. Uh, the first two of them are uh, demarcation and accountability. As, as we talk about this, this IP network and we talk about all these services, uh, we end up with a lot of finger pointing when you call vendor A and say it's not working and they say it's not my problem. So uh, we've had a lot of good conversation about uh, different systems and different solutions and we need to keep a, an eye on how do we make that really manageable uh, from the context of three o'clock in the morning when you've got three people on duty in the PSAP and they're and they're getting calls. So not just physical DMARC, but we need an accountability DMARC. Yes, definitely. definitely. In, in this virtual world. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the other one is as as we've talked about uh, the flooding and the hurricanes, uh, as, as a responder to Hurricane Andrew uh, in 1992, um, we should make sure that we don't anticipate a total vision of the future that involves wireless communications. And, and I can recall uh, in Hurricane Andrew going into neighborhoods that were totally flattened, but those copper lines were ringing all of those home phones, and all those phones stayed up. So as we talk about the need for uh, keeping the network up, we also need to be mindful of how do we keep service and dial tone up in Mrs. Jones' house, okay? Because, uh, and I know, you, uh, Eric, you have a question later about power, but I couldn't resist. Um, yeah. So uh, as, as it, having the network up doesn't help us if, if, all, if all these people have VoIP phones or have other types of phones and there's no power, there's no ability for them to get dial tone. Some of that is a public relations uh, issue that is incumbent upon the local authority to make sure that their community understands uh, how to place an emergency call without power. Um, but let's be mindful of the fact uh, as, as, as we take copper away and as we transition, we need to make sure we don't disenfranchise those people who don't have a wireless device and need to call for help. Thank you. Rosa. I'm with the Hispanic Technology Intercommunications Partnership. Um, this conversation is very, very important. Thank you for having me here. I think we're focusing on the networks and making sure that they're going to be safe and reliable, and that's absolutely the most important thing. But we also have to make sure that the communities are well informed. I know, for example, the Latino community, some many people in the Latino community are going to need this information to be provided in Spanish. Otherwise, a lot of people are going to be left out if they don't get this information. In case, as you mentioned, in case of a power outage, people are going to need to know that with this new system, they're going to need a backup battery. And some of the questions they're going to have is, where do I get this battery? How, do, how does this battery work? Are the instructions in Spanish? If the battery doesn't work, where do I where do I find another one? Who do I talk to? How long does the battery last? They're going to need to have all these questions answered. So it's equally as important for the community to be well informed as well as for the networks to be safe and reliable. So that's very, very important. And that ties to a comment that we got this morning from the Asian community uh, uh, where there are, are families and communities that are really linguistically isolated. Right. It's, it's just a reality. And uh, we need to be ready to support those communities uh, in, in, and should raise the bar on ourselves given the additional promises of IP. Exactly. Joel? Uh, I'm Joel Margolis with Substencio Inc. Uh, Substencio helps service providers comply with their CALEA lawful surveillance obligations. So we come at this issue from a somewhat different point of view. But one thing we know from experience, whenever there's a natural disaster of any kind, it creates wonderful opportunities for criminals. And what that means is it becomes critically important for service providers to have their CALEA lawful surveillance solutions installed, working properly in their networks, because chances are pretty good that law enforcement will come to you with a court order and say, we need to do an intercept on this end user of your network right now. And if it doesn't work properly, meaning in a packet world, if just a few packets are lost or dropped or corrupted, uh, that can take an intercepted communication that was crystal clear, a good picture of what the suspect is doing, and turn it into something that looks more like a Jackson Pollock painting. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could completely ruin the investigation. And uh, just setting up the VPN connectivity between the service provider's network and the law enforcement monitoring point, that takes time and expertise of engineers. So, and minutes count, uh, especially when there's criminal activity, because if the order doesn't go up in time, if it's not provisioned, if no one can hear what the suspects are doing for even a brief period of time, well, they can commit whatever act they're going to commit and then be long gone, which renders law enforcement helpless to help uh, society. Kevin 
uh, Kevin Bro with uh, Bandwidth. Uh, Bandwidth is a communications provider. We are a nationwide CLEC providing 911 services to carriers as well as uh, participating in Next Generation. Uh, I did want to just to echo a couple of the other comments <coughs> that were made across the table and talking about Katrina. One of the things all the way back then, you know, almost 10 years from Katrina, was that uh, in the commercial environment, I did support some carriers that had uh, IP communication, hosted communications back then, and they were up during Katrina. Uh, they weren't re totally reliant on TDM architectures back then. And so just looking at where we're at today versus we were 10 years ago, 10 years ago, IP communications was shown the way to having better uptime and some different options for us to consider. Um, Another thing, going back to what Jeff said and thinking about shared resources and going into that uh, model <clears throat> and then talking about supporting TDM technologies as well as IP technologies, by going to uh, a shared services model, I, I didn't uh, come up with that. I'll give an industry peer credit for shared services versus consolidation, since consolidation sometimes has a four-letter word uh, connotation. But it's the deployment is faster. So for uh, people around this room and us deploying and participating, the deployment of next generation capabilities is a much faster rate when we do look at shared services model. And you're looking at probably saving and increasing your deployment by you know uh, a five-fold increase in time in order to move to that model. That way we get to the area of supporting just one technology, IP technology versus TDM only technology. So it does increase the speed. Um, the other one, the last point I did want to make as far as uh, looking at the incidents that have occurred lately, like Washington State, things like that, is that even though there are issues with TDM technology and we can learn a lot from it, it is something that evolved over years, it's something that's been around for many, many, many decades. IP communications is obviously still evolving, but if we don't learn from the lessons, we won't be able to get to the point where we want to go. So it's very important for us to understand that while it's still evolving, we don't want to get scared away. So knowledge is power. Uh, it's a superhero thing. Great power comes great responsibility. So it's definitely important to know that we exchange TDM responsibilities for IP, so we're still going to be dealing with challenges. Uh, we're just trying to get rid of the legacy TDM and move to IP-based ones. Thank you. Great points. Uh, and I think the, the concern that I, I haven't met anyone yet that is uh, not wanting to move into a, a, an IP realm, it's the scale uh, of impact of failures that, that concerns folks that um, – uh, when it's when it's great, it's great. When it's not, <laughs> right. it's it, it's not over a large area. Uh, so that, that that's the concern that we we plan for that that period of time so that before where we could manage our risk uh, uh, really uh, downstream of a of a wire center and a um, a, a piece app uh, and say well yeah that's where the risk is uh, that that now we're looking at risks that spans. Uh, hey, w wait a minute. Yeah, supporting Washington, but there's an element of this that has to be up in Colorado, and another element that's got to be up in Miami. Uh, and if I'm not connected to one of those two, hey, uh, no worky. Right. Uh, th 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 that's the, f the piece of this that we, I think, need to get ahead of, or we're trying to get ahead of with this. Yeah. I, I would just like to respond to uh, something the Admiral said. It, when we talk about shared services, there are different philosophies. One philosophy of shared service would say that that shared service is delivered from central locations throughout the United States, and you, you mentioned a couple of them. Another philosophy, though, that many of the states are using is that the shared service would be inside of the state itself. Like, for instance, the state of Maine. Their, their ESI net is served from data centers within the state of Maine. And to your point, Admiral, without a doubt, it still has a, a great potential impact because all of the PSAPs are served from it. However, you, they still maintain some local degree. Another advantage, if I may, of shared service, however, is there's also a much greater potential for service restoration. In a shared environment, uh, that that the two data centers, or however many there may be, can be surveilled. You can provide maintenance, monitoring, and even remote support. 
And that remote support in today's IP or next generation world is greater than it ever was in the in the legacy 911 environment. Yeah, those are great points. And, and I'd offer, uh, as I, I used to in, in DOD, have, have the, the kind of um, outlook you described where, uh, yeah, let's just make sure everything that Maine needs is in Maine uh, until I met Vint Cerf. Uh, and Vint uh, explained to me how the uh, uh, Google Notes work because I've been all around the world, uh, operated networks in some pretty austere environments, and I was routinely amazed at how I could get to Google. Uh, and uh, they have a, a slightly different philosophy, which says let's not ever put any single element of data in one uh, node. Uh, and they intentionally shard it up, cut it up into to small pieces, and put that uh, three or four or five times uh, uh, in the fabric of their network. So the failure of any two or three uh, edge nodes um, would never uh, take them down. Uh, because they have the ability to to uh, reassemble from the surviving fabric, so I I um, uh, echo your point, but would suggest that we that the right answer may not be <coughs> states themselves saying I'm taking care of me, uh, but a more of a fabric oriented approach to this. Mike, then I want to switch to a, a different topic. Yeah. Th this comment is going to be uh, a, sort of one uh, level above the IP layer, and and, and it gets at um, one of the and this is a challenge. This isn't a, a solution. This is a challenge we face as we move to IP. We um, the application layer software that rides on top of this very robust and resilient IP network that has all sorts of capabilities to serve all sorts of people uh, could break. And and if the application software breaks, then it breaks. And so the, ch the challenge is um, not only not only having a robust network, but having the ability to um, thoroughly exercise and, and through load testing, through, you know, pull the plug and see what happens over here kind of testing, lots of, lots of um, on-the-ground kind of testing capabilities. And, and I think that's an area where, where uh, this technology still is at in its early days. Uh, the TDM world took a long time to get to that, you know, rock solid level of, of reliability. This technology uh, is going to take a while, and, and it's taking a while in the context of a very robust competitive environment, a very robust, we don't want one person in charge anymore, we want we want to put 50 things together and have it look like, you know, a solid blue shirt, right? And, and, and um, you know. Uh, with only one person to call. With one person to call, one throat to choke. And, and uh, so those are some of the challenges we face. It's not just an IP networking infrastructure layer. There's a whole application, application services layer on top of it. And that's probably where I think we face some of the more uh, difficult challenges, especially in the context of a multi-supplier uh, um, evolving standards environment. Thank you. Um, topic I wanted to move to, and uh, uh, one of the panelists had mentioned earlier about prioritization um, uh, of key traffic. Um, you know, we have the DHS administers uh, a number of priority services that serve the first responder community, the national security community. Um, the telecommunication service priority uh, program is one of those that's uh, authorized by FCC rules that DHS administers in terms of uh, setting, a, setting the uh, prioritization of uh, circuit restoration and also provisioning. Uh, we have the government emergency telecommunication system and the wireless priority system that provide for uh, priority services for voice uh, on both landline and wireless. And so I wanted to ask uh, Ron at DHS uh, about the value of those programs in the NSEP community and uh, some of your uh, thoughts on the IP transition relative to those programs. Thanks, Eric. And uh, as Admiral Simpson alluded to in his uh, opening comments, the uh, federal government is a major consumer of commercial telecommunications services, and they're critical for the mission essential functions that 
uh, we perform, but also the nation relies on it for the critical infrastructure and key resources uh, to keep, keep those systems up and running. And so with that, uh, DHS is responsible for the, uh, uh, through the national response framework, the, uh, the restoration of communication services. So with that, uh, we rely on the FCC, uh, like say for instance when a hurricane does come in, we actually, that one's actually fairly predictable so we can look and see what counties are there and then uh, we put those and there's actually reporting in from major carriers through the disaster information reporting system. That comes into our uh, National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center and we can look and, and, and then we have prioritization on restoration to ensure there's a minimal impact to the nation's uh, safety, security and economic uh, impact to that in terms of restoring. And so we have to be able to prioritize and we still would need to do that in an IP environment in terms of doing that. Now, when I look at it, now it's primarily reporting physical damage from a hurricane or whatever. In the future, is there going to be cyber damage? Is there going to be a denial of service, which actually takes that? So that reporting, we have to look at how is the impact in an IP world, because now there's a whole other vulnerability out there that, that could impact. But then in terms of ensuring that the, the uh, the boots on the ground that are out there actually doing the restoration have the capability, as Admiral Simpson alluded to, during the earthquake, those with a uh, GETS or WPS, primarily WPS on uh, the CDMM, CDM networks, CDMA uh, networks didn't work, and that was primarily because the, the technology we were using relied on SMS. Well, guess what's uh, grown over a trillion percent in the last 10 years. It's in, in, I can tell from my son because the only way I can talk to him is through an SMS <laughs> message. But, but unfortunately, we use that same technology for, uh, for control channel for uh, priority services. We've actually now changed that. We've done an a, a, a emergency uh, uh, change to that system, and now, it, now if there's an earthquake, you'll be able to use it, so, and it'll work good. But, it, but it's critical because, uh, in fact, if you... Uh, Recollect just uh, last year up in Boston, there was actually rumors that we shut down the uh, the wireless network because of the fear of uh, of uh, radio controlled uh, IED devices. Well, that wasn't the case. It was just congestion. So if you're out there and you're trying to do emergency services, and not everybody uses land mobile radio, some of them actually have to use the commercial infrastructure. It's critical your call gets through to be able to to bring up whatever whatever you're working on. And so that's. That's the uh, wireless uh, priority services protocol. We still would need to be able to do that in an IP world, and we're working on that. So to be able to, to do it, the other thing we're finding out is IP actually opens up the number of permutations for technology solutions. In, in, the, in the circuit switch world, there's only about five or six switches we had to work with to get the software patches and we'd work with the actual vendor, GenBand or whoever, and actually work to get the priority services uh, software patches in there. In the future, now, uh, you know, if you look at LTE, there's actually about 10 different virtual pieces to, to an LTE. You've got the MM, you know, I don't want to get into a technical dissertation, but I can, you know, every one of those interfaces have to be worked out. So, and, and normally, from you know, like an AT&T, you don't put all your money into one uh, into uh, Nokia or or to uh, Samsung or for your eNode Bs, you 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 split those out. So we're finding it's very difficult in the IP world to work with all the different vendors moving forward. So those those are really the issues we're trying to to work with. We still need to be able to keep priority services to ensure the minimum impact to the nation on an economic safety and security perspective, but. Uh, but the, also the uh, diversity of vendors we have to now work with is making it extremely difficult. Admiral, uh, is there a, a, a midterm challenge for the federal government in the transition uh, from TDM to all IP that touches upon what Michael brought up, which is hey, applications are, are really important to consider here? Uh, I know that uh, DOD and I suspect DHS and, and much of the rest of the, the federal and state governments have over the last couple of years made great progress in consolidating and shutting down data centers. Um, 
one of the things that has allowed that is a steady, reliable uh, connection with uh, uh, relatively guaranteed levels of performance. And in many cases, that's a TDM connection, uh, a, a circuit-based co connection right uh, to those data centers. Uh, is there some plumbing that we've got to do uh, to ensure that in getting to everything over IP, where we're shutting down the wire centers, um, that we've accounted for those uh, uh, special users in government that have uh, uh, unwieldy applications that are sensitive to changing those connections? On that, there's actually a twofold answer. That just makes the priority restoration process capabilities that we have now, we have certain circuits that we have to, because there is now less diversity from the information perspective, unfortunately not everybody's using the Google model as you, you alluded to, that makes those uh, extremely uh, important that we do and, and we've gotten very good response from the carriers on that. But the area that's becoming a little more difficult for us to map out is as you go to the cloud, you don't even know where your critical uh, connections are. So that, that whole aspect, going to the cloud, is a great thing. It diversifies, but at the same time, it makes it harder for us to actually identify where do we prioritize. It, it may not even be in the United States. You know, so those, those are the areas that we're, we're struggling with right now to actually show. You know, before everything was pretty much mapped, you had a pretty good mapping of your networks and everything was. As, as things start going to the cloud, then it becomes even more difficult. So we need, we need uh, help really uh, with industry on assessing risk and ensuring that yes. we've um, tell you organized the truth. for acceptable risk. Yeah, and tell you the truth, ATT, Verizon, we, work, we have what we call a comms ISAC or an information uh, sharing analysis center, but really it's a consortium of all the carriers and, manu and, uh, and vendors that we work with together because when a customer comes in and says they have the, you know, for a, 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 a critical infrastructure issue, the actual carriers know more of how to repair that than the actual uh, the users of it. So it, it is a good cooperation we have through the comms ISAC to be able to work that through. Yeah, but I'd suggest we, we need to move that assessment to the left and not wait for the, the outage uh, that uh, right now um, it can be difficult to get that assessment that assessment of risk uh, beyond, you know, one carrier to the subordinate vendors uh, that uh, – and, and the carriers and others have described that in some of the liability uh, protection that, that they've uh, sought for information sharing. But I, I think we really need to look at how we can more proactively uh, assess risk and bring it to the appropriate level. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, uh, geodiversity, about priority. Another thing I wanted to talk about in the context of restoration was deployable capabilities and communications. And that if replacing the plain old telephone system networks with IP uh, provides avenues for voice over IP for the, through many different types of services. So are there innovative ways to come in, not, not from the preparedness side, but from the response side, to restore services in an IP world? Uh, for instance, opening up Wi-Fi networks, we saw uh, a limited uh, um, uh, deployment of that uh, after the Boston Marathon uh, tragedy. And, uh, or, or perhaps providing uh, aerostat devices in an area to uh, um, um, sort of blanket an area with Wi-Fi or other types of uh, services. Um, does, does IP provide, you know, more ability to do that sort of thing because there are, there's now one dominant <coughs> protocol? Uh, Trey Forgetty with Nina. From the response side, at least from the PSAT perspective, the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Um, one aspect that we considered in, in developing the standards for NG911 is what do you do when the PSAP is a smoking crater? You know, obviously you hope that never happens, but it's something you have to prepare for. And one of the possibilities that we said was, well, you know, the, the traditional model is you just say, okay, we'll, we'll you know, uh, sort of refer all the traffic to the PSAP down the road or one in the next jurisdiction over. The reality is, uh, as Dorothy mentioned earlier, you can have these sort of widespread events that affect all of the PSAPs that you could reasonably uh, conclude agreements with to handle your traffic. So uh, a couple of possibilities are mobile and virtual PSAPs. So you could have a, a, a vehicle 
uh, whose sole duty is to escape the disaster. We tend to think about you know driving the truck in after the disaster to reestablish services. One of the things you can actually do is load up all of the telecommunicators, a pile of equipment on a, on a vehicle, drive it out of town, <coughs> And have it with, with the connectivity reroute the traffic to that center so that you it, so that you, you're out of the way of the oncoming event. Um, the other thing is, it, let's say you don't have that level of asset, but you do have your folks uh, who, like me, have their uh, voice over IP phone cloned onto their iPad. Um, Great, they can take 911 calls wherever they are with that device. Now, maybe it's not as simple as having an iPad, um, but uh, you know, certainly a laptop and some and some connectivity options uh, make that possible. And that definitely uh, provides us with a lot of new avenues uh, for uh, handling response in a more robust way. Trey, I was just going to follow up um, your comment with a couple of my own. Absolutely, virtual peace apps is an option for the future. Um, the, there are two, two items that we, we need to consider in terms of having a deployable peace app, whether it's virtual, whether it is um, something that you put on a, uh, a command vehicle. Um, and that is SOPs. It's not something that you can do with an impending disaster. It's something that you're going to have to think of well in advance because it's not just a matter of dispatching personnel. There's a whole host, as I, as I mentioned, of, of um, procedures that have to be in place. There has to be a whole series of general orders that have to support this, this operation because, in essence, what you're doing is creating another PSAP. Granted, it may never be executed, it may never be stood up, but in the event that it is, you have to think of everything that's going to go into the operation of that while it is, um, while it is deployed. The other issue that comes into play is privacy. One of the things that we, we have in, in the PSAP is a secure environment. When you're working in the field and you're trying to handle 911 calls, it brings in the, the whole complexity of of how do you handle privacy, how do you handle information, how do you secure that information. So those are two very important considerations um, that have to be thought of in terms of the technology component, but certainly something to consider for the future. But we just we have to look at it from a broader perspective than just the technology. Dorothy, uh, with that idea of a, a backup capability for PSAPs themselves, would that be something that the EOCs that are now in place across the country uh, uh, could, in fact, uh, additionally serve as a, an alternate location for a, a PSAP personnel that had to evacuate from one county to then uh, uh, join in an EOC in the Jason County? County to continue their mission. That certainly would be would be a possibility. But before any type of decision would be made um, to have that type of scenario, I would suggest some type of exercise, even if it's just a tabletop, just to be able to run through. Does the left hand know what the right hand is doing? Am I getting what I need to do my job? And and, and to whom should I be passing um, the 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 responsibility off to once once I've completed it? That's something that you definitely have to consider. Great. Yes, thanks. I just know from experience that sustaining a level of readiness in a mobile command post uh, can be costly uh, as opposed to being able to add that um, backup function to an existing you know, land-based organization. Yeah. Absolutely, because you have a hot standby. Yeah. Brian and Barry. So when we talk about deployable communications and restoration, um, this is where physical infrastructure, you know, plays in. Um, and uh, the, the, the fastest way to restore cellular service um, is utilizing deployable cell sites. So we, uh, the industry has, you know, vast experience, vast resources in terms of deploying cows or cells on wheels, colts. This is going to sound like a, a agrarian <laughs> seminar. <laughs> colts, cells on light trucks, and sat colts, satellite uh, colts, and then goats, generators on a trailer. Um, and so, uh, the, yes, very, who, who knew that uh, the industry is, has such close connections to the agrarian side? Um, so, you know, they, 
No, no pigs. Not that I'm aware of yet, but maybe somebody could correct me. Um, They're pigtails, though. <laughs> right, right. Yes. Infrastructure. I was trying to think of one for giraffe, but I, that might be a little bit too difficult. Oh, boy. I'm sorry. Yeah, Brian, you've got to get control of this. Yeah, there we go. I'll uh, start speaking loudly and carrying a big stick. Um, so, you know, and, and these are utilized uh, – on a regular basis. Uh, you know, there are network rapid response teams. There's the pre-positioning. We've talked about this. Uh, is this, as a matter of course, goes into the d disaster planning and prep. They are deployed in advance of major incidents um, and, you know, kept out of harm's way uh, and brought in very quickly uh, to restore uh, service. So you know, that that is key. As we look at smaller cells and macro cells and the overlays and the redundancies, those also, you know, uh, play prominently. And heterogeneous networks that utilize Wi-Fi and unlicensed as well as varying um, uh, spectrum frequencies that, uh, that all have, you know, greater propagation uh, characteristics. We also saw in a number of incidents in the aftermath STAs, where the, the carriers would come to the FCC and request uh, special temporary authorization to boost power levels for their macro sites to provide greater coverage uh, where some of the fill-in or capacity sites may have gone out. Uh, and we touched on the home-in-home the -home roaming or the, the sharing arrangements in the past. Uh, you know, so, so that, that really does function well, that can, that, that can enhance the rapid responses. We, when it comes to the aerostats, you know, the industry has looked at this. I know the FCC has looked at this. Uh, facially, you know, there is there's certainly some appeal in terms of uh, the, the concept. I think operationally, um, there are a number of questions that still remain, um, and uh, it goes, you know, from everything to interference scenarios where you, you're, you're essentially putting a uh, tower way up high in the sky. Uh, and the nature of many of these incidents is we don't see cell networks entirely going black. So where you may have some individual cell site outages, uh, an aerostat uh, in the sky or a, a deployable aerial communications uh, solution could cause some of that interference. Uh, and, and that's some concern. It's concern to uh, interference to first responders and, and their networks. So there, I think there are a number of questions that still need to be looked at uh, for that type of uh, situation. But you know, certainly understand the you know the the question. Yeah, we, there seems to be a, a growing body of um, of experience, though, uh, from all of our overseas deployments in the uh, utility of uh, putting comm nodes uh, uh, in the sky to uh, help. Uh, Add either a component of diversity or capacity in areas that are challenged. I know that uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, our convoy routes, as we were um, uh, drawing down our, our, our footprints, yet still had a, a wide scale countrywide presence, were greatly assisted by uh, airborne nodes. And there's been a lot of work. In fact, uh, uh, this week in Defense News, there's a description of LTE pods uh, and, and uh, uh, Wi Fi uh, on. Drones providing uh, capability and some commercial experience uh, experiments. Uh, I think uh, Google in uh, New Zealand with balloons. Uh, so uh, it it would be helpful for us to to, to better understand that utility. Or you know, because I'm concerned about capacity. It's great to have cows and colts, but if the cows and colts are in the wrong state when the issue occurs, it's it's a days long response to get them in place and up and running. So. Uh, uh, it, e either I, as we go forward, as we have so much dependence on uh, uh, networks uh, for communities, uh, I, I, we either need to have some kind of readiness standard that says I have this much ready to be in place that soon, uh, or, or I think we'll need to have uh, more more flexible abilities to um, move restoral capacity around. Uh, so I, 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 I don't think we're there yet, is, is what I'm trying to say. Barry, then Tony. Uh, just one quick additional comment on networks. Uh, as we, we work to develop public safety requirements for FirstNet, and FirstNet is very interested in deployables, especially in rural areas where you have to have coverage and you don't have a lot of existing infrastructure and the interference would be greatly minimized. But 
so we're talking about uh, survivability, restoration of networks, and then we touched on survivability and, and restoration of PSAPs. And uh, the, the IP world has done more to give uh, the public safety community more flexibility and more options in, in a post-disaster situation. Uh, and when we think uh, disaster, you know, uh, you made the comment of, of, of the smoking crater, and we have situations across the country where, you know, uh, uh, an environmental failure causes a PSAP to evacuate. There's lots of things that'll, that will cause uh, electrical failure, lightning strike. All of these have happened to my center, by the way. Um, <laughs> fleas. Did you know you have to evacuate for fleas? Have you ever had to evacuate for fleas before? Another story for another time, as Tom would say. Um, so as, as we talk about uh, the need to move a public safety answering point to an alternate location, uh, we initially looked at this, and, and the cost of setting up a uh, legacy equipment uh, in our convention center to handle 911 calls for our region was so prohibitively expensive. And you look at today's environment where if I have a good network connection and I have a PC running the software, I can do the same thing. So we have uh, tremendous uh, options available to us now in uh, just taking a building that is pre-wired for network connectivity that has the appropriate security and firewalls in place and using that uh, for our 911 call receipt. If we're moving the PSAP, we have to remember we need more than just the intake of 911. We also obviously need the uh, the RF component, and we also need a lot of 10-digit dial tone. We we have to have the ability to call out and to coordinate and to all the other things we do. So uh, IP helps us with all those. So uh, I think we are light years ahead of where we were probably even 10 years ago. During uh, during Sandy. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of, of Sandy, we established an arrangement with, uh, with FEMA whereby we would deploy um, or, or have in reserve uh, for their first right of refusal 100 units of our satellite uh, terminals uh, to be deployed within 48 hours at places that we had no idea where, the, where they were going to need them. So they set up 40 uh, disaster recovery centers in the New York, New Jersey area, 20 of which did not have any terrestrial communications. So we, we set those up. We set up Wi-Fi's. These are not terribly elegant installations. A couple of them were the routers were sitting on a couple of crates and so forth. You had to step over the wires. But they did provide that sort of uh, capability. Originally, that arrangement was supposed to be for shelters. Instead, they turned into the DRCs, which were taking claims from, uh, from citizens and so forth. But we're also there in case citizens, for the point you made, uh, at the very outset uh, this afternoon so that citizens could communicate with loved ones in other parts of the country, let them know they're okay, pay bills, so forth and so on. So that became, from a deployable standpoint, very, uh, very important for us to get to sites where, I mean, it's one thing to talk about emergency prep, where you build the resiliency in your network as you're building your network, or to supplement your network. Of course, the other side of that is emergency response and how quickly you can deploy and respond and you've got the other challenges of whether these areas are affected, whether traffic can move during Katrina. There were all these, you know, uh, roped off lines where people, uh, first responders and even supporters couldn't get through. But it's, it's, it's an absolutely uh, important part. So you're right to bring up the question of what deployable technologies can be used. And certainly that was one where we had a, we and FEMA had a pretty good experience with that. And amazingly, Months later, three, four months later, several of those 20 sites were still operating because the, the terrestrial had not been restored yet. I mean, had a, it was a massive job, you know, understandably, but uh, it, was, it was still sustainable over a long period of time. Because one of the things that the volunteers were telling us is that we're going to be here longer than we ever were for Katrina. And I asked the question, why? I said, just because of the number of people that we're dealing with and the density of the popula population there. And, of course, as Barry said, you know, the whole rural thing and whether, you know, how that plays. And FirstNet, FirstNet has basically made the point we want 100 percent geographic coverage in the United States. That's going to be a tough challenge. Phil, did you have something? Uh, one reason I'm glad in the agenda you made a distinction between the types of outages that are caused by natural disaster, like a hurricane on the one can, on the one hand, or something like a long-term power failure, which could be the result of a cyber attack. And from the point of view of uh, law enforcement, at least as far as my company Subsencio deals with them, uh, if there is a cyber attack that causes that kind of widespread damaging outage, they don't know whether it was caused by a uh, college fraternity prank. 
uh, or if it's the start of a war. So they will go to battle stations and they will get a court order and start doing a lot of surveillance and they'll start pounding on the doors of all the service providers saying, hey, give us access, we need to know what's going on. And they know very well that IP networks are relatively easier to restore because they have, they're more robust and more resilient. So their expectation level will probably go up for more faster restoration. And if they don't see that you have a proper CALEA surveillance solution installed in your network, they have some workaround technologies. And uh, NSA is not the only agency that has uh, creative uh, technical capabilities. And that's very dangerous for the service provider because uh, who knows if those technical capabilities will have the kind of privacy safeguards that CALEA solutions have built in. So as a service provider, it would be nice if while we're being proactive and thinking about how to keep our networks resilient, um, I think for the sake of protecting privacy, it would also make sense to keep our CALEA solutions resilient so you don't run into the risk of liability on uh, the grounds of violating subscriber privacy. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a good segue because we have now eh, 30 minutes roughly and uh, haven't gotten into the long-term power outage piece and uh, power dependence was one of the things I definitely wanted to discuss here. So, you know, when telephones were powered by the network, there was a lot more resilience on the customer side. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, you had, you know, copper copper lines that were working, you know, during pretty, pretty dire uh, circumstances. So um, in those instances, people could still call 911 if the Peace app was up and operational because you were, you were powered centrally. So we're looking at long-term power outages, something that could last, you know, potentially a couple of weeks. Uh, what are the sort of challenges or opportunities uh, that are there for ensuring customers can still communicate when the, when the grid is down? We have uh, today, you know, the sort of battery backups in, in the home that can provide power to a VoIP phone for a number of hours. Where do we need to get? What are the, what are the sort of things we need to think about longer term versus just what we have now? Um, I think that I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your exact question, but I think it's, it's important to remember that one of the most important things to do in the transitions is obviously to have the trials. So we're very happy that AT&T is conducting these trials because they're very, very important. That's, that's when we're going to really know what problems the system, the new networks can have and how to fix them. Um, we are, again, we're very happy with the trials. We would love to see trials in areas that are more representative of the Latino community. And we've had conversations with some AT&T representatives. And I think they're, they're open to that. And we would very much appreciate that because we want to make sure that, again, that's where we're, we're, we're going to get some of those answers um, that you have asked. So, so just echoing from the uh, consumer perspective, um, and, and Rosa touched on this earlier. Uh, you know, we, you know, CTIA, the wireless uh, carriers, have been messaging for years. You know, your device, the reason why it it can do so many great things and is so small is, you know, it it is battery powered. And you know, keep in mind the need to have spare batteries, the need to always have car chargers. A lot of people don't think of you know car charger, but that uh, has proven incredibly effective at being able to. Uh, uh, to keep your your phone powered and be able to make uh, critical communications, um, and and so those are those are fundamental aspects of changing the way consumers you know think and, and regard you know the the technology, but you know uh, incredibly important. <clears throat> right. And that that's in addition to I'm sorry I should have mentioned the uh, the uh, charging stations that you see kind of in the disaster response that you know carriers do set up. Uh, very important, but having people thinking proactively uh, uh, ahead of you know, forecasted events, but also to have those on hand where an event may happen with, without notice. Brian, uh, uh, people are beginning to get the word about uh, thinking about battery management uh, in a crisis uh, when power is lost to the home or, or, or might be uh, interrupted. Um, a concern that I have is that when battery management goes to the point, well, I'm just going to turn things off unless I need to make a call. Uh, and that uh, certainly is an option that that families will go through if it looks like they're going to be out of power for, for days. Um, and then y you lose the ability to receive incoming calls. Uh, so w one of the things I think we need to explore and, be, and, and provide clarity on is who 
we're we're replacing fixed copper with fixed uh, fiber, um, who should have the responsibility for uh, uh, what degree of backup power? Uh, should that be entirely a consumer responsibility? Uh, if, if that's the case, hey, let's let's make sure that's clear. Uh, uh, should it be the responsibility of the provider uh, up until eight hours, but then beyond then it's the consumer? Uh, um, I, I'd be looking for for comment on you know both sides of the stakeholder uh, uh, as to who would get stuck with uh, having to resource it uh, of. Uh, wh what should we do about CPE? Wh who should be responsible for for that in the home? Yeah, Barry, <laughs> you did raise your hand about <laughs> minimum battery power. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> one uh, one important element of that is for the the first responder community, the PSAP, to understand what type of power backup is available from their carriers, um, and what should they expect. Uh, from a network uh, reliability perspective. And that information is very hard to come by um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. I don't have to tell you, uh, et cetera. So uh, on one hand, I think public safety needs to know. There needs to be more transparency in, in what is the the level of, um, of uh, reserve power. I know I, I am told uh, at one point the FCC attempted to, to place uh, battery limits on central offices and things like that, and it, it didn't happen. So... Um, so A, we, we need to know. B, I think the fundamental question is uh, what what should we expect? And and it's very hard to answer that question because are we talking about uh, an isolated neighborhood event? Uh, are we talking about a widespread event uh, in in a county? Are we talking about something that impacts an entire region of the state? And so, from from a cost of service. Um, I could say, well, I want AT&T to give me one month of battery backup at every central <laughs> office, and they'll be happy to do that and give me the bill for it, and I won't be able to pay it, right? So, um, and I'm just picking on you because you're sitting next to me. But um, uh, so, um, so I, I think you know uh, there has to be a balance in the middle of of what what is economically uh, feasible, and then also we have to recognize that the risk uh, at every corner of the country is completely different, whether it is a tornado risk, a hurricane risk, a wildland fire risk, uh, and so forth. Also, there is certain infrastructure that just cannot be accessed for just a few months of the year, especially uh, I'm thinking of, of different sites in Utah where you can't access them uh, except in the summertime when the snow's melted. So you've got to make sure that your generators and the propane is refilled at that moment in time. So um, I think I would love to have a one-size-fits-all solution for that, and uh, I just I, I don't think we can have one. So uh, as importantly, we just need to know what the answer is so I can plan appropriately for that. Yeah, it goes back to your accountability piece. So that if the guy in the blue shirt is the accountable guy, <laughs> we know it's him. Yeah. You want me to rebut? <laughs> no, I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought you, uh, <laughs> I thought you would agree. I, I you sort of felt in support I, of your I, colleague. This, this, this is my occurrence with at and I was feeling a lot of eyes sort of on me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll have to say, first of all, this is not my area of expertise, but I, but I am a, a citizen, and I, do, I, I will share an opinion. Um, today is different than 50 years ago. And we've talked about the great advances of IP technology. You know, uh, we talk about the great advances of, of, um, of um, what well, the Tesla, which is now the greatest car on earth. But if you don't plug it in, it doesn't go anywhere. And if there's no power, it doesn't go anywhere. So, so consumer behavior is changing, and, and consumers have traded, have have, ch have chosen to trade, you know, uh, always on telephone for mobility. That's a, that's a consumer choice. I think I think you know as it relates to public safety, you know, obviously, which is my end of the business, we want PSAPs to have backup power. You know, we think businesses should have backup power, and we think the public safety agency should have backup power. That's a key part of keeping a public safety answering point alive. But uh, as a consumer, um, the marketplace is moving to, you know, we want to be untethered, and we want to be battery powered. And um, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for, you know, 
Is it eight hours? Is it four hours? Is it the consumer responsibility or all? Because that's not my area of the business. But I think I think uh, um, I think it's not unfair to have expectations that say um, bring your own battery. And, and, and my I, question was oriented not just around PSATs, but the home itself, residences. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I was also referring just to the, the, the network. For, for, for the data networks we rely on, how long can the carrier support the, the data network uh, in a power outage? Right. Right. So Dorothy Kelly, Trey. Power dependency is an opportunity to build new relationships. Um, and the relationships that I'm speaking of has to do with the emergency preparedness community, your community-based organizations that deal with special needs populations, your faith-based organization, any organization that has a population as its um, focal point. And the reason for this is to, to build awareness in terms of power dependencies. Sometimes we don't realize how dependent we are on something until we suddenly don't have it. I'm thinking back to um, events that have happened in the Commonwealth of Virginia, not in my current capacity managing a state program, but managing a small PSAP in um, a rural community in, in Virginia. And one of the things that we struggled with was how do we let folks know where they can get batteries, where they can get ice, where they can get all of the different things that, that they need. And in a lot of ways, what we're talking about in terms of power dependency and, and whether or not there's an expectation from the public that they're going to have a certain backup supply, whether it is for their cell phone, whether it's a car charger, what, what, what have you, there has to be a need to build awareness amongst the, the, the populations and the constituents that we serve. So the, this is a tremendous opportunity to be able to reach out to those organizations, particularly the preparedness community, because they're already trying to get the word out in terms of you should have water on hand, you should have canned uh, food on hand for a certain duration of time. And we also need to be thinking of we need to have a certain supply of batteries to, to augment that power dependency. So um, this is a tremendous opportunity for outreach. How we go about doing it and how we shape that message um, is is one of the things that I look at from, from a statewide perspective because even though uh, Virginia does include the national capital region, there's a, a vast number of smaller PSAPs in rural areas in Virginia that are struggling with these very same questions. Um, so again, looking at the glass half empty, looking at the glass half full, I think it's an opportunity for us to spread our message through community partnerships. Kelly Williams with the National Association of Broadcasters. I wanted to uh, pick up on something that the Admiral said, bring it back to consumers from a consumer standpoint. Um, I have some personal experience, and I had a coworker had a personal experience um, with, uh, he had a fiber to the home service, an unnamed fiber to the home service, and uh, he was an early adopter. And during the, about uh, eight years ago, we had a prolonged power outage in the D.C. area, and his phones went out after eight hours. He had no phone service uh, because the terminal equipment wasn't powered. Um, after that, he went to them and said, I want to put a UPS. I'll, I'll buy a UPS and put it on there. And he, I don't know what that company's policy is now, but they told him, no, you couldn't do that. You, you violate our thing. He said, but I can buy a commercial UPS. It'll give me three or four days of power. Um, so I think that's a really important thing. Um, I, I wonder, and I don't want to dump the gum here, but we've talked a lot about PSAPs, and we really haven't talked about the public alerting part of this. We've talked about how the public gets to responders, but now not how they get back. And I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit, because I think that's something we haven't talked about yeah, yet. Yeah, Kelly, this would be a great time, because one of the things that we do want to explore is the value of diversity from the perspective of the the, the the media options th that yeah. we, we have uh, present in um, broadcast towers are built to a different standard uh, from a weather perspective than uh, an average cell tower. Uh, and uh, we, I think, we'll need to think about a mixed mode uh, surviving communications environment, uh, not only from the, the tower standpoint, but also are there sufficient endpoint receivers to uh, in fact, take advantage of that. Uh, I uh, last time I saw an FM radio that wasn't in a car was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. uh, uh, over to you. Well, 
NAB certainly has some opinions on solutions for FM radios that I know Brian's aware of, so we won't go into it. But in any event, um, yeah, that's right. We, we have a pretty reliable infrastructure. It's, um, our, our towers tend to be bigger, beefier. We've also been around and have a lot of experience as an industry for mm, 50, 60, 80 years and keeping those facilities up and running. Um, so just sort of quickly to, to braze through it, the typical broadcast facility has fuel-based generators that last on the order of days. Now, it, it matter, you know, it differs, you know, some people a day, some people 10 days, depending upon their, their, um, their resources. One of the interesting things we saw during Katrina, which Brian brought up, was it's great to have a generator, but if you have a prolonged power outage, no matter what it is, if there's a disaster that went, uh, went uh, that caused that, getting fuel back to those generators and getting credentialing and all that is an issue. And we, we've worked with you all and we've worked, we've had uh, state broadcasters work their state to get credentialing to do that. Um, you know, we do not have congestion problems. Um, we can reach 10,000 people, we can reach 100 million people. Um, I don't know any place where there's 100 million in one. New York's getting pretty close, but, um, w you know, we don't have that congestion problem. We think that, that, that um, we provide a, a, a pretty resilient way of getting information out to the public. Having said that, we are consumers of phone service from carriers. Um, from an EAS perspective, our connection to the federal EAS, IPAWS, is through the commercial internet. So if there's a federal, say a, a huge regional disaster, and there's a federal alert sent out, if there isn't priority to make sure, and, and I have no knowledge, maybe you do, do iPause messages have priority through the internet? I have no idea. So will they? You're, you're nodding yes. Yes, okay. So that's nice to know. We, we have no idea. But if you lose your connectivity, and this, I will say, as a citizen engineer, I am not to bring everybody down who's excited about all of the fun and nice things that <laughs> IP brings to us. Anything that relies on the commercial internet, in my engineering judgment, is risky. Um, Barry, who talked about, he says, I can move to a facility that already had that has a good connection. I'm sorry, a what? A good connection right. that. A private connection. There you go. Right. Not an internet. But so I, I think it's an interesting uh, thing we have to talk about in in understanding uh, the re survivability um, in getting messages. The other part we've talked about PSAPs. We haven't talked about EOCs. You you mentioned EOCs. A critical part of public warning and alerting is through EOCs and what facilities EOCs have. It's interesting, Tony, after Katrina, I saw something I never, the satellite networks are up. I didn't know a satellite dish could fold up like an umbrella. And until you see a satellite dish that has closed up, I mean, I saw that after Katrina, I didn't, you, you just, these were solid dishes. So the issues of being able to get, um, and I bring that up because a number of states rely on products that are satellite distribution based. And those companies are essentially packet switched centers in the sky, or they have knocks regionally. Um, I saw about 12 of them like that, of all sizes. Um, but that, you know, that's a that's a that's a that's an extraordinary situation. Um, but there, there, you know, for us, the other vulnerable part, I think, which we have to look at, and I'm thinking about this because I'm actually on a CISIC work, CISIC working group on, on this is cybersecurity, but vulnerability. Um, we have a lot of, you guys call them knocks. We have groups that operate stations from a single point. We refer to them as hubs. The connectivity from the hub to the local station, making sure that that stays up and is reliability. Most of those are, are already IP-based, packet-based services. They tend to be private networks, so they're actually pretty resilient. Um, uh, so we have you know, some issues there, I think. Um, but I think as a service, we, we do pretty good in keeping the broadcast facilities up and running. It's, I think it's a connection to the EOCs, to FEMA, to IPAWS, that 
need to be made sure that they're they're resilient. If I could ask uh, uh, Stephen Johnson uh, just to sort of piggyback on the alerting and the IPAWS uh, aspect um, from the, from the cable standpoint on emergency alerting, what some of your thoughts are on, on the IP transition and, and the repercussions for your industry? Yeah, we have some of the same uh, concerns that, that Kelly mentioned. That, um, powering of, of facilities, uh, head ends in our case, and uh, making sure you have enough fuel. And we've, we've gone to uh, natural gas fuel in some cases. But yeah, um, as far as the internet delivery of, of, uh, for EAS, yeah, that is a concern. We've had the EAS system has been around for a number of years and is based on a local primary one and a local primary two broadcast station. You pick up those um, signals from those stations as your primary inputs. M more recently, we've added the CAP input, IPAWS, and as Kelly mentioned, it's uh, over the Internet. And first problem we ran into, we have some remotely located head ends. I imagine there's some broadcast facilities that are that way too that didn't have Internet, didn't have wireline Internet available, and how, how do you deal with that? We, we looked into alternatives and we found some good satellite al alternatives that we used, but that was a big issue. And if we did have a, a landline internet, how reliable is it going to be? We have some issues with that. We didn't we didn't really feel we had some right now had had good alternatives. We've looked into a few things and I think we we found something, but hopefully that those those alter alternatives can improve. Uh, furthermore, on on EAS, uh, the older style EAS was based on a, uh, a three-digit event code. There's not much information you can put into three digits. There's a lookup table in, in the decoder that says, okay, if it comes down TOR, that's a tornado warning, and it has a canned message that it sends out in case of a tornado warning. And one thing with, with IPAWS and, and, and CAP, it will allow additional text information, so I think that's going to be a, a very good avenue for getting inf additional information out to the general public, we can give them more specific information. And tied in with that, it's better targeting. Uh, the old EAS was targeted, um, could be targeted down to one-ninth of a county, but generally the alerts were issued for an, an entire county or, or multiple counties. Now with, with CAP, we can have the capability of issuing alerts that are down to neighborhoods if necessary. And I think we'll find that um, you don't have that, that confirmation as much of an issue that was mentioned in this morning's session that when you get an alert, you have a certain time, certain number of confirmations you feel that you need to make before you take action. And if it's for your neighborhood, you're probably going to be more inclined to react to it quicker than if it's for an entire county. And then you wonder, well, does it really affect the part of the county that I'm in? So those are just some of the general things as far as EAS and reliability and, and, um, and tying in with, with IP that we're looking at. Uh, uh, Tony, and then I'd like to ask Brent a question. <laughs> um, I could not agree more, Kelly, with you about the, the, the point that you make about relying on Internet, the, the, the quote unquote, how FEMA puts it, the dirty Internet. Um, <laughs> capability. Um, I had never heard that term before, but uh, um, and 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 Joel, the point you point you and Barry made about you know establishing private network communications really insulates that uh, that capability, and uh, and and I certainly get that. The the I have never gone to a federal agency or a state state or you know uh, agency and have said we we want you to rely entirely on a satellite-based network for your agency or for your state. Right? It, 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 we're always talking about it in the context of complementary technologies that can work with each other, work in the absence of each other and the failure of, of one another, or certain kinds of traffic that are maybe perhaps better suited over satellite versus versus terrestrial or vice versa. And so that's the context really that, that I think um, I'm hearing a lot about here, here today. We just wanted to reinforce it. You know, it's never about just just us, just just our industry, just our capability. It's it's what do you have as a as a portfolio of options? So I think that's important for customers to take 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 note of. Graceful degradation because we've got numerous capabilities that were Precisely. planned right. uh, t together with the idea that it, it, and one. 
Yeah, your point go. about the budget, I mean, you know, and, and CFOs and, you know, is, is there unlimited money? Uh, I get that. Uh, I, I once heard uh, uh, somebody from yet another f federal cabinet agency, not the same one I referred to earlier, but said, well, we don't have money for resiliency. And I raised my hand and I said, you've just built two redundant terrestrial networks. You know, you could have saved half of what you spent on resiliency, yeah. right? Because you already had built yourself one great terrestrial network. Why are you building two? Because the, the first rule of government spending is why buy one when you have two for twice the price? <laughs> <laughs> Not for attribution. Uh, Brent, um, uh, we've talked uh, a lot about peace apps uh, and the role that they have to play in uh, public safety communications, but they really are just a part of what uh, the communications that are required uh, uh, after a disaster for public safety. Um, there's the communications internal to the police units themselves and how they communicate. There's the, the same with the, the fire department. There's the need for uh, uh, surviving um, government offices to uh, communicate with each other but also to express uh, needs and or resources to support resource need pairing. Uh, there's the role of the EOC uh, that we talked about. Can, can you uh, um, talk a little bit about how um, ties to TDM today might create problems for um, those other public safety communications uh, in an, uh, everything over IP world or are, are we already there and we don't need to worry about the Sunset of TDM uh, in PSTN. And so you know, I'm a, I'm a retired cop. I'm the guy's guy that had the boots on the ground. You know, far from technical or everything else. But uh, and going back to your question, I don't think that we can say that we're anywhere near there. I think there, are, you know, in a TDM environment, there are places throughout the country that 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 that's going to remain for quite some time. Uh, I agree, you know, lots of comments have been made, you know, that this is a wonderful thing that we can, you know, we're just going to jump to an all IP environment and and everything's going to be all good. I personally come from the state of Nevada, okay, and the gentleman earlier on the earlier panel talked about, you know, providing services to rural Nevada. Um, they're not going to move forward with anything for qu quite a long time, let's be honest. Um, and we've talked about a number of reasons, but the biggest one that I can come up with is, is certainly budget or money. Um, we have rural counties in Nevada whose communications budgets are in the hundreds of dollars as opposed to thousands. And I don't think we're unique in any way. I think there's, you know, there's other states that have very rural um, communities and very small PSAPs that uh, are going to continue the way they are for quite some time. So in answer to your question, I hope I'm answering your question, I think we still have to, we're going to have to maintain that and I think we're going to have to figure out a way to, um, as it was talked about earlier and I think it was Tom Sorley indicated, you know, the haves and the have-nots, we have a lot of have-nots and we're going to have to figure out a way how to um, provide those have-nots either with technology or with the funding in some way to help move them from TDM as we move to an all IP environment. I think that, you know, again, there are some definite pockets in this country that aren't going to move as fast as we'd like them to. And I think it's incumbent upon the haves, as Tom said, to figure out a way to help the have-nots because it's just not going to be there. Uh, you know, and, I, and again, I speak you know, personally, I've been out and talked to rural sheriffs who, you know, we even talk about interoperability issues with LMR. Um, and, and let's go back to the, you know, when we um, um, had to redo radios to 12.5, you know, and they said, we don't have the money to do it. So, you know, what are we supposed to do? And, you know, but it's a mandate. It's an FCC mandate. You know, and that's when we were finding out about the financial aspects of what's going on in, in, in the rural parts of my state. So, and I think there's a comparison to if we're going to move to all IP. You know, some some way, somehow, we have to find a way to deal with that aspect before we can make the assumption that we're going to jump forward in all areas throughout the country. It, it's very helpful, Brent. And I mentioned in an earlier session that I had spent a good part of last week out in Clark County, and uh, they're having a heck of a time with their P25 transition right now. And that's in a benign environment, right? right. There's no external stress other than some cowboys and cattle, and I won't go into that part. But uh, uh, 
uh, it, 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 that's that's on a good day. Uh, add a, a couple of stress factors. Now we've got uh, you know a, a real recipe for uh, uh, concern. So um, I, I appreciate that window into how we just really need to be careful and diligent. And I think that's really uh, part of what the IP transition order is is all about. Is to hey let's let's exercise due diligence as we go forward and create the right kind of framework that will allow us to do this responsibly. Uh, 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 Barry, you looked like you had. Uh, uh, okay, great. Ken Budka, Alcatel Lucent. I reemphasize that uh, an evolution to IP technologies is, is not necessarily all IP, that in any evolution, you need to support the legacy technologies as well as the next generation technologies. We see that in the cellular world where the, the uh, dual mode devices supporting the 2G technologies as well as 3G and 3G as well as 4G. We have the same thing in the IP transition world where we're supporting the next generation broadband services but also uh, emulating circuits over that, that, that technology. Uh, uh, and, and it's possible to support both and you need to support both for legacy technology reasons as well as economic reasons. There's economic reasons to support everything for uh, a transition period. Yeah, that, that's a, a great point. Um, but, but we, we do need to remember when we do that, that you then take a um, availability percentage for the one technology that might be four nines, uh, and if you're running that over a, a second technology that has its own availability characteristic, maybe three nines, maybe four nines itself, you, you start to multiply those together uh, and you just have a, a, a different and lower availability uh, if you don't take that into account as you design that interim period where you're uh, virtually making the, some of those legacy services available over other modes. Right. And I, I think there you go. To, I think Mike mentioned that, that it's a question of design and, and you're designing that so that you're, you're, not, you're not having that hit. Yeah, and I'd suggest some of these rural peace apps, some of these rural communities will be challenged to do that responsibly. Um, and so quite often they're just beholden to whatever, whatever vendor shows up and says, ah, I can help you in this. Uh, we, as a, a uh, community of, of uh, providers and professionals here, I think need to help those smaller communities navigate through this interim period. I just had one follow-up comment to the um, <coughs> Admiral's statement that I think what we're struggling for is parity, parity in terms of the delivery of technology, terms in, de in, in of the availability of the technology, and parity in terms of being able to afford it. Online, of, of, of which we had uh, quite a few, and uh, it sort of highlights just the the depth of uh, this topic. You know, questions about uh, you know providing alerts to people with disabilities, um, and, and a question about home security lines, banks, and fire departments that have alarms that are wired into police and fire that use legacy TDM. I mean, a lot a lot of a lot of things here that are still. Still, things that the FCC is interested in, and um, if we had another two hours, I think we can we can have you know a jolly good time. But um, I'm going to have to pass it on over to uh, Jeff Goldthorpe, uh, and, and I guess we'll have a 15-minute break in, in between. Um, but I, I want to thank the panel uh, for your contributions, for your time. I think this was a very in, an informative discussion. Um, as somebody whose main job it is to uh, Keep the chairman apprised of any disasters or emergencies and the status of communications working with our good friends over at DHS. Um, this has definitely given me a lot to think about, and it's something that uh, I think is helpful to uh, my team and the other folks in, in public safety. So um, so I would say stick around, though. At, uh, at 3.30, Jeff will be leading a cyber panel so interesting that it will make your heart bleed. Um, okay. Some of you got that. Yes. This thing on? Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. You got the quote of the day. It's open until 4 o'clock, but again, you'll be outside the FCC security perimeter. Bring your IDs, and you'll have to come back through 12th Street. Thank you.
gentlemen, uh, if you could take your seats, please. We're going to uh, we're going to move on to session three on cyber risks to commercial, public, and governmental networks uh, during and after the transitions. Uh, this session will examine the challenges that cyber exploits pose for public safety communications and operations. Uh, again, I just want to remind folks um, who may be um, online um, that you can submit questions via the live questions at FCC.gov uh, email address or via Twitter uh, using the tech transitions hashtag. Uh, in addition, in the room here, you can submit a question card. I'm told we don't have the microphones available t at this time. So if you have questions in the room, put them on a card, get them to the FCC staff, and we'll get it to the moderator. With that, I would like to introduce Jeff Goldthorpe, who is Associate Chief of the Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau. Jeff. And thanks, everybody, for coming today. If you've been here all day, thanks twice or three times. And, uh, and if you're coming tomorrow, well, thanks four times. But um, today's uh, third panel is about cybersecurity risk in, a, in an area of, of transition as we move from legacy TDM networks to IP-based networks. Before I um, say anything more about the panel, I wanted to take a minute and just go around very briefly. If you would just um, introduce yourself by name and, and uh, identify the, the entity that you represent here, that would be, that would be helpful. Richard? Uh, my name is Richard Shockey. I'm the chairman of the board of the SIP Forum, SIP being the session initiation protocol that is being used in all the voice over IP networks. So it's all my fault. So. <laughs> Can we blame Henning a little bit also? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're, yeah. Hi, hi I'm Andrew White. I, I'm Vice President of Technology and Standards at ADIS, so that includes, uh, we have 15 technical committees, Technology and Operations Council, and a CIO council. John Wright, Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, or APLU International. I'm Brian Rosen from Newstar, but I also am responsible for the I3 stuff that you've all been uh, foisted with around the work group that created that technical standard. Phil Roberts from the Internet Society. Trey Forgety with the National Emergency Number Association. We published the uh, I3 standard <laughs> that Brian so uh, helpfully uh, helped to create. Hi, good afternoon. Mike Gordon with Lockheed Martin. Jeff England, I'm the uh, CFO at Silver Star Communications. We are an ILEC and CLEC telecommunications provider in Western Wyoming. I'm Mark Adams. Uh, I work for Northrop Grumman Information Systems. I'm in the Chief Technology Office, and I focus on mobile security. I'm Jeff Goldthorpe. I'm Associate Bureau Chief for Cybersecurity, Communications Reliability here at the Commission. And I'm uh, Dave Simpson, uh, the Bureau Chief for Public Safety Homeland Security. And my colleague, Lauren Kravitz, uh, who is uh, Jeff's deputy. And taking notes, yes. <laughs> now, the way I thought we would get started is um, I have a few things that I'd like to say just to set the stage. While I'm speaking, uh, I wanted to let you know that when I'm finished, I'm going to go around again and ask each of you to spend a couple of minutes, a minute, however long you think it's going to take. It doesn't have to be a couple of minutes. Um, but don't take too much more than that. <laughs> and, and just um, uh, lay out for us what you think the major issue or issues are as it relates to the topics that, um, that we're going to be talking about today. What keeps you up at night? What worries you the most? Um, I've got a list of questions. A lot of them you've already seen. Uh, we have some scenarios to talk about, but I'd sure like to hear some of the specific things that are, some of the things that are on your mind. And, um, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Now, um, the first thing I thought I would say today is that the inter Internet protocol is not the Internet. That may be an obvious statement to everybody here or most people or some of the people, but they're different, very different, some, it's, and it's easy to confuse them. Um, the Internet protocol is a technology. It's a transport um, uh, technology for moving um, traffic. Uh, TDM, the time domain multiplexing technology, is also a way of moving traffic. It's the, it's the technology we're moving away from. Um, the internet protocol, when it's used as part of the global internet, becomes the internet. 
the internet is this big network of networks um, that introduces traffic that flows over it to risks that are different than the risks that exist on private commercial IP-based networks. So when we talk about the transition to IP, we're tending to talk about transition to uh, managed IP-based networks. Uh, and so when we talk about um, uh, 911 traffic being carried on IP-based networks, we tend not to be talking about that traffic being carried over the public Internet as a rule. Okay, I mean, now that's an assertion, something we can talk about. The, I think the thing that um, I'm most interested in is your views on how um, carrying traffic on a managed carrier-grade IP-based network exposes it to additional cyber risk, more cyber risk than would have existed if it had been carried on a TDM-based network. We can talk about the additional risks that it would be exposed to if it were carried on the global Internet, I think that is a less likely um, instance. I don't think we're going to be facing that as much, but I'd be interested in your opinions about that too. So there'll be, there'll be times during the panel when those questions will come up, right? Um, and, uh, and it's not just 911 traffic. Um, it's it's um, commercial grade communications, regular communications, voice communications, and so forth. Um, and and my assertion, at least for now, is that what we're talking about when we talk about an IP transition is a transition to managed IP networks. And it's, uh, one thing to say, one one way to to make this a little clearer, is to use the difference between a enterprise network and the global internet and the internet okay an enterprise network is an enter is a network like the network that we have say within this building that we use to communicate amongst the computers within this building we have a chief security officer we have a a an intranet to to communicate amongst ourselves that is i'll say firewalled i'll use that term firewalled from from the internet and uh and is um and in, in so doing is, is, is I'll say, um, has become relatively, say, it's partitioned from, from the Internet. Now, um, that is uh, a lot different from the world that exists outside those walls in the global Internet. It's also different from the world that exists on a private IP-based network. And, and the differences between a private IP network and a corporate enterprise network on the one end of the, of the scale and the internet on the other end of the scale are something that I think it's worth exploring because it's, that's the sweet spot for our discussion today. It's those managed IP-based networks and how um, what the cybersecurity threats and risks that those networks are exposed to. Yeah, Jeff, uh, we can't completely separate the two, I don't think, because as we go forward at some point, there's a commingling of packets uh, in the transport uh, that uh, does expose one to risk from the other. It, it may not expose the internals of a cryptographically isolated VPN to, uh, uh, oh, that information is going to leak out, but uh, certainly denial of service attacks uh, uh, don't know the difference between a VPN packet and a straight internet packet. Uh, so uh, we, we do want to understand uh, uh, threats uh, from that regard as well, uh, where the two meet, uh, and uh, where, because we're using IP, and it's so easy now to take our network, which used to just support this building, which now that corporate intranet goes to Gettysburg, it goes to our field offices, it goes all across the United States as one intranet that there's a scale, a scope uh, in the aggregate uh, that uh, presents a much greater impact so that even if the risk is the same as we go from TDM to, to IP, uh, the um, risk uh, times the impact, um, I, I got that wrong, the um, uh, vulnerability times the impact uh, gives a much higher uh, aggregate risk. And so we want to explore that as well. Okay. 
Um, so now, um, second thing, or the, the next thing I'll mention before I turn it over to the panelists to c come back with some, some of their own ideas for issues that we want to deal with today, is I want to remind folks that back in February, NIST released something called a cybersecurity framework, and a lot of you might be familiar with it. Um, cybersecurity framework is something we're taking very, very seriously here as a tool for um, market-based, business-based cyber risk management, top-down cyber risk management. doesn't focus as much on best practice as cyber practice as it does on uh, managing risk in, in the enterprise. And so that is an approach that we have absorbed completely and, um, and, we, and are believing in it and, um, and are using it with those that we're working with through the CISRIC and, and other fora. So, so that, uh, as we talk today, I'm interested in your views on how the, the NIST cybersecurity framework can be used to secure um, emergency communications networks and services as we transition to IP-based networks. So um, I'll stop talking. Um, that's just sort of an introduction. Richard, um, and I'll ask you, um, do you have anything you want to help um, start a list here of things that we want to talk about? Let me start out by saying that the, what we are trying to do here is to essentially restore the circle of trust between the various entities that represent the communications network of the United States. And this is uh, consumer to service provider, service provider to PSAP, PSAP to uh, first responders, that whole chain of trust uh, has been fundamentally broken in multiple ways. And we do actually understand the problem. One of the issues that some of us have been working extensively on is how to restore essentially a, a notion of identity within the process. Um, I think some of us here in Washington, we saw the reports yesterday at the Washington Post about uh, the IRS caller ID spoofing problem, uh, which is probably the worst incident that we've seen right now. Um, certainly uh, staff here at the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission have been worried about caller ID spoofing and identity in communications now for quite some time. And one of the things that I think that we're going to have to look at, not only for managed communication services using telephone numbers, but certainly this process in public safety where from consumer to carrier, from carrier to ESI net, from ESI net to PSAP to first responder, there has to be a way of cryptographically assuring each party to this transaction understands where the call or data is coming from and that it has not been maliciously tampered in the middle in some way, shape, or form. That's one very simple thing that concerns a great deal of us one way or the other. Um, Jeff, you're absolutely right. This is a managed service um, all across the process. Uh, the FCC's 477 data is actually quite clear. We're at about 30 percent or more uh, of U.S. voice being originated on all IP SIP networks. Probably within 24 months with the introduction of voice over LTE, that will shoot up to 70 <clears> percent. <throat> and I have not sold my Apple stock yet. Uh, so the, the, the timeliness of this workshop and looking at restoring the circle of trust, uh, hardening the, 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 uh, the potential threat vectors. And I think we've already identified one of the major threat vectors in the system already, which is um, international wholesale gateways. Namely, some service providers have gateways that allow IP voice to enter the North American PSTN from who knows where, and they're unable to assert, assert any form of identity about where this track and trace mechanism is. So even if you're able to find the call and it has been logged in call detail records, uh, the ability of FCC enforcement or law enforcement to actually track down where the malicious traffic came from is very, very difficult to do because 
we don't have identity in the system any longer. So that's just, I'll uh, let someone else, that's my number one issue, at least at this point. Okay. Hey, thanks, Richard. Um, just, uh, I should have said this from the outset. For this round where we're going around asking for your um, concerns, the things that are on your mind, we're going to use the clock um, for that, um, and then we're going to turn it off. Okay. <laughs> so next, uh, Andrew. Okay, very good. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, so I'm going to echo a, a little bit of what Richard was talking about because, because I, I think, you know, so I went to work for Quest kind of way back in the day, 1998, and we were doing voice over IP. So, you know, you do a little math and you figure, you know, voice over IP in some capacity has been out there for 16 plus years, reasonably reliable. But l let's keep in mind that a lot of it, uh, especially in the beginning, basically came, it hit a TDM gateway, it got converted from TDM, it went across a private network. Um, so really what we were focused on from a security perspective was the isolation of that private network which was owned by a particular carrier and it was less about the boundaries. I, I, I think one of the things that uh, Richard really hit the nail on the head was around you know, where this traffic is originating and how it originates. Um, so in particular, um, it, when you look at that model, what we're starting to do is the gateways from voice over IP based traffic to voice over IP based traffic are starting to increase. I mean, we have active IPN and iWork. We have a lot of bilateral IPN and iWork um, that, that is already in place. And that's essentially what we look at um, when we look at interconnection of public safety to a certain extent. So as soon as you build the, uh, decide to implement those gateways, um, you, you lose some of the uh, barrier and you have to decide who to allow in and who to not allow in. A and I think fundamentally that, that's where the problem is. Because what we've done is from an identity perspective, we've been moving more away from a telephony-based model where it cost you something to get a telephone number, you had to pay something on a monthly basis. It was a bit of a barrier um, economically. You couldn't uh, you know, get a thousand numbers. Uh, as an individual, you know, the, the whole concept of, you know, bots and things like that would be much more difficult to implement. So uh, if you look at what's happened, now you've applied an, an Internet-based identity model where now you really have, uh, have a lot of trouble differentiating the inbound traffic. Um, so in the past where, uh, let's say we had web, email, and phone, you used to always be able to fall back on the phone. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to call somebody because... I can probably trust who's at the other end. Um, now I think we're starting to move into the space, and we've seen this with uh, spoofing in terms of traffic to the PSAPs, where you can't necessarily trust where that traffic's coming from for the reasons that, uh, that Richard identified. And just in, in my, my last few seconds, um, relevant to this, you know, so with, uh, with, with the latest SSL hack, uh, my wife's Amazon account was attacked. So my last, my last resort was to go to the Internet and to uh, basically call Amazon. It's actually pretty hard to find their phone number, by the way. Um, but, but then I realized as I was making that phone call that uh, knowing what I do about DNS and DNSSEC is that uh, the DNS system could have very easily been hacked as well. And was I really talking to somebody who worked at Amazon at the other end? So I, I think this trust aspect is really foundational to where we're going. Thanks, Andrew. John? Uh, John Wright, APCO International. Um, I'm here representing the public safety side, the user side. Uh, I managed a uh, PSAP in Riverside, California, so we're used to the earthquakes. Um, and we have a combined police fire dispatch, and, and our biggest concerns are the fact that our old, old original systems were really standalone, isolated systems. Even incoming calls, they came into a to a dispatcher who answered the call and then typed in the information into a closed system, into our computer aided dispatch system. All that information is part of criminal history or criminal records or cases. Uh, that's that's stuff that has to be subpoenaed back out if somebody wants copies of audio tapes or information from the, from law enforcement or even from the fire department. And our system is only externally connected to uh, NCIC, Department of Justice, that even has to have internal uh, user authentication when we go onto those closed systems to get information about criminal records and criminal histories. 
Uh, we go so far as internally have to isolate out the fire department, which is because we dispatch police and fire through our CAD system so that they're not able to access any of the information that comes from Department of Justice. As we migrate, I think what, we're, what our fear is is that this opens us up a greater possibility of external attack. I think mostly uh, for denial of service to either interrupt law enforcement or firefighters. Uh, uh, the denial of service is typically you think of it as being on phones, but now it could be through our CAD system. It could actually try to take down our total communications while some criminal activity is going on. Uh, so we're, we're concerned about that. Uh, we also are concerned as we shift to an IP environment, uh, how will that affect our connectivity back to NCIC and DOJ, and will that have to be restructured and re-engineered, and will there be an interruption while that's occurring? Uh, that's, that's important to us. And I think there needs to be uh, a standard for public safety when it comes to cybersecurity. I think there needs to be developed a, a standard that we can say in partnership with uh, the network providers and the software providers that, and public safety that sets a standard that said this is the minimum standard we should have for security if you're dealing with a, with a PSAP. Okay, thanks, John. Brian? Um, I'm going to push back a little bit on you, Jeff. Um, uh, the uh, uh, next gen 911 networks are directly connected to the internet, um, will be directly connected to the internet, and um, we have to treat every one of our networks as if they were directly connected to the internet. Many of them will be. Um, so we need to maintain security and not assume that the fact that it's managed does anything for us. Um, so um, what keeps me up at night, however, is the fact that the current 911 system is incredibly sensitive to a deliberate attack. I can describe to you an attack, and I've seen some code that would take the entire nation's 911 network down for days, and there's not a darn thing we can do about it. If we can move to next gen 911, the avenues for attack increase, the size of the attacks will increase, but we have tools to do something about it. Um, but Having availability of tools doesn't mean that people are deploying them. And what I see going on right now is that the, the, the deployments that we have of Next Gen 911 don't take realistic attacks into account, and they, they aren't being set up in a way that would let us do the mitigation that we know how to do. And that keeps me up at night. Um, we've taken great pains in the creation of the standards to describe how we protect the networks, how we... Um, protect calls, how we protect identity, how we protect per curtain pots of data. But again, I see in many of the deployments that I'm aware of a lack of understanding of, of what's needed. I see a lot of deployment, a lot of implementations that just ignore the security mechanisms, don't use them at all. Um, and, I, and I think that we have a huge uh, education problem in explaining to um, procurers what they need to ask for, but mostly in terms of age, operating agencies, how to use the mechanisms um, if, they insist, if they insist that they that their vendors supply them. Um, and finally, um, the, the, the mechanisms that we've deployed um, depend on reliable identity, and here I'm now talking really about identity within the network, within the managed network. Um, there's a root of trust involved in that network. Um, which we've described quite carefully of how that goes on, and it has a, the root of trust is 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 vested in a in a national level uh, a certificate authority, a PKI uh, root certificate authority, and we've described what it does and how it works and who and you know, all that other stuff, and we've never figured out how to establish it. So there is no root of trust, and so you know there is no way for for somebody on one ESI net to know who anybody else on anybody else's ESI net is. Um, which I think is another thing that keeps me up at night. You must not get much sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I appreciate your, your vigorous pushback because I think that you're, you've brought up some issues that are going to lead to some really good discussion. So thank you. Um, let's see. Phil. Yeah, I, I, it's good to follow you because I can just <laughs> glom right on to what you were saying. I guess the interesting thing that – I heard Henning say earlier this morning is that one of the challenges that you face in the FCC is dealing with what consumers want and the way that consumers want to communicate. And, you know, we have all sorts of, of plans for how to roll things out. 
Uh, Richard mentioned Volte coming very soon. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of amazed at how consumers choose to communicate, and I'm wondering um, what sort of challenge that presents for dealing with public safety issues. Uh, will they communicate to us and the, or communicate to you or to communicate to the public safety providers in the way that you expect? And what kind of service will they expect, and how do you manage that? Um, another thing that nobody has mentioned so far today, but I would like to call to your attention, uh, and it's not something that really keeps me up at night, but it used to, um, and that's the transition that's going on in the Internet right now towards IP version 6. We've been working with IP version 4 for many, many years. It's established. It's uh, running out of addresses. It'll soon, there will soon no longer be addresses available in North America through the traditional resources. Um, networks in North America are rapidly transitioning to IPv6. Many of the large networks, uh, Comcast, AT&T, uh, Verizon Wireless, T-Mobile Wireless uh, are moving pretty rapidly towards IPv6. I don't know exactly how that plays into public safety, uh, but I haven't heard anybody say anything about it, and it's happening, and I imagine there are some aspects. Um, and the third thing, I think, is this is to um, build on what Brian just said. Um, you know, the, the way that you, you connect to these things are through the Internet, and the Internet, there are lots of means of protecting the Internet, but still the Internet suffers from various failures. Um, and these failures are, are not always malicious. They're not always an attack. There are fat fingering things that cause traffic to be misrouted. Uh, certainly attacks can be undertaken. Um, but that kind of thing, you know, people spend a lot of time talking about that and worrying about that. And that seems to me to be sort of a fundamental thing that's at the at the basis of uh, what keeps these things working. So sure. those are my things. I, I, I've got to, uh, to, to head to another meeting for about uh, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, to um, address or provide a couple of comments uh, in kind of reverse order. But uh, IPv6, IPv4, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, uh, IPv4, we've been surviving with natting. Uh, for some time now, but uh, uh, the use of natting then contributes to the lack of identity uh, uh, management, and it's so easy to just proxy a, a, an address uh, that we ought to look at IPv6 to say, let's be better about that now that we've got the additional address space. But then we also have the converse of that with IPv6 in that we've got a, a, um, a boundary protections that for some time now we've um, oriented around uh, uh, address space in IPv4 that's well known, and we've got the additional address space in IPv6 that, if we're not careful, will itself become a potential vector. Uh, and I think we need to uh, really uh, think through how we um, how we utilize, how we implement IPv6 from a, uh, the lens of a, a threat actor that would seek to use those additional fields uh, to. Uh, uh, obfuscate, uh, you know, an attack. Um, then on the uh, uh, privacy piece, uh, um, you, you know, we talked about the the legal um, challenges uh, associated with with data and in PSAPs for some time now. We've uh, uh, segregated off elements of the data environment uh, so that we could provide the right protections to that. Uh, I, I think uh, we still have a lot of work to do uh, in as we look forward uh, with regard to um, taking the lessons we've learned about privacy, uh, but actually then applying them in an effective way to everything over IP. Uh, we heard a lot today in the last panel about uh, the benefits of um, operating a PSAP in a cloud. Um, well, we, we need some privacy in, in, in legal protection standards uh, uh, if we're going to do that. Um, and then the, the last piece I just want to uh, touch upon as I take this, my pause is uh, I'm so glad that we let off with identity because we need to bang throughout this entire thing uh, identity uh, because I don't see a national public safety um, initiative right now to bring that together. And we need a coherent, I believe we need a coherent IDAM strategy uh, that allows us not only to, within uh, one of these managed networks, uh, uh, authenticate um, personas, uh, but we also need to authenticate non-persona entities 
uh, as we approach this Internet of Things. Uh, and so that challenge is already not being met, and it's going to get worse. Uh, and then how do we get those persona and non-persona entity identities then recognized uh, between uh, the different parts of the ecosystem that you so well described that really needs to be an end-to-end thing. And if we just look how hard and vulnerable uh, things like uh, a- a- application, exchanging application certificates and the patch the hash uh, uh, vulnerabilities, if you then uh, extend that uh, across uh, uh, several different modes, um, it, it really becomes daunting. So. Uh, uh, I, I'm hopeful that out of what we talk about today, we'll generate an item that says, hey, we got to have follow-on discussions and then action around an identity plan. So I, I, I apologize. I've got to step out, but uh, uh, Jeff is going to get much more vigorous than I ever was, <laughs> which is pretty vigorous. <laughs> thanks, Dave. Hey, Trey, you want to take it from here? Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, So I want to start off by sort of dividing the universe of, uh, as you put it, things that keep me up at night into sort of two categories. Um, The the first is uh, problems related to uh, or vulnerabilities related to uh, the transition to ultimately an all IP and all NG911 world. And then secondarily are those items that that, uh, come about as a result of being in an all IP and all NG911 world. Um, in, in, in the first camp, I, I really want to echo the, the comment that, that Rich made concerning uh, <coughs> the international uh, wholesale gateway situation, um, the lack of uh, uh, identity uh, assurances uh, in uh, SIP-based communications uh, in, in sort of today's world. Um, I would extend that one step further and to say the, the lack of um, assured location information because uh, that actually amplifies the problem in a way that is uh, or can be uniquely destructive for the public safety community in terms of uh, things like swatting, uh, you know, simulating some great emergency to divert resources away from the, the uh, uh, target of an intended attack, a physical attack. Um, in the uh, sort of future space, there are a number of things we, we start to have to worry about that, that previously were not uh, uh, problematic, things like man-in-the-middle attacks, um, uh, attacks against hosted CAD, RMS, uh, and, and call-taking uh, systems that once upon a time were, uh, and, and you know, you, you never want to say security by obscurity, but they were these peculiar boxes in, in particular basements that you just couldn't get to. So it was, it was hard to sort of um, uh, electronically damage those systems. That gets somewhat easier when there are pathways to access those that are no longer so physically controlled. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I want to echo uh, some of Brian's concerns um, while at the same time providing a little bit of added color commentary. Um, Brian is absolutely right that in order for uh, NG911 systems uh, to uh, accept the broadest possible set of originating services, they must be connected to the Internet. That does not mean necessarily that they are running on the Internet or even that the vast majority of originating services will use, as someone put it earlier, the dirty Internet. The reality is a lot of them will, but... Some of the more important ones, comparatively speaking, probably will not, at least not for the foreseeable future. That does have some impact on uh, the extent to which certain security vulnerabilities and uh, sort of early early deployment architecture decisions uh, have on overall system security. Uh, I very much share Brian's concern that uh, systems need to be deployed um, with uh, adequate uh, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, um, and that in, in particular in the NG911 functional entities, that those get deployed in a way that helps us to deal with some of the problems uh, that Rich identified. If we're not taking care to see that the border control functions uh, have uh, all of the functionalities that they need to in terms of DOS prevention, uh, in terms of uh, suspicious call identification, bad actor identification, um, if our routing proxies uh, don't add another layer to that uh, uh, to, the, to that solution, and if our sort of internally facing border functions don't add yet a third layer to that, all of them working together, that is a very big problem for the public safety community. So I would say we need to focus on making sure that 
we have the, the security components uh, in place throughout our ESI nets and our functional entities to do that. Um, the other thing, I, I absolutely share Brian's concern on uh, the, uh, the certificate authority question. That's something that I've put a lot of thought into. Uh, we have uh, been reaching out at Nina in, in, in different directions, legislatively, commercially, to try and get that done. It is a big, hairy problem. Um, it's something that we have to figure out a financial model to make work. Um, and it's, uh, but it's an important foundational thing that we've got to get done relatively soon so that we get that baked into the networks and it doesn't become something that everybody doesn't do because it isn't there and then it becomes an expensive add-on. Um, and then the, la the last item I, I want to bring up because it does sort of fall into an FCC, it's not technically a cyber issue, but it is sort of an FCC-related issue, is uh, GNSS access. Um, timing becomes incredibly important for all sorts of things when you're moving to these uh, advanced types of networks. Um, availability and reliability of uh, GNSS uh, PNT signals um, is very important uh, in the future. and It's something that we need to make sure we uh, uh, keep available for the public safety community. Okay. Thanks, Trey. Mike? Uh, hi, Jeff. Thanks. Um, I think I want to, uh, to uh, expand upon some of the thoughts that were mentioned earlier. So you talked about uh, the, the IP versus the Internet. And then uh, David kind of came by and said, well, we have the concept of a large enterprise network and how we treat that. And in an effect, I think what we're doing with the concepts of uh, FirstNet and tying together the first responders, local, state, and federal organizations together is creating a giant enterprise network. Um, and that enterprise, net enterprise network will have multiple connectivity points, uh, both you know, to each other internally and, and most importantly to the Internet as we talk about threats and risks. And those Internet connections are going to um, drive up the risks and the number of threats and types of threats that we see coming into that first responders uh, network. Uh, so to, to Phil's point, you know, consumers are going to want to use technology the way they want to use it. And I could foresee a future where um, you know, accident victims who are calling NG911 or calling 911 will use their cell phone and text in a picture of the situation or get on FaceTime or Skype and, and have live stream of the event that's unfolding with, you know, uh, not just the dispatcher, but ultimately could be the first responder. And, and in those situations, how do we evaluate the content of that traffic in near real time to make sure that it's not uh, doing something malicious to the network itself, you know, whether it's erasing data or uh, computer network attack in order to stop the, the systems from operating. Um, so that's one area is thinking about these new delivery vectors that may may enter into our world of first responders as we connect those consumers, you know, closer to them and to the dispatchers with different um, different delivery mechanisms of, of information, not just voice. Um, and then I think we also uh, somebody mentioned denial of service as we connect up more and more. Um, NG911 points to the Internet, the ability for folks to use things like botnets and, and other sources on the Internet uh, to leverage those uh, SIP and voice services to mass dial 911 uh, and potentially take the dispatchers off, offline uh, is a large risk. Um, and I think the, the final thing that I'll leave us with is that uh, with this type of new infrastructure, we face a wide variety of threats. Um, and though they range from people who just want to make a point you know, they're hacktivists and they don't believe in something or they believe in something different than what's the, the popular or the government construct at the time to um, foreign nations who uh, may leverage the, the network in an act of war against the United States. So can I uh, launch a computer network attack and dis disrupt emergency responders in order to conduct more kinetic operations, uh, domestic terrorism, uh, terrorists uh, along the same lines. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of people who just don't have enough to do with their time, right? College students, people who are bored, who are tinkering. And those tinkerers have opportunity to then, um, you know, attack networks and run experiments that could impact the, the first responders in the long run. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Jeff? Thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> my concerns are perhaps a little bit higher level. Um, everything that we're hearing here. Uh, raises flags to me as a risk manager within my organization. And I, it would be inappropriate, I think, for me to represent all of rural telecom, but I think as a rural telecom provider, I have a couple of concerns. First of all, um, I, I, I have concern regarding the level, perhaps, of attention of detail to some of the cybersecurity issues that the rural telecom industry is facing. And along those lines, uh, you know, by all means, we have very accomplished IT engineers within our organization. 
Um, but by our very nature as a small business, um, I bear the shoulders as a CFO slash risk manager and now slash cybersecurity officer for the company um, to ensure that we as an organization are doing what we can to mitigate and minimize some of these risks. And so uh, closely related to that, then, I, I worry how that might or does it affect my ability to interconnect to larger carriers um, as, we, as we talk about some of these issues. And then... Uh, similarly related to that, uh, I believe that um, my biggest concern is uh, having the ability to have a recovery model that is built upon a managed IP network as opposed to taking a TDM-based network that has a managed IP network overlay on top of that, if that makes sense. I think there are a couple of examples that I have in my mind that um, I'd be welcome or interested, I'd be willing to share as we get later on in the discussion, I think. Um, but having, especially in the rural industry, when it comes down to how do we address with some of these issues, even after we perhaps get past this hurdle of the education and having qualified people that are able to address the issues within our service areas, it's then having the funds that are necessary to be able to go ahead and implement mm -hmm. some of those so that we can extend that area of protection out into some of those rural areas. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Mark? Yeah, so going last, it's kind of hard to come up with something new, but I've, I've got, I think what I'm going to do is try to stress some things that were already already discussed. Uh, before I do that, the uh, first thing that keeps me up at night is the fact that the Redskins and the Capitals did not make the playoffs this year. <laughs> <laughs> but other than, well, Wizards actually made it. Yeah, so, Wizards um, made it. Good Na for them. Nationals should still have it. Um, <laughs> And we can only cross our fingers for the Nationals, yes. Um, but uh, above and beyond that, I think what I wanted to talk about are a couple things. Um, the circle of trust that Richard talked about, I think, is key. Um, if you think about the difference between the Internet and uh, enterprise, the real key to, to understanding how to protect an enterprise is to understand who's using the network, what access they have. We call it, in the cybersecurity world, it's called attribution. Can you attribute what someone's doing, what they're accessing to that, to that person? I think part of the problem with IP uh, protocol, whether it's v4 or v6, is they're not really designed to identify the user. They're designed to identify a machine. They identify some device that has a device in it that connects to the network. So counting on IP itself to handle identity is not a proper approach. The proper approach is to understand that identity itself uh, has to sit on top of or be in addition to the IP protocol. And so as we look at identity, we need to understand that there are new mechanisms and new standards that have to be uh, put in place to allow us to actually understand who's using the device and therefore um, what access they have to various pieces of information, uh, servers, um, cloud-based services, whatever. And, and the point here is, is that I don't think we've properly thought that through yet. Um, there are enterprises that do it well and that understand it, but it is not something that's done, especially in the public safety world, done uh, across the board. So ESINet and FirstNet, as two sort of public safety networks that are underway of being built are an opportunity for us to really push this idea of the circle of trust and having proper identity in the system. Two more things I want to mention real quick is in investment is the key. Security isn't free. And uh, someone mentioned earlier that it's a real problem uh, if we don't have standards for how uh, these systems are treated or are deployed because it's always costs money to do it, and it's always easy to cut corners, and it can really cause you some problems down the road that you don't anticipate. And the last thing is training. Being able to train the users uh, who have never been confronted with cybersecurity threats before. Do I click on this PDF file, or do I click on this, you know, this uh, executable file that uh, I got in the email? Should I click on that? How do I determine whether I should click on that? Uh, just simple basic training uh, is going to be necessary across the board in understanding the threat and how to deal with it. Good. Thanks, Mark. Okay.
Let's mix it up a little bit. Um, I wrote down about one, two, three, four, well, really four. Um, the fifth thing I wrote down was um, three words, and I don't know if I've ever heard these or not, but it's the first time I thought of them today, so I decided that it was an epiphany. The public safety enterprise, right? And, uh, and so that what we're talking about today are th ways or things that can be done to protect the public safety enterprise. And um, there's no reason to, to think of a PSAP um, in, in today's environment as anything but an enterprise. And uh, I don't know if all PSAPs, they, I'm sure they don't, if all PSAPs have chief security officers or have, have dedicated um, security staffs. I'm sure they don't. Some might. But um, uh, that's, it's worth, I'm, I'm thinking it would be a good idea to consider things from that point of view and, um, you know, what, what measures should be taking to help, help protect that enterprise from cyber, uh, from, from cyber risk or help it to strengthen its um, cybersecurity. Now, um, we talked about a few things uh, in the last half an hour or so, and one was identity. Dave mentioned it before he left. And, um, and so uh, one idea I wanted to throw out, there was a lot of concern about how will we authenticate um, callers, uh, how do we know who's calling, and, and avoid, um, you know, um, mistaken dispatches or whatever the case may be. And um, there was a concept that was being talked about a couple of years ago called NIPSTIC. It was the national, now see, this is what happens when you don't hear about something for a couple of years, but it was a, it was a, has anybody heard of it? NIPSTIC. Uh, no, 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 that's not, yeah, it's right. a different, uh, it's not that. I know what you're for, talking for about. For caller identity, we've been working on that solution. Uh, we have, we, we know how we're going to do it. Um, okay. So we're, we have to work out the details and we have to do a deployment, which of course is the really big part. But okay. um, for caller uh, a, a, a identity, I, I think we know how we're going to solve that problem. Okay. Um, we can describe it in any kind of level of detail you want, but I, that one, we're, we've got a handle on. We, I would emphasize, yes, we have a general handle on this. And um, it would be, I want to emphasize uh, some of the things that Trey as well. What we are looking at is cryptographically signing the identity of various elements, both within the public switch telephone network and ultimately public safety as well. Obviously, this is going to be big. We are talking about, in the North American numbering plan, well over 750 million entities, namely phone numbers, that would have to be cryptographically signed in a clear structure. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, how are we going to fund this? Money is the answer. What is the question? Um, why, isn't it, why is this any easier to do than BGP-SEC, which is... The, well, no, you know, excellent point, because the model that we're looking at is in fact exactly the problem that CIDR and BGP security were yeah. ultimately dealing with. Yeah. What we knew in the IP address space was that there was potentially spoofing by internet service pro malicious internet service providers doing route announcements into the BGP4 tables uh, that were not authorized to do so. Therefore, it was necessary for ISPs to sign first their autonomous systems numbers and then ultimately the blocks of addresses to which they have been assigned by the RIRs, namely RIPE, Aaron, AP, NIC, et cetera, et cetera. The consensus opinion uh, that we have in the Internet Engineering Task Force, by the way, led by Henning, who hauled us all down here last uh, yeah. year to sort of uh, <coughs> remind us of our uh, failures, um, the, the this is quite doable. And from the public switch telephone network and from the public safety network, it means that we're going to sign the SIP invite messages. Uh, we sort of know how we're going to do this. Uh, it's going to take time. 
We need to then do an X509 certificate profile and certificate revocation list and all the other sort of stuff. And then it will have to be applied somehow to the North American numbering plan under appropriate <coughs> report and order uh, that would uh, at least level the sort of playing field about how this is ultimately going to work. But it is doable. Um, it is within the realm of technology. We have the tools to do it. It's really more of an implementation issue. Um, within the ESI net, um, the standards say how identity is managed. Yeah. Um, they, they, we have a full single sign-on specification. We have um, uh, uh, we're SAML identity management uh, uh, propagation. Um, we have role-based um, uh, data access management um, uh, to control who, who gets to do what to what data, um, standardized policies, um, uh, standardized roles. Um, uh, but it depends on deployment, and it de and the deployment depends on both the, the mechanics of do the vendors implement it completely and do the PSAPs use it appropriately. Um, so we've, we've tried really hard to get the fundamentals right, to get the, 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 the technical documents to have the right mechanisms in them. Getting them deployed and used wisely looks like a much bigger problem. Brian said, uh, getting things like that deployed and used wisely is a, a big challenge. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing, and depending on your perspective within the public safety community, this is, you know, uh, a great driving, you know, factor moving things forward or the worst thing that ever happened. Um, but it, it's causing uh, local entities to look at uh, consolidation uh, in a new way. In, in, in terms of um, uh, having either the capacity internally uh, to do a lot of these things themselves and to manage them themselves, or to leverage some sort of cloud-hosted solution uh, that allows them to not have to worry about things that um, particularly smaller agencies may not have the internal expertise that they would uh, otherwise need to. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, that, that's sort of a forcing function in terms of getting these systems built out smartly, I think, um, particularly because there are a lot of aspects of it that um, just it, not out of any failure, just because the public safety has never needed these capabilities internally before, that we've just never developed them. Okay. So I guess um, what, what, I, what I'd comment is I think you really need to look at at sort of that approach of understanding public safety as an enterprise and that each of these localities is really part of an enterprise. So to have all of these standards in place is great, but as you said, it needs to be implemented. And the way it can be implemented in a common platform is to deliver it through a common platform and not let 1,000 different organizations implement their own version of it. And I know that sometimes is not popular to consolidate things like that, but consolidation uh, as long as it's done correctly, will in fact give you a common platform where the enterprise itself can have a circle of trust that is actually trusted. And you don't have to trust someone else to make sure that they did it right in order to be able to trust them because that doesn't build trust. It, it builds doubt. So consolidation uh, can be positive in a situation like that. Jeff, I want to just add on the comment, not so much about the, the identity and trust verification, but about this public safety enterprise network. And uh, we talked a lot about, um, you know, consolidation of infrastructure and connectivity, but I think the connection of people is really important. Uh, so one of the things that is the most valuable asset we have in cybersecurity net defense are the, the people who are doing the net defense, right, evaluating the content and the traffic and digging deeper and deeper into those cyber attacks that, that come into the network. So, you know, if there are 6,000 organizations today or many hundreds uh, that are looking at their PSATs, how do we combine and connect those resources, you know, whether they're IT or cybersecurity people, so that they can get a common operational view 
you know, this big giant, you know, cyber uh, situation that they've got going on across this uh, new enterprise that's being established. Because linking them and them sharing information with each other and with external communities is probably one of the more valuable things you can do in order to keep ahead of the threats. One of the things we definitely need is a C-cert. We, we need, a, a, maybe it's just 911, but I think it's probably just all public safety. We need a C-cert. Are, are you volunteering? <laughs> I, I actually talked to the U.S. CERT guys about what it would take to set one up. They're very, very willing, and they have funding to help get these things started. But uh -huh. once again, who runs it? Where are the, you know, who, who's going to fund? I mean, you're, you're talking about people, you're going to have more than one or two or three people who are on a full-time basis and a set of probably a, a much larger set of people that can be called in when, when attacks occur. Um, but you need the organization. Um, and, I mean, I did spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out how to do this, but I ran into the same thing that we have with the PCA, right? You, you, you have to have some organization that will, will, will hold it, um, and I, I couldn't figure out who would do that. I wanted to highlight as well, because we, we've been having a lot of discussion around, um, you know, in, encryption and, and certificates, essentially. And, and I would agree that's an important aspect of it. Uh, but if you don't have useful repu reputation information for people at either end, then based on the fact that the definition of service provider and who can participate in the communications network is pretty loose, um, you really don't know who's coming in the other end. So, you know, all, all it means is, you know, you have a nice encrypted tunnel to the cartel of malfeasance, um, you know, which, I, I, you know, in the end doesn't really accomplish the goal. I mean, I, I noticed, you know, Google has made a pretty public announcement around, you know, basically raising in the search results encrypted sites. And, you know, so there's a whole bunch of companies, some of which do well and some of which don't, who are scrambling to become encrypted, right? Um, the technology by itself, without reputation information, doesn't give you what you need. You, you have to have both. Because then you can make a choice. And once you've made that choice, then you can be guaranteed that you're, you know, connected through an encrypted tunnel to the person that you want to, or, you know, agency or whatever that you want to. Jeff, let me add to that a little bit. Um, the, the idea of reputation data, uh, for those of us who've gotten around the whiteboard and tried to kick around some ideas here, the idea is that if we can put some form of PKI in the phone network itself, can this the reputation data be actually visually displayed to the consumer? And this is, you know, again, more of an expansion. The, the idea would be, a, a network provider has some level of trust of the call coming in or transversing his network. In his evaluation, he is able to then pass it to the consumer display on his phone or to the PSAP itself, namely, I'm AT&T, I got this call from T-Mobile, I trust T-Mobile, you should trust this call, or something, something along those lines. This would involve an expansion of what we typically know as CNAM, uh, caller display name. Right now, CNAM is only 15 characters worth of ASCII. Um, and this is really, really important if we talk about the expansion of uh, alerts. I mean, how do I know the alert is really coming from the Montgomery County Public Service Bureau or <coughs> West Texas? You know, the, Dallas Police Department or the National Weather Service, for instance. The idea that the network could validate the source origin of the alert and then display that to the consumer in a fashion to which <coughs> restores trust in the system is one other idea that's being kicked around. <coughs> and then the other one is, <coughs> I know Trey <coughs> is extremely concerned about this, but the attack vectors that we have seen right now typically come at DMARCs between the networks. And <clears throat> we need to get a grip on these international wholesale gateways in some way, shape, or form. There's some other ideas that are being kicked around. Uh, certain smaller carriers are not going to like what we've got in mind. But one of the ideas is to require that the international call gateway has what is known as a pseudo-ante. Um, and that if the 
if no ante is available for the inbound traffic, a number would be assigned to it that will allow a track and trace back to the source of origin. The, uh, what we were hoping to do is to get the North American numbering plan to uh, uh, reserve 666 as the area code for this. <laughs> 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 I don't. <coughs> well, I wouldn't want to use seven seven seven, no, but no, uh, no, no. Uh, but but again, a, a special portion of the North American numbering plan that is currently unused, where a relatively small database would be enabled here at the commission that that links the or, the the I, the owner of the gateway uh, to in fact where this track is uh, traffic is coming from which will allow enforcement authorities to, to go backwards, so to speak. Trey, does that make sense to you? No, I, I haven't you know, had an opportunity to look at the details, obviously, but just the, it, from your verbal description, that looks like at least one way to get back to uh, uh, the, the right party uh, when you have a problem like this. Right. I, more generally, though, I think that idea, um, uh, coupled with the other thing that you mentioned, uh, it deals with um, sort of a, 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 and something the gentleman to my left mentioned as well, um, d deals with, with a, a, an important point where the, there's uh, sort of a nexus between uh, the enduring values of interconnection and public safety that the chairman likes to talk about, which is um, it, it really should be, you know, interconnection rights really need to depend in some way on uh, uh, trust or at least or, or compliance with some uh, norms of, uh, of, uh, of trust and security and, and some norms of standards compliance. Um, in other words, uh, it, you know, if you have some wacky thing that you've come up with and you just you want to kind of dump it in the laps of public safety or some other carrier, uh, I, I don't think anyone would, would say you should have some unfettered right to do that. And I think this is one of the areas where by saying, look, there, there are network norms that everybody kind of has to keep to um, but before we get into the business of, of plugging things up together, um, you know, that, that would help keep out a lot of these types of problems on a going forward basis. Okay. Let me – thanks, everybody, for that, for that discussion. And we might return to it. Um, I want to – uh, move to a, a slightly different topic now, and that is um, uh, cyber risk management, um, enterprise risk management, the, the kind of thing that a CFO would worry about, um, and um, and in particular, um, how those processes differ for different organizations, a PSAP enterprise versus maybe a small carrier versus a larger carrier. Um, we have now as I mentioned earlier, this um, cybersecurity framework that NIST has released, which is um, it, it uh, describes or lays out a set of um, uh, sort of informative references, uh, standards, and so forth. But more importantly, it gives an overall uh, holistic framework, a risk management framework. It's, it's, not a, it's not intended to be focused, I don't think, at, at the best practice level. It's intended to be focused at the risk level and, and the management of risk. And so what I wanted to ask is, what's your perspective on how this migration to IP-based networks for emergency services, how does, the, how does, uh, how does your work um, and risk management change? What do you worry about more now than you did before? Well, as a, Jeff, as a rural provider, I think I, I'd like to go ahead and start that conversation off. Um, in honesty, I think we found the framework to be of great help uh, to us. Uh, when the preliminary framework was released, we uh, pulled it out. We knew that there was an opportunity for comment and feedback, and given some of my background and others within our organization, we felt like it was important to be on the front end of it. So we pulled out the preliminary framework. We used it to essentially conduct a gap analysis within our organization. It helped us ask some questions that uh, perhaps we didn't really think of before. Just anecdotally, we talk about this conversion from D TDM to IP-based uh, networks and communications. In our particular area, maybe we're unique, maybe we're not, I don't know, but we, we live in the mountains, up in a valley in the mountains. From a 
strength of network perspective, we've established dual redundant routes in and out of the valley. Um, but because where we are in the rural nature of our, of our area, those dual redundant routes come back and meet at a center point. And so where there's a separation between TDM and IP communications, um, we feel that historically we've been able to preserve and protect some of the public safety communications that it relied upon the TDM network. When we went through the, um, the preliminary framework and started asking some of the questions that came as a result of it, we started to realize that if everything was over IP and we had a DDoS attack, for, uh, for instance, that was specifically targeted for our organization, that the fact that we had dual redundant routes really didn't protect us because they all came back to a common point. And so we found in a very real way that uh, we might have to literally get somebody in a car and drive two hours to where the next point of communication might be to then tell them to shut off or sync the, the DDoS uh, traffic, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm getting into some technical areas I don't know a lot about. But, but the issue is, is that this, um, it put us at a heightened sense of risk. And we found that out as a result of going through those preliminary um, that, that preliminary framework discussion. In addition to that, I think we found great help to it in the sense that uh, in addition to marking off uh, the NIST's recommended analysis of what is high probability versus high consequence, uh, we added our own column in there. We, we assessed on a stoplight analysis as to where we felt like we were on each of those issues, whether we were needed some severe implementation. Mm -hmm. Maybe we were part of the way there. Maybe in other areas we felt like we were doing good. But then we added an element of estimated cost to be able to close that gap. And what we found in the process is, is that there were some of those areas where maybe we were severely deficient, but the cost of implementation was fairly minimal, and we could act on it immediately. In other cases, perhaps uh, we had to make some business decisions. There was maybe a very low likelihood of occurrence. Maybe there was a high consequence and we are part of the way there, but the cost of implementation to get to where we felt like it needed to be to be at a higher level of satisfaction, um, w those were a little bit harder for us to decide because we had to really make some business cases with a, in an environment of limited resources. And so um, we used that framework uh, as a way of starting conversations within our organization, not only to just say uh, from an IT engineer's perspective of check marks of what might be good security practices, to rather, in fact, gravitate toward an overarching cybersecurity plan within our organization. That's, I mean, that sounds exactly the way I've, I've heard it used in other places. I have, a, I have a question for you just as follow-up. Have you found it to be useful? in um, uh, uh, stimulating conversations with your suppliers so that, you know, you basically could go to them and say, look, this is how we stack up against the framework. Show us how you look. And in and, and, and doing so, sort of creating this uh, chain of, uh, of better improved security with, between you and your suppliers. Um, absolutely. I, I wish I could go perhaps into some greater detail in terms of what those conversations were, but I do know that... Um, I think we're facing some of the same issues that many other rural telephone providers are, which is that um, TDM-based equipment is becoming somewhat antiquated and in many cases no longer supported or even available. So we can talk about um, what happens if we move to an IP network, mm -hmm. but I think we're perhaps fooling ourselves if we think that it's an if. I think it's a when. And so it's just a matter of when we get there and are we going to prepared, be prepared to do it. So when we sit down with... Um, with vendors, with electronic suppliers, for instance, and talk about the capabilities that those electronics might provide as data trans transfers over our existing network, yeah, absolutely. We, we throw in that element into the conversation to help identify what they are able to provide to help minimize some of those risks, such as the, the DDoS example I provided earlier. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. Mike? So, uh, Jeff, I think, you know, at Lockheed Martin, we're very big supporters of the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. And uh, I think I'll challenge your thought a little bit that, you know, how do you manage risk differently? I don't think you manage risk differently. I think you leverage that framework 
regardless of whether you're dealing with an IP network, a SCADA system, or, or something else. I think what's different, and, and to your point a second ago, is what's your risk acceptance model? Right? And, you know, I like your, your, your traffic light protocol kind of example there. So you're going to manage risk a lot differently, right? So in a um, corporate enterprise, if we're you know, looking at email coming in and we're worried about something malicious, um, if we block that email, um, there's limited uh, real-time impact to that decision. But if we block a uh, MMMS message being sent by somebody calling NG911 to dispatcher because we think it's malicious, that could have you know, you know, severe consequences. So you know, we've got to look carefully and, and you know, how do we you know, find Richard's uh, you know, 666 uh, cyber devils and cyber zombies and you know, can we identify them a little bit maybe through identity so that we have a little less, less risk on what we're accepting uh, in terms of the blocking and tackling of things coming in and out of the uh, public safety enterprise. So I think the risk acceptance part is the, the different part and the risk management part is, is similar. Okay. Yeah, along those lines, maybe maybe just one comment because I I, I would agree. I, I think the the, the um, cybersecurity framework is quite useful in terms of that assessment. Um, there's also an activity within Department of Homeland Security, the the C Cube Voluntary Program, which really emphasizes um, three things. Um, you know the those community resources within um, critical infrastructure. So having resources that people can uh, can can share and use. Um, I, obviously, uh, for that community. Um, the, the second is um, being able to connect um, critical infrastructure stakeholders um, to national uh, resilient to the national resiliency effort, um, where there there's advocacy uh, awareness of those specific issues. So, so there's you know, and then the last one as well, which is um, you know the the coordination of that um, critical infrastructure response. And, and I think those go hand in hand. Uh, the, the NIST framework really helps you assess what your risks are, um, and, and then the, there's a you know complementary track that uh, helps you with uh, what to do about those. Maybe, because I, I think maybe just one other observation, you know, in, in line with uh, I, I think it was uh, Jeff's comments about we're going to get to all IP. So so as we do that, and just my experience with technology is. You, you start in the zone where you have experts, right? And you, you have to be kind of a hardcore security person, technical person. We're getting much closer to the space where, you know, my 71-year-old mother better be able to figure this stuff out because the PSDN, which she's known forever, is not going to be there anymore. And if it's complicated, people just aren't going to get it. So, so some of this is, you know, how do we make this very consumable so it, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to implement, and, and we have the, the tools that can be shared uh, so that can, people can work together solving this problem. The other thing I wanted to add um, is it takes a village. Uh, and what I mean by that is you're a, you're a rural carrier and you did your risk analysis, and that's great, and you should. But that if each uh, individual organization, uh, even within, say, the ESN uh, or, or the, the public safety network, does their analysis uh, at the local level, un unless there's a layered approach where the state, for instance, looks at its, you know, risk, and then flows down to the lower organizations, uh, at least some kind of knowledge of the risks that are important to the state. Um, and then even at the national level, you know, so it starts with DHS and with our other organizations flowing down even to the states what some of the risks are. And there needs to be a pipeline for those risks to be managed all the way up the chain um, so that we're uh, communicating uh, layer to layer and making sure that if the, if the uh, situation changes, because it will, that we're able to respond to that quickly because as, as we just saw in the newspaper a couple of days ago, some major impacts can happen with the most, what we thought we were protected against that can actually change uh, without, you know, without warning. And, and we need to be able to have a, a quick response. And especially in the public safety world, we're going to have to build an infrastructure uh, that goes all the way from, you know, uh, our civil government all the way down to our state and local government. 
Okay, thanks, Mark. I want to return now to this idea that we talked about of a public safety enterprise. And uh, the public safety enterprise is um, tends to be the, the, the unit is the PSAP. I mean, I tend to think of it as the PSAP. PSAPs come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Some are large, some are very small. I think I'm, I'm going to say most are very small. Yeah, so that's right. So, <laughs> so that's that's pretty small. So now, so the question I have is, when I was listening to Trey, some of the things that Trey said caused me to think that um, a peace app to be um, to manage risk in the world that we're moving to really needs some pretty sophisticated expertise available on role, you know however the, the piece that comes by it. And and I'm wondering, this, and it also gets to a, a, a discussion we had earlier about scale of PSAPs, is like what does this mean to how a PSAP manages risk when so much expertise is required? That may not be resident in the vast majority of PSAPs today. What does that mean? Yeah, and this was exactly my, my point before. Um, as uh, it was pointed out this morning, 80% uh, of the PSAPs, five or less uh, call-taking positions. Obviously, their staffs are a little larger than that. Um, there's a near them. I think the fraction is almost that big that only have two or three call taking positions total. Um, in an organization that size, with a, a span of control that's stretched as far as you can stretch it to maybe you know ten people per supervisor or something, um, you really just don't have typically the financial bandwidth to have a cybersecurity expert resident on staff. And unlike in the old days where uh, things like that weren't a problem because you had your friendly neighborhood telephone company who just did everything for you. It doesn't work that way anymore. I mean, you know, the, the, the carrier provides connectivity, but connectivity isn't the, the be-all and end-all because, again, we have, you know, disaggregated access networks and originating services. We have disaggregated service providers. You may be buying connectivity from one person, system services from someone else, data storage from someone else, and so on. Um, the good news is that typically those individual entities provide so, at least some support um, and uh, sort of take away the task of managing every little piece of this at the local level. Um, the bad news is that you then lose some transparency into, well, what are all of my counterparties doing? You know, are they, are they doing uh, all the things that they need to be? Um, and I think the, the Heartbleed vulnerability has recently exposed the extent to which um, uh, you know, even large organizations can sometimes have gaping vulnerabilities. Um, the challenge, I think, is getting to some sort of model, whether it's uh, a, a regionalized or a sort of statewide model, where you have a large enough uh, sort of scope of view uh, to afford some experts, um, or where you, you move to a model where you, you sort of reasonably say um, that there are certain trusted counterparties that, that I can go to, uh, to to buy services uh, based on, you know, sort of the generalized opinion of the community. Um, but, uh, you know, at the local level, it is absolutely, and, I, and, and John, you would know better than me, having been in the PSAP yourself, how, how many folks do you think, you know, in, in the average PSAP would actually have uh, cybersecurity expertise? Well, actually, in the, uh, I come from one of the 20 percent agencies. Um, that uh, we have our own city IT department who manages our our infrastructure, and uh, and they call it the the enterprise, and then they run that. The city's infrastructure is on there, but even our uh, 911 center and our data and everything is even isolated out within that 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 enterprise. Um, and but we do have people that come in. They do the the security updates. They do all the things on the terminals to make sure that we're as up to date as possible. And and one of the things I did notice is that we talked about it like as a, a closed enterprise. But as we go to NG 911 and now we start talking about taking video and we talk taking pictures. Those are coming into that closed system. Even if we're displaying them separately, as soon as that incident commander says, send that to my terminal, 
we're done. Because if, if there's something embedded, guess where that just went? You can't treat it. You, so, but yet he needs it because it's giving him exactly what they need. They're watching a bank robbery in progress, getting video from a bank. Mm-hmm. So you can sandbox it, but you can't exclude it. Right? Yeah, I, I think I think why we're talking about making these isolated systems, you have to realize in the real world stuff's going to come in, and sooner or later they're going to get you. So we have to be proactive. We have to be out there watching for that. I, I think the, the we talk a lot about regionalization and consolidation at regional level in order to get enough scope to to get some of these things to get happen. I'm I'm actually worried that region is not enough. Um, I think that if you take most county security officers and you said SAML to them, which is kind of the basis of, of one of the, the things, they would say, what? How do you spell that? Um, and um, I think that we really seriously have to be looking at state level. Um, and there, I think you have enough scope even in the smaller states that you can afford to hire the right kind of level person to con- can contribute to this. Now, does he have to have absolute control over this stuff? No, but he, he, he can be, we can have resources that are available and some mechanisms that are, you know, that are available um, at, at that level to, to make it work. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of push your envelope just a little bit. Um, because I wanted to make sure that I, I got this notion in. One of the things I said in my, my first, uh, you know, what things that keep me up at night um, have to do with uh, the, the scale that we're deploying defenses for mitigation. Um, and, and here again, I, I see, what I see is individual PSAP or regional PSAP, regional deployments of ESI nets. Um, my company, among other things, has DOS mitigation service. We are regularly knocking down 300 gig attacks. 300 gigs. Our current planning is for one terabit attacks. That means that your ESI net must have mitigation capacity to withstand currently a 300 gig attack. What county can afford that? Well, most states, again, with enough aggregation, probably can 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 think about that level of mitigation in, in, in their systems. We need to be thinking that big. It's really that bad because those are the attacks we're seeing right now. I'm saying it's an enterprise. The comments we, we, we've heard, right, you, uh, we, I work in a very large-scale enterprise. I've consulted the large enterprises and, and large government agencies, and you've got to link your subject matter experts together. You've got to bring them together in a uniform team. You know, Brian, uh, you know, mentioned a CSERT or CSOC or whatever acronym you want to give it, but you've got to have a team of people, I think, as these networks converge together that are that have as much visibility into those ingress and egress points as possible, right? So in your local le- le- level today, I mean, if we, we take it back to the, you know, the, the physical world, you know, your, your PSAPs are looking at something very small, right? You know, they're looking at a, you know, a, a you know, a, a Mini Cooper or something, right? You know, very small scale where you, you got this, uh, when you connect them all together, you got your, you know, the biggest thing you can think of, right? A cyber battleship or something like that, right? It's just enormous infrastructure and you want to have good visibility uh, across that giant infrastructure and you want to have a team of experts who have the ability to have access and visibility into that entire entire surface who can who can work together and understand you know the, the what the deep technical things are know what a saml is and and know what a you know how to look for a cyber attack and understand ddos at enterprise scale right so i think it's really important if we can help to shape that is to to form your group of net defenders that uh, looks after the entire enterprise and not you know uh, very isolated down looking at something very small right <laughs> I think if you if you look at where industry's gone with their enterprises, this is exactly where they've gone. I mean, if you look at some something like even my company, you know, many years ago we might have had an IT guy at every facility, and we have hundreds of facilities across the country. But what we realized, and I'm sure other agent, uh, organizations like ours in this room had realized, is is that the expertise needed to protect that that enterprise was fairly uh, sophisticated and that the threat was changing quickly and so you really really needed to uh, not have you know an office of five people have try to have the expertise at every one of those sites because the costs are just unmanageable and the protection the uh, protection vector that you have to protect is unmanageable so 
I think what we're saying is kind of, I think all of us are kind of saying the same thing, that yes, we understand that there needs to be autonomy at each of these PSAPs, but when you start talking about a cyber protection uh, uh, strategy, you need to really look at a more consolidated approach. And, and, and uh, live this dream uh, on, a, on a global basis uh, with uh, a, a similar federated and cats and dogs that don't want to play well together and all have their own budget uh, in a formal life. Um, I, I couldn't agree more uh, and would uh, extend this to say that it's, it's not just an enterprise approach to your cyber defenders, but that needs to be tied with an IT strategy. Right. And that's not to say that everyone then needs to put all their IT money in a bucket right. and share it, but there are certain high-value assets, uh, cyber assets, uh, that uh, uh, we will want to reduce attack surface. I'll just use identity as an example. If we're storing certificates and managing certificates 6,400 different times for 6,400 PSAPs and think we're going to have an effective, defendable identity uh, a construct, we're fooling ourselves. Uh, so uh, maybe we look at identity and say, hey, that's one of the things we're going to pull up into a public safety uh, identity structure that says uh, we're going to have something that's enterprise from a, at a national level uh, around uh, uh, certificate uh, storage, key management uh, associated with, with those key elements of the uh, 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 authentication in that end-to-end -end sphere, uh, th then we ought to consider that. And also, I... I'm not disagreeing with everything that's being said, but I think there's a couple of other points worth bringing out for consideration. Um, and all I can speak to is anecdotally what I'm observing within our own service area. We, we're talking about the fact that some of these PSAPs may not have enough funds to get cybersecurity expertise within their organization. And what I'm actually seeing is that in some of these cases, they're actually whittling down IT staff. And so it's not just a matter of getting support to them. They're looking at replacement models. And so for us as a, as a rural telecom provider in the area, we're getting some of these PSAPs that are turning to us in state, or not state, but um, uh, certainly city and in some cases even county or school district resources that are turning to us saying we would like to leverage perhaps on some of your expertise. And so to Trey's comment about how in the old days uh, the PSAPs just had the phone system that they could rely on and their communication network was basic in the sense that it was just picking up a phone and making a call. Um, while, yes, I agree that has been changed, my observation is, is that these PSAPs are still turning to the service providers for some level of confidence that regardless of what system they may be running, there's going to be a level of confidence that they're going to be able to communicate on to it. So they are turning to the service providers for that type of assistance, including, uh, in some cases, even application management. And, of course, then we have these challenges of working through... Um, you know, we can't, as a service provider, be held accountable or, or responsible for what they choose to put on the networks that they're using. That is where perhaps you draw upon some other resources for some assistance in making those evaluation decisions. But certainly with what's being communicated and sent over it, that is something that we're already having to address. And so they're turning to us for that. And the other comment I'd just say is we can talk about centralizing these things, um, but we know from uh, enterprise military, whatever organization you want to call it, the farther away you get from the front line, the more you get towards strategy and policy and guidelines. And what's on the ground is where the, the action is taking place. And if you don't have resources that are there, whether it be within the organization or somehow mm -hmm. state or region assigned to be there or through telco providers or, or, or communications providers, I should say, because it could be in a number of, of delivery methods, um, there, there's going to be some failure points. Along those lines, just to kind of build on that, uh, while I would agree that centralized establishment of best practices are very valuable because at the end of the day most of these organizations don't have lab resources and testing and that sort of thing, a lot of the implementation will have to occur at a very local level. 
right? Somebody has to make sure the patches got applied, that um, the, the best practices were implemented in terms of network security. And I, I, I think it's probably unreasonable to believe that that would occur at a highly centralized level, especially across what are effectively multiple legal entities. The, the other, uh, and, and it's not really a point, but, but maybe just a question, it's uh, to, to, to Brian's comment from earlier. Um, and that's, so why exactly did we build a network that allows 300 gig denial of service attacks? And is that the network that we meant to build? What can we, you know, what can we do to, to actually mitigate that? Because if you look at the amount of email that isn't valid, and then you look at what's happening with the phone system with robocalling and identity spoofing, um, we have a very massive problem on our hands. And we can continue to build solutions that, you know, kind of ignore the white elephant in the room, or we can go after the heart of the identity and reputation issue. Um, and, and stop building networks that, you know, have to, have to be able to re respond to the, the, those sorts of attacks. So uh, they, there's certainly a balance. I think we have to be well defended, um, but we have to understand the root of the problem as well. We didn't build a network to do cat videos either. <laughs> so it's very useful for that. I mean, it, it, that's what people want to do. People I, don't want to do 300 uh, gigabit well, denial of service. Well, it, it, it actually goes there was a, a problem that um, was brought up earlier, which is during a time of a public emergency, how do you actually deal with load shedding? And do you call up Netflix and go turn it off pretty quickly? or Hulu or, you know, YouTube. I mean, that would shed a lot of load very, very quickly right there. Yeah, and, and in my mind, that is coupled with uh, an identity schema uh, because you can't really credibly uh, do that uh, across all the things that would generate um, large content uh, without the ability to say, I've identified this content that needs to go through, uh, and now I've told my devices, uh, recognize those attributes and control in such a way where it allows that to go but exclude the others, uh, that it, it, unless you can do that with the public safety uh, community assets, persona and, and non-persona entities, uh, then you, you know, you, you're you not going to be able to go into some kind of voluntary ask people to stop downloading the cat videos. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we do have specified um, how to mark traffic appropriately, and within the ESI nets, again, what the standards say, as opposed to what might be implemented, um, have the appropriate mechanisms to prioritize the traffic appropriately. Um, within the nets? Within the ESI net, yes. But not between nets? Well... Between ESI nets, we could manage. It's between the public networks yep. and the ESI net where the majority of those networks don't have mechanisms for maintaining markings across networks. Yeah, but something like uh, uh, SAML assertions that we would rapidly be able to, uh, in a situationally dependent way, uh, yeah, I don't think we into really need to go that far, but it depends on the environment that we're talking about. I mean, m mostly I think you need to be able to say, look, this is a 911 call and this is video traffic or, you know, entertainment traffic, yeah. and, 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 and have some assurance that it's marked correctly, you know, some policing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, our, our current understanding is that it's pretty hard to maintain that from the public networks to the ESI nets. We're, we're fairly sure we, we can, again, I, I worry a lot about what is being deployed. A lot of times what happens is that you get some service provider who has a network that does not have DiffServ deployed on it, and they go and sell the agency their services for the ESI net, and they conveniently forget the little section that says, Here's how all the disturbed code points are, and here's what the priorities ought to be, and blah, blah, blah. So we have to have ways. This sort of gets to another thing of, of you know, people talk about certification. I hate that word. I really don't like it. But <laughs> there needs to be a way for a state agency or the FCC or even, even, even a carrier trying to 
you know, it, we, we've talked in various ways about uh, you know, when when do carriers need, when do service providers need to support NG911? And one of those things is, well, that there is an appropriate ESI net in order to send the traffic. Well, what does that mean? We need ways of knowing whether these things have been deployed correctly. We need ways of checking to make sure that the right things are going on um, and, and that, you know, when the inevitable attack comes, we're ready for it. So, so Brian brings up a couple of really good technical sort of lower level technical points on that. I, I think the broader point is um, it, it, telecommunications is now much more of an ecosystem than it is a single network. And there are going to be responsibilities, I think, from the standpoint of uh, the access network and, and, and moreover sort of the, and I hesitate to use the term because it's not really applicable, but sort of inter-exchange networks, the, the sort of interconnecting networks, to say, okay, this 300 gigabits of traffic coming from a single source suddenly bound for the edge of a 911 system uh, is probably a bad idea, so let's stop that sooner rather than later. In other words, let, what, you know, why do we need to get that to the point of needing the border defense to, to deal with it? Um, you know, th there comes some point where, you know, that's not possible if the attack is, uh, the attack is sufficiently distributed, but for attacks that aren't, it, it, it's relatively straightforward, I think, to just say, okay, we, we don't need to get that as far as, uh, as far as it's going, and we can start to push back the point where we stop it, um, to where ultimately it, you know, it's, it's the, the, the first link. The, uh, the issue they're bringing up here is a question of, uh, what, when you're doing an interconnection between these various entities, you're basically saying there's there's a line, clause 24, section B, you know, subsection 5, that says, please respect our diff serve code points. Uh, because the problem is that the DMARC between two autonomous systems, and so you have to say, I have kept a quality of service up until this point. You have to agree to maintain the same quality of service at your point. And so what we, we, we see now is there's a great deal of SIP interconnection among the service providers. You know, you know, Verizon actually now peers with um, Comcast directly via SIP, <clears throat> and there's no PSTN. And so in the little contracts or the agreements that they have with them, you know, voluntary interconnection, they basically said, I will maintain the quality of service here. You will maintain the quality of service there. You will monitor your network, I'll monitor your network, and if there's a problem, you know, uh, here's my phone number. And th these are the kinds of agreements that once uh, Comcast wants to sign an agreement with Fairfax County saying, okay, give us all of your 911 as SIP. They're going to have to come up, and this is where, you know, Nina is going to be very, very influential, is saying, here are all the little things that, you, you know, you know, Fairfax County needs to do, and you, Comcast, need to do all of these little things as well. And guess what? It will simply work. You know, we actually know how this works right now. But why should Fairfax County, though, have to do that uniquely in a, their contract arrangement uh, with, with Verizon? Uh, why doesn't that become a 911 standard? I think it, it, it should. Yes. It should. We, yeah. need operation, we need operational standards. We need deployment standards um, that, we can, with that, that yes. agencies can refer to. I, I agree with that. And we're, we've done a fairly poor job of that. We have the technical standards. We don't have, the, we don't have model RFPs. We don't have um, performance standards. We have, we've done very little on that. We've, we've talked about it. We haven't done it. But the good, the good news is, at least in the modern PSDN transition, We've actually come quite a ways so far. We actually know what some of these sort of agreements look like. We've seen the checklists, which RFCs do you support, which uh, protocols do you, are, you know, must, may, should, how are you handling quality of service guarantees and stuff like that. We actually now have a pretty decent body of evidence on how this is done. So that, that is encouraging, and, and that makes me feel like we, we can – see a goal point there with regard to a, a na nationwide standard for that. Um, but implementation is just the first part. Sustainment is uh, can be uh, a more challenging part. Um, and in order to sustain that, sustain, sustain that effectively, I believe that the, some degree of continuous monitoring uh, 
yeah. needs to be in place. We've, that we've tried we've tried putting in to the standards um, test mechanisms, but we've done it on kind of an individual. How do you know? How, do, how does an individual know that a, that if he placed a 911 call at this time, it would work? Um, we need similar mechanisms within the networks to know, you know, well, if I got a 10,000 calls that came in in this network, would it work? Mm -hmm. um, that I think that's a very interesting um, area that we have not explored. You know, we've done a lot of things. That's one of the things we haven't done. Yeah, it'd be great to have a, a test module that we could uh, uh, say, hey, let, we're doing a stress test. Yeah. Uh, this part of the network, uh, it will simulate for the next uh, uh, three minutes uh, uh, capacity and then over capacity uh, 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 traffic and let, let's see how it responds. In order to, to be able to do that in a repeatable and, and, and right. transparent way, uh, you know, right. I, I think something like that uh, will need to be in place for a sustainment paradigm for which we c all understand the accepted risk. Right. Can I add one thing to, to Richard's point? Um, and this, I brought this up a couple of times today, and I, and I think it's a very important key point. The, the two parties that Rich mentioned in his example are both integrated service providers. They provide both the access network and the originating service. That won't always be the case, and I think it's going to – one of the big challenges is making sure that those sorts of agreements are not only possible but routine or even systematized so you don't have to have, you know, some big long-form contract – so that a non-carrier voice service provider can have their diff serve uh, code points respected as their packets transit someone else's physical network. I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, as we, one of my, you know, my initial concern that Jeff invited us to share today was this interconnectivity and my ability as a rural provider to connect to others. And I think standards are at the base of it. Um, in a real general sense, uh, under the under the TDM based uh, telecommunications network and the existing recovery model that exists for rural telephone providers, it, it's not necessarily required by law. But there are limitations to larger carriers that will they, they they cannot deny connectivity agreements for TDM communications. But on IP based, it's all down to entering into these types of agreements, whether it be um, providing these services and being the endpoint. Um, or somewhere along the line, one piece of it. And so I think standards um, and an ability to demonstrate that an organization is, is maintaining those standards is key to that because then it, it, um, it puts everybody essentially, uh, from a competitive nature, it puts everybody in the same playing field, but from a trust perspective within the circle, it helps ensure that there's some level of confidence that further down the line, um, or at the end, uh, we're going to be able to maintain those those standards. The other thing I just want to touch briefly on, um, Admiral Simpson, you mentioned the um, the continuous monitoring element. One of the things that we've thought about lot, a lot as a result of going through that preliminary um, cybersecurity framework that NIST had released, and and in connection with the executive order, there was a number of incentives that were identified um, to to try and promote the industry or, or encourage the industry to adopt some of these things and increase their own cybersecurity posture. Um, you and I have visited about this briefly before, but I know that you know these things range anywhere from providing um, accolades, if you will, or recognition for entities that are doing well. I don't believe that's a direction we should take. Uh, quite frankly, I don't want the target painted on my back. Um, so that, in my mind, it's not truly a disincentive, but it, it is a meaningless or, or hurtful incentive, if you will. Um, and then along the way, there's, of course, um, resources that are available to help. That's one of the incentives that were called out, and that's been something that has been very helpful to us. Whether it be the NIST framework or any other that's provided by industry, it, it doesn't matter so much as it's something that's there to help me, and, and that is a very useful incentive, I would say. On the other end of the spectrum, there's some financial ones that were called out. Um, grants in particular was one that was mentioned. Um, I believe that grants um, create three problems um, in this transition. Um, specifically, I think by their very nature, grants are selective. And so you could have a situation where um, perhaps someone is in greater need than another, but you award grant dollars to that one versus the other, or maybe even flip it. 
uh, the one that's in not as great a need perhaps are better grant writers and are able to earn those funds that are available from grants and then leaving the others at risk. I think um, the, the model of a grant award process um, could perhaps delay implementation of cybersecurity improvements because um, as an organization, we're concerned about it. So on many of these things, we're spending our own dime. But uh, my neighbor, who may not be willing to spend his own dime, once that notification comes out that grant dollars might be available, they're going to wait until they can get some grant award notification. And do we really want to – is that consistent with perhaps the sense of urgency that we feel that's there? And then finally, grant dollars, by their very nature, I think are designed to improve an infrastructure, if you will. It's a one-time funding. And um, you mentioned this concern of the continuous monitoring. We believe that's where the great risk is. And so this is why I would favor on the incentive side changing that recovery model to be able to accommodate cyber se specifically cybersecurity efforts designed toward continuous monitoring so that we have the ability to address it on an ongoing basis because it's not a one-time risk and it's not a one-time expense. Yeah, Jeff, those are, are very uh, constructive inputs, uh, and I think we definitely need to look at that uh, under Title II. Uh, one of the things that uh, the, the protections in the TDM world that provided was the uh, unbundling of the services. Services had to be able to provide it to you and be able to then be sold wholesale to you, mm -hmm. that you had to, to be able to uh, uh, utilize then all the separable aspects of that service uh, it, it had a, a rate construct built in so that you could sustain the required security elements associated at, uh, with that. So uh, it, if we're going to go down the path of 706 um, and have uh, this continue to be best level of effort service, uh, we, we will need to do something to account for uh, how the rural telcos uh, ensured that their systems were as robust as what they were connecting to right. uh, and uh, didn't become uh, the, the threat vectors uh, uh, that, uh, uh, oh, my God, I don't want to connect to those guys anymore because uh, they're rural and they're small, they have a few people. So we'll, we'll want to follow up on all those. Yeah, thank you. And, and to that point, I think it's important to qualify my comment, too, that I believe it needs to be an industry-based standard adoption rather than a mandated yeah. Um, there's a number of reasons why. Um, if everybody's interested in my opinion, I'd share it. Otherwise, I'll maybe visit with you about it afterwards. Yeah, and, and I didn't mean to take a side uh, either way on what the right um, uh, uh, policy driver would be, but just that we have to account for it. Right. Uh, right. Uh, because you're going to lose revenue um, in the transition that was being put towards these things, and we've got to figure out how to ensure that the security of interconnects doesn't suffer. I like I, uh, along those lines. So, because I, I, I think there's two aspects of this conversation. One of which is, uh, and actually the SIP forum and ATIS are actively working in terms of IPN and I, which is, what does that standardized interconnection look like? Um, the second piece, though, and, and I think it's come out in the conversation, but but maybe just to say explicitly, is what kind of traffic is delivered and what vetting of that traffic is required. Because, you know, just through the conversation here and in the kind of Comcast Verizon example, um, I, I, I'd be reasonably confident that, that both sides of those, they have a high degree of credit checked, post paid, reasonably reliable customer base. When we've talked a lot about the Malfi's in activity, we tend to come back to this um, uh, international gateway traffic, which is probably not post-pay, probably not credit checked, and who really knows where it's coming from? Um, because I, I know my personal experience at an operator, even with the distributed denial of a service attack, is when we started to see negative traffic coming from a single DSL port, we identified that. We contacted the customer. If it got too bad, we shut that connection off until we were able to rectify it, right? So some of this is what are the kind of rules of engagement voluntarily adopted as an industry, not necessarily mandated uh, by the FCC, by which people agree that I'm going to operate and interconnect under these rules, and, you know, what does that do to help eliminate some of this negative behavior that we're seeing? I think that that's definitely an issue. 
but I, I do think that the things <laughs> that are going to cause us the biggest problems, the, th those are real problems. We need to deal with those problems. The things that are going to cause the biggest problems are, are, are going to come over the, the trusted part, right? It's when you get a virus into an iPhone or an Android and it starts every Android phone calling 911. Those will come over the private managed networks and they will just blow everybody out of the water. Um, and, you know, if you were going to throw a dirty bomb and then start one of those, you'd want an Android yeah. virus. Um, yeah. uh, I, I, I that can be right, um, <laughs> and, and that's a clear public safety concern. I mean, the amplification yes. of physical attacks yes. with a concurrent yes. uh, right. uh, uh, cyber yes. attack. Right. Yeah. And you know, to add to that, I mean, unfortunately, the Truth and Caller ID Act that was passed by Congress was a failure, and Chairman Janikowski wrote a, a, a report. Uh, that basically outlined why it was a, a failure and it has not been revised. And I know Senator McCaskill in Missouri is looking at it one way or the other. But we see on on uh, the Android store and on the, the Apple store, I mean, basically people who can just download an app application to spoof caller ID. They've the, the Truth in Caller ID Act actually legalized the, the process. And that's, you know, one thing that has to be you know, pointed out. The, one of my last points, because I know we're short on time here, is uh, the commission has to realize that the problem is not isolated only to the United States. Uh, I've personally been in contact with, with some of the folks at CRTC and Ofcom in the United Kingdom and ACMA in Australia. The contagion is growing. And... Um, I know the commission already has a cooperative agreement with CRTC and Ofcom specifically on the uh, caller ID spoofing. How all of this ultimately could apply to the public safety attacks that have had in the United Kingdom? Maybe this should be extended one, you know, a little bit further here, one way or the other. It, there is going to be an international framework here that that has to be done. We cannot, in the United States, look at this in isolation. There's one more thing I wanted to get in before we, we go over. Um, in the last two um, uh, panels, um, several times, people talked about the people processes and the training in order to um, uh, get help from adjacent or faraway agencies. When we have, when we have a DDoS attack, um, uh, it will unlikely be of something we've seen before and thus have already defenses in place. And we hopefully will have deployed all the mechanisms that we've described in the standards that allow us to react, but for some period of time, we will be getting a large number of bad calls, along with a small number of good calls. There are, we don't really know, but there's some number like 20,000 call tickers on duty at any one time. And it's in that range, okay? 20,000 call tickers can handle a lot of bad calls. And the mechanisms that we've described in the standards would allow us to distribute calls that are coming in from, a, you know, a couple of bad entry points through the whole country. That's the mechanics. The question is, can the call takers actually do that? Will the managers allow the call takers to do that? Do we have training for people to do that? Those, I think, are, are bigger problems than getting the mechanics to work to allow us to react. Now, you know, hopefully shortly after that, we'll get the filters put into the SBCs, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be able to slow the, 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 the rate of bad calls down so that we're not doing it by humans. But for the first instance, in the first minutes, in the first hours, we're going to rely on people. We could do that. We built the system to be able to do just that. We've got to deploy it, and we've got to train for it. Yeah, and you know, for that to be incredible, I mean, you've got to have the second half of the dispatch function, right? It's not just taking the call; mm -hmm. it's the resource we've, needs. Yeah, pairing yeah, that's that we are working. We are working really hard on on that particular thing, right? Because just answering the call isn't enough. You have to be, be able to provide effective help. We, clear, we know that, okay. and we're not done with the pieces that allow us to do that, but we're working really hard on that. That's the number one thing going on in Nina right now, so and APCA, and APCA. About 
this function, but it's the first time I ever heard this. But my first reaction was, do you really want to take something that might be local and spread it nationally um, and possibly affect the calls that are going on in a major we, metropolitan we, we area? Have, we have the queuing mechanisms that let you make sure that you can handle your local calls, even if when you're handling somebody okay. else's bad calls. I, I think Again, color commentary. Um, uh, the the uh, the idea here is that there are multiple layers of different things that you can do. There are queuing mechanisms. There are interactive media response mechanisms. There are uh, uh, overflow and ingress rate limiting mechanisms. The, there there are a big toolbox of things that you can do to start to uh, deal with these attacks and, and the ability to move. Um, uh, excess traffic because sometimes and the reason I, I think the answer to your question is yes you do want that capability to exist is because there will be times where it's not an attack no it's actually high volume and you've got to respond and, and yeah. then you've got to be able to keep widening the circle sure. until you can deal right. with it so Jeff yeah. you get your panel moving at the speed of cyberspace here I think um, you know, everybody's trying to get their last thoughts in I think you know relative to some of these um, these comments um, you know, I wanted to touch it briefly before we wrapped up today on the, the cyber kill chain concept. And I think that's a concept that applies to this conversation. It, it applies to your attackers. It applies to your infrastructure. And, and we don't have much time, so I won't go deep into it. But th the concept is, do I understand my threats? Do I understand what the steps the adversaries are doing to take advantage of me are so that I can successfully defend against them? Right, so if it's a DDoS attack, do I understand uh, how to look for their reconnaissance approach to figure out who they're going to DDoS, or are they downloading applications that are going to allow them to spoof their phones? Right. So I know we're pressed for time, so maybe it's a, a topic for a later date. But you know, the kill chain is a seven-step process that the adversaries go through in order to launch a successful attack. And um, there's, you can apply that to lots of different types of attack, so whether it's you know malicious email or, or something else. And you can build those concepts into your your design and your security approach, whether it's the infrastructure design or your process and your people, uh, you know, processes for uh, how your people respond to incidents and attacks. So uh, I think that's worth thinking about um, and, and learning a little bit more about. And depending on your time, we can talk more or not. No, Mike, that's, that's very helpful, and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and if we look at that as a public safety communication sector, then and understand the, the adversaries and what their goals would be, you only have to be successful in stopping it in one of those seven steps exactly right. to be yep. successful. Mm -hmm. The adversary has to be successful in every one of those seven steps. Right. Uh, but the adversary, when he gets stopped, will just move to the left a little bit and start again, and they'll keep trying and trying and trying, which yeah. uh, then uh, screens for the value of information sharing. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that you really get that. I mean, so that, yeah. that's really the idea. We have a team of net defenders that came up with that concept because you're right. You know, the old adage was <laughs> adversary has to be right once. We have to be right every single time. We got to turn the tables. So now we have seven seven opportunities to to try to get into their their process and break it, make them shift one thing, gain some more intelligence. Right. We talked about, a lot about net defenders, and, and you were headed in the direction of information sharing. Right, and I mentioned that earlier today. I think that is um, extremely critical. Right, whether we build a, you know, uh, whether we leverage the, you know, multi-state ISACs or the IT ISACs or, or whatever it may be, create a new uh, sharing exchange relevant to all the uh, the PSAPs, right? A, a PSAP information sharing group. Um, we've got to move that information. And we've got to identify it with the phases of the attack as they come through the networks, so that people can defend and mitigate and build architectures that are that are appropriate. Thanks, Admiral. Um, we're short on time, so I will go right to the point. Actionable items. Okay. Um, I think I speak for Brian and Trey and certainly myself and, and my colleagues from ADAS. I think the Commission needs to do a notice of inquiry on how international call gateways are attacking the public switch telephone network in the United States and our PSAPs. I don't think we actually have a lot of good data about how these are being managed, how these are being identified, um, and certainly from from the PSAP perspective, these have been the cause of at least what would you say, 80 percent of the problems so far. I wouldn't care to put a number on it. Um, they, Close. They, they are, at, let's say, a significant fraction. Significant fraction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if you combine that with butt dials, then we probably right. have the full Monty. <laughs> but another. Right. 
They got the, the transcription, right? That's right. <laughs> Selfies clogging up the now, uh, uh, That's excellent, Richard. And, and Jeff, do you yeah. we have to our appointed hour? <laughs> We are at our appointed hour, so I just want to thank you all for coming, for sharing your ideas with us, and, and engaging in the dialogue. Um, I'll turn it over to the Admiral for final comments. Yeah, thanks very much to everyone who participated today. This was exactly what we wanted, a robust discussion around these issues, and uh, we have taken good notes throughout. We have the transcript, and uh, uh, we'll now y use this as we uh, go through creating the criteria uh, associated with the tech trials uh, that carriers uh, are suggesting to us uh, in, in stream with the sunset requests for legacy infrastructure. Uh, uh, identity management in this panel, clearly uh, something we need to address. I love the fact that we talked about this is an international uh, uh, sea that we <laughs> are swimming in, uh, and at some point um, we need to think about that interface. I'd suggest that uh, if we don't do that sooner rather than later with an industry-led multi-stakeholder approach here that's w recognizable, reasonable, effective, then we'll lose that ability to influence the international standard and they'll go to uh, uh, something that's not multi-stakeholder, something that is nation by nation, you know, a balkanized. Uh, approach. So we, we, we really, I think, have an imperative now to let's get this right in a way that could then influence the, 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 our international partners, and, and we'll certainly commit to that. Um, lots of good uh, discussion about the uh, different failure modalities associated with an everything over IP network, uh, and uh, we will want to continue to work with the CISRIC, uh, uh, but also look at uh, what of that should be a limiting factor with uh, the sunset request. And the last piece is a, a very valuable input on the challenge for both rural PSAPs but also rural telcos uh, and the changing nature of the interconnect uh, and uh, how do we make sure that uh, we're not actually regressing in security because we uh, haven't fully understood uh, things like rate recovery and uh, how we we resource those uh, those rural areas. So uh, thanks to to everyone who participated in this panel and everyone who participated the entire day. I'd like to uh, reserve the end of this though to ask, thank uh, my staff who I think did a, a wonderful job. I was very pleased with uh, how you guys pulled this together. The Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau who greatly assisted assisted us with the outreach with the virtual aspects. Uh, uh, of the uh, workshop today uh, and uh, the Commission's audiovisual team and strategic communications team. So uh, thanks so much to all. Uh, we will have one more panel tomorrow. It will be that government panel where we uh, uh, talk about the, the vulnerabilities uh, in an all IP world um, uh, with our government partners. Uh, but that the, the findings from that will be a part of the record. So that will be transparent uh, at, at the end of the day. Uh, anyway, thanks very much and appreciate it.